Thank you.
Order, please. <clears throat> Excuse me. Order, please. We'll now begin with the daily routine, beginning with presenting and reading of petitions. Presenting reports of committees. Tabling reports, regulations, and other papers. The Honourable Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to table a report entitled WCB Nova Scotia Report to the Community, Second Quarter 2019. The report is tabled. The Honourable Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to table a report entitled Maritime Provinces Higher Education Commission Annual, Annual Report Year in Review 2018-2019. The report is tabled. Statements by Ministers. Government notices of motion. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I beg leave to make an introduction. Permission granted. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, joining us in the East Gallery today are several uh, distinguished guests who are attending the Canadian Association of Midwives Conference in Halifax this week. Uh, I'd ask that they uh, please uh, rise as I uh, recognize them and, and receive the warm welcome of uh, my colleagues. Uh, with us are uh, Kelly Chisholm, the president of Nova Scotia Midwives Association, uh, CJ uh, Blennerhast, uh, midwife uh, here in Halifax, Ray Ann Haley, a midwife uh, in Antikinish. Uh, I could go on at length about my uh, relationship with uh, Ray Ann and her family, uh, but uh, I will not because that would embarrass her, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and uh, Tanya Achinero, uh, who is the uh, the president, uh, the uh, ED for the National uh, Canadian Association of Midwives. Uh, so I ask my colleagues, please give them a warm welcome. The Honourable Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas registered midwives are health professionals who support women and children through pregnancy, birth and postpartum phases, providing expert primary care, and whereas the Canadian Association of Midwives is currently hosting its national conference in Halifax from October 23rd to 25th, with over 250 health professionals in attendance focused on growing a sustainable future, and whereas the Government of Nova Scotia recognizes the crucial role of midwives in providing care to citizens throughout the province and proudly supports the expansion of midwifery in Nova Scotia, doubling the number of midwife positions in the past couple of years. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of this legislature recognize the important and valuable contribution of midwives to reproductive health care in Nova Scotia, their central role in our health care system, and wish them the very best for a successful national conference here in Halifax. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Entree minded nay. The motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of Communities, Culture and Heritage. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to make an introduction. Permission granted. I'd like to draw the members' attention to the East Gallery, where we have some very special guests from the creative sector in celebration of uh, Small Business uh, Week, and I'd ask that they uh, rise when I call their names. Uh, Tabitha Osler, owner of fashion design business Fairchild Makewear. Leanne Hoffman, uh, first signing to Venue Records, and Susan Jeffries, Community Development Officer with the Department of Communities, Culture and Heritage. And I would ask uh, they remain standing while I do the resolution and receive the warm welcome of the House. The Honourable Minister of Communities, Culture and Heritage. I hereby give notice on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas Nova Scotia's creative industries have proven themselves on the world stage and have potential for even more growth, and whereas our government is proud to administer the Creative Industries Fund that provides grants to businesses to assist with growth and export opportunities for our province's artists, designers, musicians, playwrights, authors, and publishers, some of our province's richest resources. And whereas so far this year, 1.8 million has been awarded to 76 businesses, including Nova Scotia startup Fairchild Makewear, to assist with exporting children's uh, outwear made from 100% recycled materials to Europe, the United States, and Asia, 
and also the venue records to help with growing their national and international exposure. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of the House of Assembly join me in recognizing the importance of the Creative Industries Fund in helping small businesses in the creative sector bring their products to global markets. Mr. Speaker, I ask for a waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary-minded, nay. The motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. <laughs> thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas every year countless people suffer from health complications caused by the flu, and whereas Nova Scotians can help protect themselves and others, especially those at high risk, such as adults over 65, children six months to five years old, pregnant women, Indigenous peoples, and people with chronic illness by getting the flu shot. And whereas the seasonal flu vaccine is safe, free of charge, and available for most family doctors, family practice nurses, nurse practitioners, pharmacists, and walk-in clinics, and if anyone is unsure where to get the flu vaccine, they can contact their local public health office. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of this House recognize the importance of the flu shot, encourage all Nova Scotians to get the vaccine, and roll up their sleeves with me tomorrow morning here at the House to receive their annual flu vaccination. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary mind and nay. Motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of African Nova Scotian Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Before I read my notice, can I make an introduction? Permission granted. Thank you. Joining us today in the gallery are members from the RCMP and the Sheriff's Services. I would like them to rise as I call their names and receive the warm welcome of the House. Sergeant Craig Marshall Smith, Constable Tamu Bracken, Constable Natasha Dentis, Constable Christine Hogan, Hoban, Deputy Chief Sheriff Leanne Sample, Deputy Sheriff Monique Drummond. Ladies and gentlemen, members of the Peace Services, welcome. welcome. The Honorable Minister of African Nova Scotian Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, sh I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas on October 18, 2019, RCMP Sergeant Craig Marshall Smith launched his fifth book entitled Her Story, Black Women Leading the Way in the Canadian Law Enforcement, which is further explore exploration of policing from the perspective of African Canadians. And whereas the book contains powerful stories and experiences of over 50 extraordinary women serving in law enforcement and whereas we must acknowledge and thank the individuals who sacrifice their well-being to keep us safe, secure and free every day, especially those who have paved the way for greater diversity while serving their country. Therefore, be it resolved that members of this House of Assembly please join me in congratulating, congratulating Sergeant Craig Smith on his fifth book and applauding the efforts of him shining the light on these powerful voices of African Nova Scotian women in our services and law enforcement. Mr. Speaker, I ask for waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? It is agreed. For all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Andre minded nay. Motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of Immigration and Acadian Affairs. Monsieur le Président, à une date ultérieure, je demanderai l'adoption de la résolution suivante. Attendu que le village historique acadien de la Nouvelle-Écosse à Pubnico West-le-Bas se trouve en tête du classement établi 
par les utilisateurs du site Internet TripAdvisor dans la catégorie des musées de la province. Et attendu que le village historique acadien attire environ 25 000 visiteurs de la Nouvelle-Écosse, du Canada, des États-Unis, d'Europe, d'Australie et d'ailleurs par an. Et attendu que le village, par l'intermédiaire d'interprètes bilingues et de diverses activités, permet à ses visiteurs de découvrir l'histoire et la culture acadienne des du débuts des années 1900 dans la région des Pubnico. Par conséquent, il est résolu que les membres de l'Assemblée législative se joignent à moi pour féliciter toute l'équipe du village historique acadien de la Nouvelle-Écosse pour son dévouement envers l'histoire et la culture acadienne de sa région et pour lui souhaiter encore de nombreuses années de succès. Monsieur le Président, je demande l'adoption de cette résolution sans préavis et sans débat. I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas the Village Historique Acadien de Nouvelle-Écosse, Lower West Pubnico, is at the top of the ranking established by users of the TripAdvisor website in the category of museums in the province. And whereas the Village Historique Acadien attracts approximately 25,000 visitors from Nova Scotia, Canada, the United States, Europe, Australia, and elsewhere each year. And whereas the village, through bilingual reenactors and various activities, allows its visitors to discover the history and Acadian culture of the early 1900s in the Pubnico region. Therefore, be it resolved that the members of the House of Assembly join me in congratulating the whole team at the Village Historique Acadien de la Nouvelle-Écosse for their dedication to the Acadian history and culture of their region and in wishing them many more years of success. Mr. Speaker, I ask for waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. Motion is carried. We'll now move on to introduction of bills, notices of motion, statements by members. The Honourable Member for Inverness. Mr. Speaker, let us remember Cassidy Bernard of Wake Up a First Nation, who departed this world for the spirit world one year ago today. Later this afternoon, a vigil will take place in her memory and for all missing and murdered Indigenous people. The vigil will last 4,365 seconds. That is one second for each of the estimated 4,000 missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls in Canada, and one second for the 365 days Cassidy's family and her twin daughters, Paisley Jean and Maya May, have been without her. The Bernard family and the community of Wakeba is strong. They have taken care of each other during this time of great sorrow. Their story has touched the hearts of people around the country who also grieve for Cassidy. May we in this legislature show our support for Cassidy's family by standing with them today from afar. I would ask members to rise and share applause in support of the family. The Honourable Member for Lunenburg West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg leave to make an introduction. Permission granted. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I draw my colleague's attention to the East Gallery, where we're joined today by a very fine gentleman, uh, Ozzy Stiles. Uh, Ozzy is uh, a retired town crier from the town of Bridgewater, uh, has been an unbelievable ambassador for our community and our province, and I ask my colleagues to bring him a warm welcome of the House. Honourable Member for Lunenburg West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Austin Ozziwile, a Stiles, Bridgewater's town crier, officially announced his retirement last May at the age of 83 after serving as an ambassador to our community and our province for 40 years. He was selected as Bridgewater's provincial volunteer in 2002, was Nova Scotia's number one town crier at the championships held in Lunenburg in 2003 was awarded the Best Nova Scotia Ambassador Medal in 2005 at the Annapolis Royal Championships and served as President of the Nova Scotia Guild of Town Criers. Ozzy competed and gave cries internationally. 
Career highlights include travels to Bermuda, Belgium, Germany, the Isle of Wight, and of course his hometown, the town of Bridgewater, but also the town of Bridgewater in England. Ozzy added a special touch to Lunenburg County events that included parades, volunteer receptions, weddings, and sporting events. He wrote almost every cry he made, putting his heart and soul into each and every one of them. He saved every precious scroll. Ozzy cherishes the badge he receives from royalty to politicians and proudly displays them on his cape. His cry, his charm, and recognizable uniform of Bell and staff will be remembered fondly. Thank you to Ozzy Stiles for bringing honor, pageantry, and his sense of humor to his role in our community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Pickle West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I stand today to acknowledge the marvelous work done by the volunteers at the annual Ryan's Case for Smiles Pillowcase Making Workshop, organized under the direction of co-director Kay Desabro. This year's workshop was held in Picto with over 50 volunteers coming together to make colourful pillowcases for hospitalised children. I admire these volunteers for the work they choose to do in their free time. The pillowcases made in June will help comfort children in paediatric units at six hospitals. This act of kindness and compassion brings together members of the community to help those in need, and I commend the volunteers of this organisation for their hard work. Work. Many sick children will have smiles on their faces thanks to these individuals with big hearts. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Hans East. And Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to make an introduction. Permission granted. I would like to draw my colleagues' attention to the East Gallery, where we are joined by two lovely ladies. Uh, I'm doing a member statement on Marlene uh, Cochran. I would ask her to please stand. And her sister is also joining us, Dorothy uh, Nichols, who is a resident of Windsor and a constituent of my uh, colleague to my left. So I would ask the House to give them a warm welcome. The Honourable Member for Hans East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Marlene Cochran proves that there are angels among us. Marlene is a resident of Kenkook, Nova Scotia. She provides low-income residents with short or learn with with short term illnesses with the medical devices they need. Whether it's in a hospital bed, crutches, wheelchairs, or walkers, Marlene goes above and beyond to source and collect items, ensuring that they are in good working order, then lends them out to anyone who needs it at no cost, Mr. Speaker. She will also drive residents to appointments without a second thought. Marlene does everything at her own expense and has never asked for a monetary donation to support this venture. When you ask her why she does it, she says, I help because I can. What an amazing attitude, Mr. Speaker, and Marlene represents what is the best of us, doing all she can for those in need. I would ask all members of the House to join me in thanking Marlene for her incredible selfless contribution to our community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> The Honourable Member for Queen's Shelburne. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to congratulate Liverpool physician Dr. Timothy Woodford for his recent success on the world stage of sailing. Tim was voted the 2018 Sailor of the Year in Nova Scotia, and in September of this year, he travelled with his small but mighty support team to represent Canada and Port Zeeland in the Netherlands to compete at the 2019 ILCA Laser Master Worlds. From September 5th through the 14th, he sailed in 11 races and placed a very impressive third out of 55 competitors in the Grand Masters Radial Division. Mr. Speaker, I am honoured to recognise Dr. Woodford's success at the international level in sailing, and it is my hope that he feels the same pride for his accomplishments that his family, friends and community do. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Guysboro Eastern Shore, Trackety. Mr. Speaker, I rise today in recognition of Bev Smith, member of the Sheet Harbour Lions Club and former Sheet Harbour Lioness, for her commitment to the community and Lions Club for earning her 45-year chevron. Bev has worked tirelessly for the club and her community, putting on suppers, funeral receptions, the annual Terry Fox run, and other functions. She is also critical in helping the Lions Club host visiting clubs, doing weekly bingos and banquets and contributing to bursaries for Duncan McMillan High School. 
Her work with the Lions Club also provides support for Lilies Hill sports meet, local sports teams, the annual Seaside Festival, and many other community activities. Bev received her award this past spring from the District Governor Perry Oliver during their potluck supper with many invited guests at the Sheet Harbor Lions Community Center. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to congratulate Bev for earning her 45-year Chevron and recognize her commitment to her community and the Lions Club. She's an invaluable member of the Sheet Harbor Lions Club and the community of Sheet Harbor. Thank you, Bev. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today I rise to recognize Dwayne Pike, the Town of Amherst De Department's uh, new police chief, sworn in on March 25, 2019. Dwayne Pike was a 23-year-old member, 23-year member, sorry, of the Amherst Police Department. He had been acting chief for the previous nine months and has been the Amherst Police Department uh, since 1996. In January of 2008, Dwayne became a detective and joined the Major Crime Unit. In January 2010, he was promoted to sergeant, and I am certain Dwayne will bring all of his experience, strength, and energy to this new position of chief. Today, Mr. Speaker, I would like to congratulate Dwayne Pike on his promotion and thank him for his commitment to help keeping Amherst Street safe. He is a real leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize 2B Theatre's artistic co-director, Christian Berry, who has been shortlisted for the prestigious Siminovich Prize in Theatre. The Siminovich Prize is Canada's richest prize in theatre at $100,000, and Christian is nominated for his work as a director. His productions have played at renowned festivals and theatres around the world, including the Bristol Old Vic, Edinburgh Fringe, Sydney Festival, Magnetic North, Push, Aarhus Festival, Luminato, and many, many more. His production of Old Stock, a refugee love story, which he also co-wrote with Hannah Moscovich and Ben Kaplan, has been nominated for and won numerous awards, and it will be playing again in Halifax next week, opening next week at Neptune Theatre. Mr. Speaker, as a member of the theatre community in Nova Scotia, I have watched Christian make theatre here for almost 20 years. His skills in telling simple stories in truly beautiful ways, using light and sound to great and special effect, and in working with the best actors and writers in the country, all make him truly deserving of this place on the Siminovich shortlist. I ask all members of this House to join me in congratulating Christian on this wonderful honour and wish him best on October 28th when the prize is announced. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Halifax, Armdale. Mr. Speaker, on this Small Business Week, I rise to recognize the accomplishments of Dr. Janet Cullinan of Armdale. Janet, a mother of two and former instructor at Dalhousie Dentistry, is a small business owner and dentist who, alongside her staff, offers friendly, caring family service to our community. She completed her Doctor of Dental Surgery at Dalhousie in 1990 and has been practicing dentistry for almost 30 years. Janet has also served her profession through sitting on the Dental Board Disciplinary Committee and as past president of the Halifax County Dental Society. She's also an avid soccer fan and coach and past president of City Soccer. In fact, you may have caught her on Eastlink TV where she provided colorful commentary for high school girls soccer. Mr. Speaker, Janet's been a friend since our days in junior high at St. Agnes when I didn't know many people in Halifax. Please join me in congratulating Dr. Janet Cullinan on her upcoming 30th year anniversary and wish her good health and great success. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Cumberland South. Mr. Speaker, I stand here today to give recognition to all the great ECEs in our province. In many cases, ECEs are the first exposure to structured learning that our children have, and today I want to say thank you on this national day, unnational day of recognition for EC, ECEs. It may not be a national day of recognition, but it gives great opportunity for this House to say thank you. Mr. Speaker, there are many ECEs in our great province helping to mold and guide our awesome three, four, five-year-olds. And as we show appreciation for each and every ECE today, I want to give a special shout out to a special ECE, one of my constituents that works very hard at a West End Elementary School and at home with their three awesome children. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to say thank you to a wonderful woman in my life, my wife, Tracy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Timberley Prospect. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today I rise to recognize Margaret Melanson of Timberley. Well known in the Timberley community, Mars, as she's affectionately known, marked her 23rd anniversary in September of this year, working as a medical receptionist at the Timberley Medical Clinic. 
always extending herself far beyond what is expected of the job. Marge has been compassionately assisting patients at this clinic. She takes pride in helping people when they need it the most and always communicates with kindness, empathy and understanding. She goes out of her way to make personal connections with all of the patients at this clinic and plays a significant role in ensuring good quality medical care for patients in the community. I ask the members of the Nova Scotia House of Assembly to join me in thanking Marge for her dedicated work serving the people of Timberley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Argyle Barrington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise here today to honour the late Gordy Ross of Woods Harbour. Last week, our community unexpectedly lost a great community leader and friend at the age of 59. Gordy was an active member of his community for many years. He was a member of the Woods Harbour Fire Department for 40 years, and for the past 20 years, he served his community as fire chief. Gordy took great pride in training new recruits and in vehicle extrication competitions. I would like to express my sincere condolences to Gordy's family, friends, and firefighting family as his life is celebrated and he is laid to rest today. Rest in peace, Chief Gordy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Sydney Whitney Pier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise in my place to honour uh, a great community leader who we lost this past summer in Mike Paranoski. Uh, Mike Paranoski was uh, born uh, in Whitney Pier uh, and uh, had a very distinguished career as a teacher, a principal, and then eventually as assistant superintendent for the then Cape Breton Victoria Regional School Board. Uh, Mike played a number of leadership roles uh, within the community, uh, whether it was through parish councils uh, or through lectures that he gave. Uh, Mike was always involved uh, and supported those who needed it the most. Uh, Mike had a passion for food, he had a passion for world travel with his uh, wife of 50 years, Anita, uh, and uh, Mr. Speaker, I rise in my place to uh, recognize and honor uh, a, a great man who was very proud of his Polish heritage uh, and did a tremendous amount of work uh, in our community. So to his wife, Anita, and to all their family, I pass along uh, my many thanks uh, for my friendship with Mike uh, and support for their family. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Pico Center. Uh, Mr. Speaker, conventional medicine continues to struggle when treating a disease which we cannot see or distinguish. Nevertheless, we know that people's lives change once they are diagnosed with Lyme disease. Numerous Nova Scotians are suffering and become frustrated when they feel their concerns are being overlooked or ignored. Some people diagnosed with Lyme appear to be okay following a prescribed course of antibiotics. They seem to be able to avoid any long-term problems. Other people affected with this disease continue to have problems for months and even years following treatment. Health officials are dealing with a disease that mimics other conditions that may cause fatigue, numbness, dizziness, aches, and continuous sometimes debilitating pain. We have to support research to obtain answers for Lyme and to shed some light on what works best for our residents to become infected by Lyme. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Waverly Fall River Beaver Bank. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I stand today to congratulate Fall River's Haley Smith on her spectacular season playing in goal for the Illinois State Red Wings, Red Birds, I should say. Haley has set an Illinois State record for career shutouts. Haley played nets in 15 of the 16 games, allowing only 14 goals against. Her latest uh, game was uh, will tallied her shutouts to 24, setting a new all-time shutout record for the Redbirds. Mr. Speaker, I ask all members of the legislature to uh, please join me in congratulating Haley and wishing her continued success in her soccer career. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Colchester, Muscadamid Valley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Petro-Canada in Stuyak recently installed two EV fast chargers the first and most eastern chargers owned by Suncor Energy, which plans to have 92 such chargers installed across Canada. Since the average range of a charged vehicle is 200 kilometers, thought has to be given to strategic planning for coast-to-coast -coast service. The installation will achieve two favorable results in the area. It will help to increase sustainability, and the 30-minute charge will give those passing through an opportunity to explore the area. For now, the service is free, but a cost is expected to be applied sometime this fall based on charging time. So congratulations to Petro Canada and the town of Stubiak for taking this important approach to conserving our environmental resources. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Chester St. Margaret's. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Mr. Speaker, during this Small Business Week, I want to congratulate Catherine and Philip Guest for the 30-plus years they have operated Freewheeling Adventures, their successful bicycle tour company. This cycle adventure company runs local and rural and international tours out of their offices in the Lodge on the Aspetagan Peninsula. Freewheeling Adventures, with a full-time contingent of six employees, has become so well-known that it was featured in National Geographic magazine this past April. Recently, Catherine wrote a book called My Freewheeling Life, Personal Reflections on Running an Adventure Tour Company in Rural Nova Scotia, published by the small business Windy Wood Publishing of Hubbard's. Catherine's collection of stories and poems outline her adventures, trials and tribulations with the company. Mr. Speaker, I invite the members of the House to join me in congratulating Catherine and Philip on their successful small business, as well as on the publication of Catherine's new book. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to recognize Darlene O'Donnell, the wonderful administrative assistant at Prince Andrew High School. No warmer or more welcoming smile could greet students, parents, and teachers at a school. Ms. O'Donnell makes every single person who walks into the office feel valued, whether it be a quick interaction with students or in discussions with staff members. Ms. O'Donnell has a kindness, compassion, and patience that radiates to all that she interacts with. Mr. Speaker, I had the pleasure of working with Ms. O'Donnell for 13 years. She is the model of professionalism and calmness. Over the years, she has helped thousands of students in our community. I want to thank Ms. O'Donnell for her outstanding service, and I ask all members of the House to acknowledge the great support administrative assistants offer every day to our schools in Nova Scotia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Mr. Speaker, I rise to congratulate artist, filmmaker, and poet Sylvia Hamilton and the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia on the exhibition Here We Are Here, Black Canadian Contemporary Art, which opened on June 1st and closes on Sunday. Ms. Hamilton is the only Nova Scotian featured in the exhibition, which was developed by the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto. I was glad to tour Here We Are Here with a group of constituents in July and have very interesting conversation afterwards. And I encourage all members to cross the street this evening or tomorrow and spend even just 45 minutes viewing the exhibition. And as the AGNS's effective ads and Halifax transit buses say, let art change you. Thank you. Just before we move on to the next member statement, I want to draw members' attention to my speaker's gallery, where there are a couple of uh, guests there. I'm very pleased to see uh, my old junior high school and high school principal, Mr. John Withrow, if he could please stand. Mr. Withrow uh, John uh, is a neighbor, former neighbor of mine in Mineville, and uh, was the principal at Gatesbrook Junior High School in 1985 when I had my hockey accident. And uh, him and his leadership at our school uh, provided my family and myself great support, and I very much appreciate that. And uh, whether I followed him or he followed me, but we both went on to Eastern Shore District High School together. And uh, I'm pleased to see him here in the house today. And he's joined by Miss Shauna Williams, who give her the, the warm welcome of the house as well. The Honourable Member for Lunenburg. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize a family-owned business in my community. Stan's Dad and Lad Shop, located on Lincoln Street, has recently switched over to paper bags in an effort to be more environmentally friendly. Owner Jamie Meyer cons put considerable effort into researching the cheapest and most suitable options for the store. Despite being more expensive than the plastic alternative, Jamie made the change and expects the price of paper bags to drop as demand increases. Jamie says switching to paper bags felt good and it was time to do the right thing. He hopes by making the switch, it will inspire other business owners to do the same. Mr. Speaker, I ask that you and members of this House's Assembly join me in recognizing Stan's dad and lad shop and all the other shops within our constituency that have made the switch from plastic to paper bags in an effort to make a positive change for the environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for sackville Cobbequid. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to congratulate Ms. Mary Marson of Lower Sackville. 
Mary was recently nominated with the Take Off Pound Sensibly Tops President's Award for her outstanding work as area captain with Tops. Mary was the only Canadian recipient to receive this award and placed four out of ten internationally. Mary was able to travel to Portland, Oregon to receive her President's Award at the International Recognition Day ceremony. Mary was also recognized in the Tops News Magazine for her accomplishment. Mr. Speaker, I would ask all members of the House of Assembly to join me in congratulating Mary Marson on being bestowed with the President's Award for Tops and wish her continued success in the future. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Mr. Speaker, on the day that I moved to Dartmouth North, surrounded by boxes piled to the ceiling and with an eight-month-old baby in a car seat on the floor of our new home, my partner and I, along with the friends who helped us move, ordered our supper from a restaurant near our house that we had passed on the, while we were moving, Pho Hung Min. I remember clearly we each ordered number 15s, vermicelli noodles with a spring roll and grilled shish, pork shish kebab. This is now our family standard order, and as my two kids uh, love the number 15 as much as their parents do. In this small business week, I want to bring attention to Fo Hung Min the, and congratulate them for the success of their small and mighty family business. The storefront in the Dartmouth Shopping Centre is always busy and there is a steady stream of folks picking up orders as well. The Chinese and Vietnamese food is healthy and delicious and the staff are always welcoming with a warm smile. Fo Hung Min is owned by Andy and his mother May and they are supported by their, their servers Sylvia and Kim. And I want to take this time to thank them and to invite everyone here to make the trek across the McDonald Bridge and sit in and order out a number 15. You will not regret it. Thank you. The... <laughs> the Honourable Member for Halifax Atlantic. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize two wonderful volunteers in our community, Lori Hennessy and Matt Conrad. Working together, we've organized uh, JLL's Ilsley reunion this summer, raising $5,000 for the school. We also brought to, uh, the annual Hearing Cove Days and Governor Brooke Days to the community. Mr. Speaker, because of the hard work of people like Lori and Matt, our community is a better place. So thank you both for all you do for our community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cole Harbour Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to acknowledge Val Hawley, who passed away this summer. Val Hawley has been a Lions Club member for over a decade and a friend of mine as well. She had generously given her time to the club, serving as a treasurer and in many other capacities. But none has been dear, more dear to her than her work for the Lions Club Dog Guides. She and her team of volunteers have held monthly dances at our club on the first Thursday of every month to raise money for dog guides. She has also hosted the Walk for Dog Guides each year and baked for the Lions Club and many other charities like the Fisherman's Cove Golf Tournament. I ask all members of the Nova Scotia Legislature to join me in acknowledging in Val's honour all that she has done for her community and for me personally. Val will be sadly missed by her loved ones and so many community members. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Clayton Park West. Mr. Speaker, in honour of Business Week, I would like to recognise a young woman who's carrying on the, um, the legacy in Clayton Park West. Nadia Junis was born and raised in Nova Scotia after her parents immigrated from India. She graduated from Dalhousie just two years ago with a degree in international business. Mm -hmm. Nadia has work experience in many fields ranging from physiotherapy assistant, bookstore clerk, waitress and luxury fashion merchandising. She also helped her, uh, run her family business D Daba Sweets and Spice mm -hmm. Shop. Her work experience helped her understand how important customer service is to the success of a business. Nadia took over as an owner of Freddy's Fantastic Fish just under a year ago. The restaurant has been a staple in the Bears Lake area for 14 years, supporting only local fishermen. Nadia also donated and supports many local charities foundation, and foundations uh, and, uh, and those affected by local tragedies. Mr. Speaker, with this House of Assembly, please applaud Nadia on her entrepreneurial success. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Kings North. Mr. Speaker, the Halts Harbour Community Development Association is a non-profit organization incorporated in 1997. The objects of the association are to stimulate and sustain community development through the support of projects which are beneficial to the community. Most recently, the association was successful in receiving funding from the federal and provincial government and local municipality to help grade the Inner Harbour Boardwalk. 
This project will certainly be beneficial for the economic growth of this small community. I would like to thank Association Directors Daryl Houghton, Mike Shreve, Wendy Wolodka, Dave Davies, Hope Shanks, and Bill Wolodka for their commitment and dedication to their community, ensuring it remains a popular tourist destination in our area. A special thanks to Association Director Ed Lytle, who passed away before this work could be completed, but was instrumental in the original boardwalk project and very committed to seeing it rebuilt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for King South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, our communities are enriched when citizens take it upon themselves to research and illuminate our local history. This necessitates a curiosity and a deep affection for the people who have come before us. In the Annapolis Valley, Conrad Davidson of Gasparo has contributed to dozens of stories written and published by the Gasparo Valley Gazette each <laughs> month since 2008. This is quite a, a, an achievement, considering that Conrad is limited by vision loss, and he frankly admits that he didn't enjoy history in his younger days. Conrad's contributions include researching background on local, the history of local buildings, such as the Wolfville Food Company building, and local organizations such as the Lions Club. Anybody who hears Conrad put voice to his research instantly feels the passion and interest he has for the history of our area. Mr. Speaker, I ask all members of the House of Assembly to join me in recognize, recognizing the valued contribution of Conrad Davidson to our knowledge of the many interesting stories of the Gasparo Valley and area. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Queen's Shelburne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This spring in Shelburne, a musician and teacher dedicated to enriching his community retired from teaching on what can only be deemed a high note. Bill Smith has been teaching both kids and adults how to play piano for over 41 years. His musical journey has taken him from Shelburne to University at Mount Allison to teaching in Newfoundland and Labrador and to our community's delight, back to his Shelburne home. In addition to piano lessons, Bill has also conducted the Shelburne County Festival Choir, directed music at Trinity United Church, led musicians in numerous plays at the Osprey Arts Center and beyond. Some of his students are professional musicians, while some have other careers, but all have a deep appreciation of music. In his retirement, he continues to delight all with his performances and musical arrangements in the community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Yarmouth. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Lieutenant Governor's Diversity and Inclusion Award was established to acknowledge and honour employers who have instituted and promoted best practices toward the employment, independence, and service to persons with disabilities. In 2019, the overall provincial winner was Eden's Decor Store in Yarmouth, Nova Scotia. The store employs five staff who each have identified disabilities. Eden's Decor, owned by Jean Vallely, sells overstock, refurbished items, and customer returns, which it purchases from large retailers such as Bed Bath & Beyond and Wayfair. I ask this house to join me in congratulating Aramis Jean Valley on winning this prestigious award and in thanking her for understanding her employees' needs and for empowering them with workplace experience and knowledge. Our community is very fortunate to have her leadership. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Mr. Speaker, today I rise to recognize Lisa Kotschuk and the organizing committee of 100 Women Who Care Cumberland. I'm always encouraged by our community, the heart, the passion, the love expressed in service and through financial contributions. 100 Women Who Care Cumberland meets quarterly and is a large group of women who care deeply about our communities. They have donated over $120,000 through various communities, charities in Cumberland. Thank you to Lisa and all the women, the organizing committee and all women who participate in 100, and 100 Women Who Care Cumberland. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Bedford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to tell this House about a woman who has made Bedford a beautiful place to live. Donna Burris has served as Secretary of the Bedford Horticultural Society, and every year she takes on more responsibility. She's been key to the success of their annual plant sale at Scott Manor House, and I can tell you, get there early because everything is gone in 10 minutes. Donna helped plant the Remembrance Garden and large planters at the Cenotaph at Fish Hatchery Park, and she tends those plants all summer long. She was instrumental in organizing 
organizing the Halifax District Meeting, a major day-long event. She's been honoured by the Nova Scotia Association of Garden Clubs, which presented her with the Outstanding Member Award in 2017 and by the Bedford Volunteer Awards earlier this year. Donna has also volunteered with other organizations, including Bedford Baptist Church and Scott Manor House. Donna Burris is a hard-working asset to our Bedford community, and I want to thank her for the beauty she brings to the lives of so many. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Cumberland South. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to acknowledge Wyman Bun Betts from Wentworth on his 100th birthday. Bun turned 100 on August 15th and celebrated with a math, massive birthday party at the Wentworth, Re Wentworth Recreation Centre. Bun is believed to be the oldest active motorcyclist on the continent, and he continues on the wide open road on a regular basis. And I must say, on August, August 15th, if it hadn't been raining, he would have showed up at the party on his motorcycle. He's left a legacy in Wentworth area, which he has a huge impact on the community, including the lumber industry that he ran with his family and employed many in that area. Please join me in wishing Mr. Bun Betts a happy 100th birthday, and I hope he continues success on the wide open road on two wheels. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Lunenburg West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, David Penny of Conqueror Bank is passionate about coaching and he's been doing it for almost 40 years. His wife, Heather, says he lives it. And Dave says it makes my day and makes me feel alive. He especially loves working with kids and seeing their attitude change or hearing that they're doing better in school. Dave also takes an avid interest in developing coaches and currently mentors seven coaches, six which are female at his club, Dave's Multisports, and he says it makes our club stronger. Dave began his career as a karate instructor and has taught other sports, but is probably best known for bringing amateur boxing to the South Shore. He loves the tactics as well as the mental and physical challenge that the sport provides. Dave's boxing students have competed at the provincial, national, and international levels. His club offers boxing, fitness classes, and recreational kickboxing. Susan Alifat, a member, said that Dave has infinite patience, a tremendous sense of humor, and looks out for the underdog. I ask all members of the Nova Scotia Legislature to join me in recognizing David Penny for his dedication to coaching. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Pictou Centre. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the first rib fest in Pictou County brought more than 10,000 people to the Glasgow Square in Glasgow on the last weekend in August. Organizers said the Rib Fest was an overwhelming success, and plans are already underway to have a second event next summer. Rib Fest appeared to have something for everyone, but lots of food, family-friendly activities, and entertainment provided by local musicians. The money raised at this event went to two nonprofit organizations. The weekend turned into a great family atmosphere, nothing like great food and great music to draw a crowd. Participants are eagerly waiting for next year to enjoy the second of what will hopefully become an annual event for our area. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax, Needham. Mr. Speaker, I wish to congratulate and appreciate the leadership of Kate Pepler, the owner of the Tear Shop, a zero-waste grocery store and cafe in Halifax, Needham. It has just celebrated one year in business at Cornwallis Street in Halifax, Needham. As this legislature considers uh, eliminating plastic bags across the province, the chair shop shows how the future of shopping may look. Ms. Pepler has sourced many different goods in bulk, including beans and flowers, but also uh, oils and vinegars, spices, shampoo and personal care products, and cleaning supplies. Shoppers weigh their reusable uh, containers before filling them up and then pay just for the product by weight. It is also a cafe, but one that doesn't offer disposable cups, though I have witnessed Ms. Pepler offer a real ceramic cup to a customer looking to leave with a coffee. My family particularly enjoys the peanut butter grinder. On this Small Business Week, I salute Ms. Pepler for taking an entrepreneurial risk and showing such leadership. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Oh, pardon me, Colchester North. Colchester, yeah. Sorry, she has blonde hair. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. After qualifying at the regional fire fit held in August in Truro, Guy Gallant, Deputy Chief of the North River Fire Brigade, participated in Fire Fit Canadian and World Championships in Oshawa, Ontario. Approximately 400 firefighters from across Canada, USA, Kuwait, England, and Germany took part. While Guy it was in Oshawa, he was very pleased to achieve his personal best time. At the competition, he formed an over-50 hybrid relay team with three other firefighters from Atlantic Canada. In their first knockout race, they beat the Canadian All-Star team and advanced to the
the gold medal race against Team Germany. They beat the Germans by 17 one hundredths of a second to become the gold medalist of the over 50 hybrid relay division. Another highlight for Gallant this year was racing with his son Kent Gallant, who in a tandem relay race in August. Kent is a native of North River but now lives in King City, Ontario, where he is also a firefighter. Our congratulations to Guy Gallant for such an impressive showing and for serving as such an excellent example to his fellow firefighters. The Honourable Member for Colchester, Muskanabad Valley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Film director Chris Devaney of Lawrencetown has made an important film about lead ammunition and its danger to wildlife, at the same time paying tribute to Hilden Wildlife veterinarian Dr. Helene Van Der Neek, who passed away from ovarian cancer last year. The 16-minute film, Bald Eagle Lady, a selection of the Atlantic International Film Festival, tells of the work of the Cobbequid Wildlife Rehabilitation Centre, which is established by the veterinarian and her husband, Myrtle Messerian. The film, in Van Der Neek's own voice, is a fitting way to honour her memory and legacy. Meanwhile, her work carries on as the centre is currently housing six bald eagle nestlings and soliciting the public for donations of freshly caught or frozen fish for their nourishment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Claire Digby. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to congratulate Elise Thibodeau, Natalie Barron, Nicole DeVoe, Keith Powers, and Michelle Dugall, all athletes from my area who medaled in this past summer's Nova Scotia Special Olympics competitions. The first three swept medals in the Javelin event with two medaling in other events. Natalie won a gold medal in the standing broad jump and a silver in the shot put, while Nicole also won two golds in the 25-meter and 30-meter wheelchair races. Keith Powers and Michelle Dugall also came home with medals. Keith with two golds in the 25-meter and the shot put, and Michelle with a silver in the standing broad jump and a bronze in the shot put. I want to thank the many volunteers that recognize the role the athletes' families play and other volunteers play in preparing such special Olympians for competition. This opportunity has such a big impact on the athletes. Most importantly, the Special Olympics movement continues to break down barriers and change our attitudes on the role people with disabilities can and should have in our society. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to recognize Cole Photo, the Interim Community Outreach Coordinator for Dartmouth East. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, I've had the pleasure of knowing Cole since his days as a high school student, and I know firsthand his dedication and diligent work ethic. As we welcome Cole into the Dartmouth East office, he is also beginning his post-secondary studies at St. Mary's. Mr. Speaker, Cole has brought his hard-working attitude into the Dartmouth East office and is working with our CA to improve the lives of Dartmouth constituents. I wish Cole the best as he continues his post-secondary studies, and I know that the rest of Dartmouth East will join me in giving him a warm welcome into our constituency office. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Anaganish. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I know my, my colleague, the Minister of Agriculture and, and Fisheries uh, and Aquaculture, is a, a big fan of Mustangs, Mr. Speaker. Uh, so I have some uh, information here from uh, Anna Kanish uh, from my community that should give him uh, reason to be proud. The East Anna Kanish Education Centre and Academy Mustangs uh, boys soccer team uh, came home with the Jagus uh, Soccer Championship uh, this year, Mr. Speaker. Uh, while I, I don't have the list of all of the the uh, participants, I can uh, acknowledge that uh, I have permission from the father of at least one of those uh, uh, soccer players, Mr. Speaker. My son, William, was one of the players uh, on that team, so I want to congratulate him, all of the other players with the East Anakinish uh, Education Centre Academy Mustangs on taking home the uh, 1920 Jagus uh, Boys Soccer uh, banner this year. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Paul Harbour Easter Massage with 30 seconds. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to acknowledge Leanne Raftus for her volunteer work hosting a bake sale in the community to donate funds to the Garden of Grace. Garden of Grace is a peer led community support group for pregnancy, infant, and child loss. Leanne started the annual bake sale uh, fundraiser last year and was very proud to donate over $1,000 this year, and I congratulate her, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll now move on to oral questions put by members. Ministers, the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, the Premier said, you're a public servant in this province. We're going to treat you all the same. And I think that's uh, precisely the fear of every public servant in this province at the moment, that the Premier will treat them all the same. Uh, that means if you have an agreement with this government, sleep with one eye open, Mr. Speaker, because the Premier treats agreements as matters of convenience only. He will not hesitate to rip up any contract at any time. My question for the Premier, can the Premier tell this House how many current agreements the province has entered into that have an arbitration clause? The Honourable Premier. Uh, no, Mr. Speaker, I'll get that information for him. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the reason that the Premier doesn't know is because, probably because he doesn't care. Uh, Nova Scotia is the province now where it doesn't matter if you have an agreement with the province because they're not a province that, uh, they're not a government that's willing to honour their word. Perhaps the Premier didn't fully understand what the word or clause arbitration meant when he agreed to it, when he signed it. Maybe he just didn't understand, uh, which is to say that um, the Premier is not one who, who uh, wants to lead a government that will honour the contracts that it signs. We've seen that today. Um, in this instance, what I'd like to ask the Premier, is it the Premier's intention to, in the fullness of time, break every single contract the province has signed that has an arbitration clause? The Honourable Premier. Uh, with, with respect, uh, Mr. Speaker, as the leader of the Conservative Party often does in this House, Mr. Speaker, he, uh, he stretches, Mr. Speaker, anything close to reality. The fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, we had an arbitration agreement with Crown Attorneys. Uh, they came in with 17 per cent, quite frankly. I, I, if, uh, if you want to ask a question, feel free. If you don't mind, let me finish. Let me finish. The Order, please. The Honourable Premier has the floor. The reality of it is we went to the, we went to the bargaining table with Crown Attorneys. Mr. Speaker, we offered them 7 per cent. The wage pattern is pretty clear, Mr. Speaker. They walked in with 17 per cent, Mr. Speaker. Day two, they made it clear they wanted arbitration. We went back, Mr. Speaker, again. We laid out, we reduced steps, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that there would be immediately 4% increase for almost every Crown attorney in this province, Mr. Speaker, on top of the 7% that's there, Mr. Speaker. They made it clear they were going to use arbitration no matter what happened, Mr. Speaker. The reality of it is, whether the Honourable Member likes it or not, this province cannot afford a 17% increase, and the Honourable Member may want to stand in his place and say he's prepared to pay 17% for Crown attorneys, Mr. Speaker. What's he going to pay for every other public servant? The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. I'll tell you what the Honourable Member will tell you, Mr. Speaker, is that when he signs his name to a contract, he'll understand it. When he signs his name to a contract, he'll understand what he's signing before he signs it, not after. But this is, this is, a, premier that, this is a Premier that doesn't mind relating a narrative that could be as far removed from the truth as it possible. It doesn't matter. The Premier promised every Nova Scotian a doctor. It's just something he said to get what he wanted. He promised to let the Crown attorneys have an arbitration clause if in good faith they couldn't reach an agreement. Uh, that's just something he said to get what he wanted. Even that agreement doesn't mind today. I'd like to ask the Premier, is the, is the Premier's word as valuable as his signature on a contract worthless? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker again. Mr. Speaker, the Honourable Member didn't answer the question. He had a gallery, Mr. Speaker, that he played to, Mr. Speaker, for a couple of days. Lots of people here listening to the 17% he promised a few days ago, Mr. Speaker, now he's wavering. Because the reality of it is, he knows, Mr. Speaker, that you can't pay 17% across the board. We have at the table, Mr. Speaker, a fair collective agreement, Order, Mr. Speaker. Please. The Honourable Premier has the floor. Mr. Speaker, we look forward to Crowns coming back to the table, Mr. Speaker, but the reality of it is, this province cannot pay 17%. And there's one thing, Mr. Speaker, the people across this province know, I've been consistent, Mr. Speaker. Unlike the leader across from me, Mr. Speaker, who on one day supports him until they're not in the room anymore, Mr. Speaker, and then he's standing with someone else. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Mr. Speaker, I would like to, to table and to Read some words of the Premier's. Order, please. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party has the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to table and read some words of the Premier's that I uh, agree with. They come from 
2007 when he was first Liberal leader. And the context was that the Conservative government had just brought forward legislation revoking the right to strike for health care workers and community services workers. And the Premier said, at the table, they will not always agree. Let's be honest. There will be tough times sitting at the negotiating table. Mr. Speaker, people died for the right to strike, unquote. Mr. Speaker, whatever turned the Premier into someone for whom tough times at the table means legislation instead of negotiation? The Honourable Premier. Well, uh, uh, Mr. 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 Speaker, let me, let me be clear. We're actually, the bill that the Honourable Member is debating actually is giving them the right to strike, Mr. Speaker. The reality of it is, Mr. Speaker, I want to go back, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to go back, Mr. Speaker, to the reality, Mr. Speaker. We went to the bargaining table, Mr. Speaker. We offered a 7%. Crowns came in with 17 per cent, Mr. Speaker. Day two, they were looking for arbitration, Mr. Speaker. We went back and we collapsed steps in the pay order, Mr. Speaker. A starting crown today is $65,000, which has been accurate, Mr. Speaker. On the meeting signing this agreement, they would go to $81,000, and those changes would be through the entire pay order for crowns, Mr. Speaker, who, by the way, are the highest paid in Atlantic Canada, Mr. Speaker. What we are unwilling to do, Mr. Speaker, they came to the bargaining table with one mission, and that was to send a 17% to an arbitrator, Mr. Speaker. This province can't afford a 17% increase by an arbitrator. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Surely, Mr. Speaker, the, the truth is still worthy here in this context of some regard. Now, I will, I will table and read, too, uh, this statement of the Premier's. This is from 2013, uh, and this is a statement I also agree with. The foundation of any collective bargaining is the fact that the employer and employee have to be at the table feeling equal, feeling that they are both having their voices heard, and negotiating and working out what is an agreement that will potentially last for years down the road. In order for the agreement to have any kind of substance, both the employer and the employee have to feel valued at the end of the day when that agreement is finished. Let me ask the Premier, can he find a single word in that statement that is consistent with his treatment this week of the Crown Attorneys of our province? The Honourable Premier. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker, very much, Mr. Speaker. I've just laid out to the Honourable Member. The Crowns came to the table with 17 per cent and wanted to go immediately to arbitration, Mr. Speaker. That's not free and open collective bargaining, Mr. Speaker. He's very right, Mr. Speaker. They were not looking for a deal. They were looking for an arbitrator of 17 per cent. And unlike the Honourable Member, Mr. Speaker, this province cannot afford a 17 per cent increase. We were Order, please. The Honourable Premier has the floor. Mr. Speaker, we were treating Crowns fairly, Mr. Speaker. There's a 4 per cent increase across the top, Mr. Speaker, through the entire steps plus 7 per cent, Mr. Speaker. I want to remind the honourable members, Mr. Speaker, they are the highest paid crowns in Atlantic Canada, Mr. Speaker. We're talking about, Mr. Speaker, being fair to all public servants. That's what this piece of legislation is about, Mr. Speaker. The honourable leader of the New Democratic Party. Teachers, health care workers, civil servants, lawyers, every time this government enters into a negotiation, we're ended up with a, a huge swath of people who have been disregarded, disrespected, and under the heavy hammer of legislation. And all of this stands in such profound contrast to the commitment that this Premier made to the people of the province in the open letter that I tabled here yesterday, in which he pledged himself to be an upholder of collective bargaining and a protector of the rights of workers. Let me ask the Premier, does he agree with me that the word of the government of Nova Scotia is something that is very important and the word of the Premier of the no if Nova Scotia is something that is very important and that both of these are things that ought to be able to be trusted in by the people of our province. The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as I said uh, a few minutes ago, Mr. Speaker, the leader of the Conservative Party, Mr. Speaker, I've been consistent from day one in this job, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to ensuring that we treat our workers fairly in this province, provide a collective agreements this province can afford. I hear the member from Cape Breton again, Mr. Speaker, interrupting. Let me be clear about this, Mr. Speaker. When they had an opportunity to govern, they increased 7.5% pay wages across the teachers and they took $65 million off the out of the classrooms on the backs of our children to get an agreement, Mr. Speaker. These, Mr. Speaker, negotiations are tough, Mr. Speaker. When you go to the bargaining table, Mr. Speaker, both sides have to be willing to look for an agreement, Mr. Speaker. I want to repeat again. 
The Crowns came to the table with a 17% increase and wanted to go to arbitration. We brought in, Mr. Speaker, a 7% pay raise. We went through the steps after that, Mr. Speaker, to try to get a deal to collapse them, increasing almost every crown across this province would have seen on day one of signing this agreement, plus the 7%, Mr. Speaker. That is a government looking for a deal, Mr. Speaker, not one looking for a third party who want to give us 17%. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Mr. Speaker, the Premier can try to rewrite the history of the negotiations as many times as he wants, and he's happy to do it because he knows the Crowns will, res will respect the nature of the negotiations, which was good faith and without prejudice. And he can try to pick something out and make it history, but we all know that the history of this Premier's actions speak much louder than what he's trying to write here. I would like to draw the House's attention to a column that appeared in today's edition of the Chronicle Herald. I can table that for the, uh, for the benefit of the, uh, of the member's office. Mr. Speaker, I can't quote from this column because uh, the author is allowed to use terms that are highly appropriate in the situation, but I just wouldn't be allowed to use them on the floor of the House. Nevertheless, they are terms that directly and co correctly indict this government for their shameful handling of this Crown's arbitration agreement. My question for the uh, Premier, does he acknowledge that his willingness and his quick, uh, quick, quick willingness to rip up any contract he has sends a message that has very serious, uh, very serious ripple effect on the province? The Honourable Premier. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member, uh, Mr. Speaker. We've been consistent. Uh, from day one, Mr. Speaker, when we were given the privilege to govern this province, and we were going to, Mr. Speaker, assign fair collective agreements not only to those employees who work for us, Mr. Speaker, but entire taxpayers, Mr. Speaker, across this province, 70% of whom, Mr. Speaker, have no benefits uh, in this province. I have a responsibility, Mr. Speaker, to ensure. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we create an economic environment that, Mr. Speaker, we see the kind of benefits that we've seen, where population is all-time high. More young people are choosing to live and work in this province, Mr. Speaker. Pre-primary is here for every four-year-old, regardless of the socioeconomic circumstances they're born into, Mr. Speaker. Those are realities, Mr. Speaker. At the same time, we've offered, Mr. Speaker, what is a fair wage, and we went to the bargaining table looking for an agreement, Mr. Speaker. Day two, 17 percent, we want to go to arbitration, Mr. Speaker. That's not fair in open collective bargaining, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable leader of the official opposition. Mr. Speaker, I would submit that something is consistent in the Premier's actions, and that is that he won't negotiate with anyone because he doesn't know how to negotiate with anyone. I happen to suspect uh, that the story is the reverse of the way the Premier tells it, and that the Crowns were the ones that were actually trying to negotiate a deal, and the Premier is the one that instructed his team, it doesn't matter what happens, tell them I will legislate, because that is exactly where we plan. This, the column uh, from the Herald today goes on, and I'll modify a quote slightly to bring it in line with the decorum of this House, Mr. Speaker. The government's signature on that agreement was worthless is the word I will use, Mr. Speaker. Last week, faced with a situation in which after, after negotiations, the Premier's gang simply decided to change the rules. That is, we know that's what happened, Mr. Speaker. It's a matter of public record now. I'd like to ask the Premier, does the Premier understand that he has damaged the reputation of the province in the eyes of everyone that has a contract with him because they know the way he acts when contracts are involved? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker, in the eyes of everyone looking at this province, more young people see a future for themselves in this place, Mr. Speaker. We see a, a, a social program, Mr. Speaker, large in my lifetime, with pre-primary program, Mr. Speaker, that's been what every four-year-old, regardless of the social and economic circumstances they're born into, Mr. Speaker, are going to get an opportunity to start school correctly, Mr. Speaker. The reality of it is we provide it fair offer on the table, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member can stand in his place over and over again, Mr. Speaker, and use words and try to incite what's happening on the floor. Andrew Scheer tried it in the federal election, Mr. Speaker. It didn't work. Jason Kenney tried it at home, Mr. Speaker. Today, Albertans, about, Albertans are going to find out where they got that got them, Mr. Speaker. And I want to tell the honourable member, we're still going to continue to build this province and create opportunities. Because unlike him, lots of people see a future for themselves here. The honourable member for Cape Breton Centre. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. 
Last week, leading Labour and member of the Order of Canada, Paul Cavaluzzo, was incensed, as I am, about the government's disdain for collective bargaining rights. Mr. Cavaluzzo drew attention to the fact in 2015 the Supreme Court of Canada found that unions and workers' associations must have a lever in collective bargaining in order to help rectify the fundamental power imbalance between employers and their workers in employment relationships. The government has taken this lever away from many groups of workers through essential service legislation and legislative contracts. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier admit that his government has failed to respect the collective bargaining process that workers have a right to and be clear on this, um, uh, Mr. Speaker, that governments before him or before this government are years ago. This government has been in place for six years. Take responsibility. Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, again, I, 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 I want to acknowledge the statement made by the member who was at law amendments, Mr. Speaker. The reality of it is that's what we're doing. We're providing them the right to strike, Mr. Speaker, with the essential service legislation. I want to remind the honourable member, she can laugh about this if she likes, Mr. Speaker. The reality of it is, when they were in power, health care workers across this province had the right to strike, order, Mr. Speaker. Order, please. Order, please. This will be the last time. We'll have to call order for uh, heckling and outbursts. Uh, the next time I have to call order, the person will be asked to excuse themselves. The Honourable Premier. Again, I want to remind the Honourable Member, when they were in power, health care workers had the right to strike without any essential service, Mr. Speaker. They could bring the system to a halt if they disagreed with the employer. The reality of it is what's happening here, Mr. Speaker. The Crown's wanted 17 percent increase, going to arbitration without any movement. The reality of it is, Mr. Speaker, Nova Scotia taxpayers cannot afford that. We provided them with a way to express themselves through the right to strike, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre. To be clear, Mr. Speaker, we never brought the system to a halt, and also, this government has been in power for six years. It's time to take responsibility. Mr. Speaker, as the Premier has said on numerous occasions, Nova Scotia died for their labour rights. And I'm sure the Premier knows William Davis was shot and killed by company police on June 11th. Earlier that year, when, minors, when the miners' contract expired, BESCO had cut off negotiations and refused to deal with the union. In an attempt to starve out the workers and undermine their bargaining power, the Steel Corporation cut off credit for mining companies and company stores. This government has been practicing the modern equivalent of this tactic by unilaterally legislating the terms of bargaining on every Nova Scotia public sector worker. Mr. Speaker, this Premier commemorating Davis Day this year, he implied that William Davis died on the job when, in fact, he died striking for a fair collective agreement. And I'd like to ask the Premier, what is his thought on William Davis and how he actually died fighting for collective agreement rights? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, uh, first of all, I want to tell the Honourable Member, Mr. Speaker, I was here, Mr. Speaker, when people had the health care workers had the right to strike. I want her to tell those Nova Scotians who had surgeries cancelled, Mr. Speaker, because oh, people didn't believe it was essential service, Mr. Speaker. The reality of it is that's what was happening, Mr. Speaker. We brought in essential service legislation by allowing health care workers the right to rush strike. I want to remind the Honourable Member what we've done here in this, in this place, Mr. Speaker. Crown attorneys wanted a 17 per cent pay raise, and we're not moving, Mr. Speaker. They continued to go directly to arbitration. We provided an option, Mr. Speaker. We were not letting an arbitrator, Mr. Speaker, distinguish between 17 and 7, which is a fair wage, Mr. Speaker. The reality of it is, and she goes back to 1923, when William Davis was fighting 25, Order, Mr. Speaker. Please. Order, please. Order, please. Order, please. Order, please. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre will come to order. The Honourable Premier. Let me go back to 1925 when William Davis was fighting for a safe working environment, Mr. Speaker. People were dying in those mines, Mr. Speaker. The reality of it is we have the highest paid crowns in Atlantic Canada. We offered them, Mr. Speaker, a 4% bump right off the top through the wage pattern and a 7% increase, which would have kept them at the top in Atlantic Canada. There's a far cry from what the Honourable Member is trying to stretch in this house today, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, an interesting thing just happened. The Premier said he wouldn't let an arbitrator decide between 17 and 7. Right. 
That's a negotiation. That's when you go between. He's stuck on 17, but he just acknowledged that an arbitrator could decide anywhere in between. That's the reality of it. And in the Premier's, in the Premier's, uh, in the Premier's mandate letter to the Minister of Justice in 2017, uh, reducing delays to the justice system was one of the stated priorities, and I can table that, that mandate letter for the benefit of the, of the Premier. But as a result of this government's actions, that's not happening. Uh, 30 years of labour stability, 30 years of court system stability was what was staring this Premier in the face and he decided to walk away from that. I'd like to ask the, the Premier, what does the Premier say to those victims of crime that are being re-victimised by his own my way or the highway mentality? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, uh, first of all, Mr. Speaker, I want to remind the Honourable Member, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, Crown attorneys are stuck on 17 per cent, Mr. Speaker. Let's, that's the reality. Uh, the fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank Mr. Speaker, those crowns, Mr. Speaker, who were in courthouses across the province yesterday to ensure uh, those Nova Scotians, Mr. Speaker, who have been involved, whether it's been in murder cases, Mr. Speaker, uh, I, Mr. Speaker, I was alarmed when I seen uh, uh, some of the cases that are being here dismissed. I want to thank those crowns that were working, Mr. Speaker, and I hope the honourable member will help us have patches of this bill so crowns can get back to work, Mr. Speaker. The honourable leader of the official opposition. As soon as the Premier decides he wants to honour the word of the province, we will be right there beside him to make sure that that happens. The, Premier's, the Premier is responsible and the Minister of Justice are responsible for the, uh, the, the constant movement of the justice system. They are responsible for that. And yes, Crown Attorneys are part of it, but the Premier and the Justice Minister are responsible for it. Again, in the Premier's 2017 mandate letter to the, to the Minister of Justice, the Premier stressed supports for gender-based violence, and he said, being responsive to those who struggle the most supports the safety and security of all Nova Scotians. And I think all Nova Scotians would have some serious questions about whether this Premier has lived up to that pledge of support. I'd like to ask the, I'd like to ask the Premier, Will the Premier uh, honour his word, his contract, and in doing so, support the victims of crime of this province? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank uh, the Honourable Member for the question. He's had plenty of opportunity, Mr. Speaker, to stand in his place uh, to say whether he believes a 17 per cent pay raise, Mr. Speaker, that Crowns are looking for and want to go to directly arbitration Order, is fair. Mr. The Honourable Premier has the floor. This will be the last time I'll ask the Leader of the Opposition to come to order. The Honourable Premier. And maybe when the Honourable Member gets an opportunity to stand up in this place again, Mr. Speaker, he can tell uh, those uh, family child workers, Mr. Speaker, who are called into homes across this province to deal with very difficult circumstances, what people do to their children, that they're not worth the 17 per cent, Mr. Speaker, that you say Crown's worth. Because he's going to treat employees differently in this province, Mr. Speaker. The reality of it is we're trying to be fair across the entire public sector. We went to the bargaining table looking for a negotiated settlement, Mr. Speaker. It was very clear. 17 per cent is where it was, and we're going to arbitration. The Honourable Member for Dermoth East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. We know that the online world has become increasingly vicious and often very difficult to navigate. Members of this House have experienced online vitriol, and some know firsthand how difficult that is to cope with. But imagine, Mr. Speaker, the trauma of experiencing physical and verbal abuse by peers at school. I know we all agree school should be the safest place for our youth. Unfortunately, that's not always the case. Just today, CBC News reported on its month-long investigation that discovered, quote, a lack of national data on the amount of violence that happens in Canadian schools, end quote. And I'll table that, Mr. Speaker. My question to the minister is, what data does the department have on incidents of online bullying and harassment and incidents of physical and verbal abuse? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The data that's collected in the department is based on reporting of those incidences. Um, one thing that was issued in the, the media story was that, um, uh, according to their survey, many students weren't reporting. So I think the first message we want to deliver to those students who are experiencing any sort of incidences of bullying or assault or discrimination, there are safe avenues for you to report what's happening confidentially without fear of reprisal from those that are, that are bothering you. Uh, this happens through our Schools Press Plus program, which we have fully implemented in Nova Scotia. Our, our incredible guidance counselors, which we've hired more of, our behavioral um, 
teaching experts, our child and youth care practitioners. We are trying to build a system that wraps our arms around our students so that not only can they achieve well uh, academically, but their well-being is well preserved as well. The Honourable Member for Nairman East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I want to thank the Minister for that. I mean, that is a very important message to communicate to our students, uh, to know that they are supported. Uh, I know everyone appreciates the attempt to collect data and develop policies to better uh, deter abusive behaviour. This investigation by CBC clearly shows, Mr. Speaker, we still have a long way to go uh, with this issue in our schools. Let's not forget that when we look past statistics, many of our students, some of our students are suffering, and in some cases, uh, lives are at risk. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it seems at times we're not getting to the root of the problem. And many respondents to the CBC investigation stated the problem is that, quote, no action has been taken at times by schools in response to the complaint. So, Mr. Speaker, this is my question. What policies are in development to de deter this type of behaviour in our schools, and what steps is the department taking to make students feel safe? Thank you, yep. Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Education. Uh, thank you much. Very much appreciate this important question. We do have a new and, for the first time in our province, inclusive education policy, which I'll table for the member, um, in which we, we, we identify the appropriate process that must be taken every time a student reports an incident. Um, involving bullying, assault, discrimination, or, or anything that's impacting them negatively. Uh, the process that our, that our teachers and staff uh, do require, according to this policy, is to, to validate and affirm um, the, uh, the issue and take appropriate action. Uh, one of the things that have, have been raised through, through this uh, report from CBC is that students did believe there was a lack of action being taken based on the reported incidents. Mr. Speaker, this policy, I believe, with the appropriate training for teachers and our staff, will help deal with that situation. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Question for the Minister of Energy or possibly NSPI, whoever wishes to answer. Last Friday, I raised the question of the Bearhead LNG terminal near Port Hawkesbury. This is a prime piece of property in a strategic location with millions already invested in, in that terminal. The Houston-based companies decided to shut down Nova Scotia operations. Mr. Speaker, the land was once owned by the province, and in the agreement to sell it to the original developers, there was a requirement that it actually be developed bringing jobs and a boost to the local economy. Now we see a pullback from the uh, company in Houston. They could sit on this asset for years. Now the government has options. The terms of the agreement for the property allow us to get it back if progress is not being made. Will the minister enforce these terms to ensure Nova Scotians benefit from the land that they once owned? The Honourable Minister of Energy and Mines. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for the question. Uh, at this point right now, we don't have any new information on the project. Uh, again, as I've said uh, uh, through uh, in the last round of questioning, that uh, the company uh, is still uh, moving forward. Uh, you know, any decisions that they make are, are going to be uh, based on uh, uh, on uh, on them really, and on what the private sector's decisions are made. I can say that you know we're monitoring. Uh, the project, uh, you know, it's one that we support. We see that uh, there is potentially uh, billions of dollars of investment in our province. Uh, the UARB plays a, the part in enforcing the regulations, uh, and uh, we'll let them do that. Thank you. The Honourable House Leader for the official opposition. Mr. Speaker, the reason I ask the question, I think there's an interest for the province to protect the interests of the area. Um, we also know that the construction permit obtained to build the terminal required the company to have a Nova Scotia-based office. This would ensure some benefit to the province while the project developed. And I think we could also count on having some local people employed who are pushing for the project as well. Uh, it is certainly on our radar, but Mr. Speaker, the World Series is on, and perhaps all they're interested in doing in Houston these days is watching the Astros. <laughs> uh, I have pointed out two very strong points of leverage held by the province to advance this project, is the minister aware of other permits or measures that require LNG Limited to maintain a Nova Scotia presence or take other actions that would benefit our province? The Honourable Minister of Business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I do thank the member for the question. Uh, uh, certainly, I know that one uh, person in particular references Paul McLean, who's been a, a champion for that project and, and for, for what the future holds. Uh, and and not, un, not unlike the other project uh, in that region, Mr. Speaker, uh, related to LNG, uh, the world markets and how the, the, the reality of shale gas and, and um, 
the U.S. being a, a net producer and an exporter of this energy has really impacted uh, the, the future for this plan. As far as the, the land, uh, incredibly valuable. Some of the assets that are there are certainly uh, something that uh, we want to protect and, and ensure that whether it be job creation uh, or some kind of uh, other uh, development that could take place there. If it wasn't uh, this group in particular, we would explore all those options. I'd be happy to keep the member informed on that. Uh, that's NSBI's role there. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, we still haven't received official word that there was going to be that, that exodus, and we certainly will maintain all obligations, including uh, that reality that a, a presence has to be here in Nova Scotia. Thanks. The Honourable Member for sackville Cobbequid. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. All my questions will be for the Minister of Housing, Nova Scotia. The Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives July 18, 2019 report on accommodating rental housing wage in Canada states that some states that in order to afford rent at 30% of income, an average two-bedroom apartment in Sackville, you will need to make $21.12 an hour. In the north end of Dartmouth around Elbow Lake, that number is $21.04 an hour. For both, that would mean if you were working at minimum wage, you'd have to work 73 hours a week to afford a two-bedroom ap apartment. Our elderly are really suffering and will continue to suffer. So my question for the minister is, as the cost of housing continues to increase, how specifically is the minister ensuring elderly Nova Scotians can afford shelter? The Honourable Minister of Housing. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question uh, from the Honourable Member. Uh, he touches on a very important uh, issue in the, uh, right across this province, not only here in the HRM, Mr. Speaker, but right across the province where there are housing needs that we all, through as MLAs, deal with on a, on a regular basis. Uh, I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, that we're fortunate to have just signed the National Housing Strategy. It is an important uh, agreement that we have for the next decade. We've signed our first three-year agreement uh, by way of an action plan. There's a lot going on, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue to work with our community partners. We'll continue to recognize that we have uh, uh, concerns and issues around housing, not only for seniors, but low-income Nova Scotians right across the board, Mr. Speaker. And we'll work every day to ensure that we can do the very best on behalf of all those in need, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The Honourable Member for sackville Cobbequid. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for that response, uh, Minister. And uh, I'm really looking forward to actually implementing that housing strategy that you talk about because I'm looking sp for specifics. I'm looking for action. So we've had a goal of keeping Nova Scotians living at home longer. That's an admirable goal. I certainly support that. The HRM has asked for more decision-making power when it comes to housing. Municipalities are leading a lot of the charge creating rules around affordable housing with new developments. But outside of that, their hands are tied in terms of actual steps they can take. Question is, with housing now being the responsibility of the Department of Municipal Affairs, Will the government be working more closely with municipalities to ensure all Nova Scotians are able to afford living at home longer? The Honourable Minister of Housing, Nova Scotia. Thank you uh, again, uh, Mr. Speaker, very much, and I appreciate the question from the Honourable Member, again raising a very uh, important uh, concern and issue across this province around seniors uh, wanting to live at home longer. We certainly support that. Obviously, Mr. Speaker, there have been a number of programs in the past that have been developed around that, the rehabilitation programs, home re adaption programs, and, and much more, Mr. Speaker. I know the Honourable Member has talked about how he's looking forward to seeing more detail, and that is a very much balanced approach as we go forward. Some of those programs have been ongoing, Mr. Speaker. This agreement allows us to continue a lot of those investments as well as uh, develop new plans, Mr. Speaker. Those plans are underway. We'll be sharing more of that with the, the Honourable Member and all members of this House and all Nova Scotians uh, in the coming uh, weeks and months, Mr. Speaker, as we proceed. Thank you. Just before we move on to the next question, I'd like to remind all members the use of electronic devices is strictly prohibited during question period. The Honourable Member for Cumberland, or pardon me, Sackville, Cobbequid. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In April 2017, the government announced an investment of a quarter of a million dollars to help residents of the Tufts Cove community in Dartmouth spruce up their properties, and I'll table that. In, 20, in the 2017-18 Housing Nova Scotia Accountability Report, it stated that the Tufts Cove Neighbourhood Improvement Project received a Minister's Ideal Award with staff dedication, for its staff dedication. This was a welcome investment to the often forgotten area of Dartmouth, an area in which I have roots. With many low-income residents in the area, this investment was believed to be one of the only ways that they would have a means to fix up their landscaping, fencing or siding. My question for the Minister is, 
After more than two years later, can the House receive an update as to what lessons were learned from this project and what neighbourhood improvement initiatives are currently being undertaken? The Honourable Minister of Housing, Nova Scotia. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, I thank the Honourable uh, Member for his question. Um, we will continue to work uh, in a variety of neighbourhoods right across this province, Mr. Speaker. We believe those are investments that are certainly good investments. Uh, there's much work to be done, uh, Mr. Speaker. We will continue to have a very good relationship, Mr. Speaker. And I would say we have a very, very good relationship with our municipalities, uh, not only just here in the HRM, but right across the province. We'll continue to work uh, every day with those folks, Mr. Speaker, and, and advance the priorities of this government, in fact, all Nova Scotians. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Sackville, Cobbequay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Tufts Cove was the fifth community in five years to benefit from Housing Nova Scotia's Neighbourhood Improvement Initiative. The program was originally brought in by the former NDP government, but it has seen zero investment since the Tufts Cove project was announced in 2017. Different community beautification programs exist, but none are quite the same as the one used in the Tufts Cove project. Makes you wonder whether we are moving forward. My question is, where the Neighbourhood Improvement Initiative is considered a successful project, will there be more funding for future projects? Thank you, Mr. Minister. The Honourable Minister of Housing, Nova Scotia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, I thank the Honourable Member for his question. We are always looking at opportunities, Mr. Speaker, through programs and funding initiatives, uh, working with our municip municipalities uh, right across the province. The beautification program was one that has great uptake, Mr. Speaker. That's just an example. We have uh, others that are planned. We'll talk more about those as well in the coming uh, months, uh, Mr. Speaker, as well, that we're trying to get developed and get out the door. And and municipalities will have every opportunity uh, to work with us and to uh, there's no shortage of applications and asks coming in the door as we all know mr. speaker by way of communities projects and they're all great projects mr. speaker as a government we have to have a very balanced approach as to how we move forward we'll continue to do that and we will invest mr. speaker right across this province in a fiscally responsible manner mr. speaker thank you very much the honorable house leader for the new democratic party mr. speaker my question today is for the premier First, yesterday and again today, the Premier spent a great deal of time criticizing our caucus for decisions made over a decade ago. But the topic, Mr. Speaker, was the Crown Attorney strike, which is happening right now. Mr. Speaker, can the Premier tell this House who was in government in 2016 when the 30-year framework agreement was signed, which gave Crown prosecutors the right to binding arbitration in the event that negotiations break down? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I wish I could wave a magic wand, Mr. Speaker, to eliminate the ramifications of the decisions that the Democratic Party made when they were in government. The fact of the reality is, Mr. Speaker, we still have to pay that bill. The Honourable Member, the 7.5% pay rate, which was $700 million in advance on their way out the door, Mr. Speaker, embedded into an economy that was growing by 500, Mr. Speaker. The math doesn't add up, Mr. Speaker. That's why order, it's important. Please. The Honourable Member for That's Dartmouth right. South will come to order. The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, that's why it's important, Mr. Speaker, to be able to ensure that we have a, an agreement that's fair to our workers, Mr. Speaker, and fair to all taxpayers, Mr. Speaker, so that we can grow an economy, we can create an environment where young people want to live, where our population will grow, where we see opportunity, Mr. Speaker, where the Federation, Mr. Speaker, is looking at this province in a positive way, Mr. Speaker. Unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, I have to do it in the framework that I was handed, Mr. Speaker, and I want to go back to the conversation. And Mr. Speaker, I want to go back to the conversation, Mr. Speaker. She's very right. She's very right, Mr. Speaker. The Crowns came to the table with a 70% ask in a day two looking for arbitration. That's not fair in collective bargaining, Mr. Speaker. That is using the process to get to an arbitrator. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Mr. Speaker, I know that this is question period and not answer period, but I will answer my own question. It was the Premier himself who gave the Crowns binding arbitration. Mr. Speaker, this government imposed a wage package on thousands of social workers, nurses, and other frontline service providers and legislated a contract on teachers. Bill 148 and Bill 75 are both currently being challenged in court. When the BC Teachers Federation challenged the constitutionality of legislation which stripped their teachers of the right to bargain class size and composition, the Supreme Court ruled in their favour, Mr. Speaker, and it was estimated that this ruling would result in an additional $250 to $300 million in costs for that province. So, Mr. Speaker, will the Premier concede that his failure to respect the collective bargaining process doesn't save money, it just kicks the cost down the road, leaving the bill for the next premier. The Honourable Premier. 
Uh, no, Mr. Speaker, not at all, Mr. Speaker. If I did that, I'd be New Democrat, Mr. Speaker. The reality of it is, Mr. Speaker, the cap class that she's referring to British Columbia, we actually instituted in this province, Mr. Speaker. At the same time, Mr. Speaker, replace the $65 million they took off the backs of children to sign a collective agreement with teachers. At the same time, we provided a fair collective agreement for teachers, Mr. Speaker. The reality of it is, Mr. Speaker, you need a balance, Mr. Speaker. You need to be able to ensure, Mr. Speaker, that not only are you treating the workers of this province fairly, Mr. Speaker, that work for the government, but you're treating all taxpayers fairly, Mr. Speaker. Unlike opposition, I have a responsibility for every taxpayer, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Victor Centre. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the uh, Minister of Health and Wellness. Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, our community is presently attempting to deal with the very sad reality of two of our constituents who are navigating their way through each day in a confused and sometimes angry state. They are alone and one is basically homeless but for his wheelchair. Both men continually decline help, making it almost impossible to help without the intervention of some authority. They are no longer able to make sound decisions for themselves because they do not have the benefit of a family doctor and they have not officially been deemed incapacitated, they are able to sign themselves out of protection. Question for the uh, Minister. Is the Minister aware of the danger that exists for our mostly senior Nova Scotians when they reach this point in their lives with no one to provide the necessary care needed? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I, I thank the member for uh, taking the opportunity to raise this uh, very important question uh, in the legislature. Uh, indeed, uh, I believe we, we are aware of, of uh, circumstances from time to time. Uh, the members uh, raised two specific ones in his constituency. I, I, I uh, can note that I'm, I'm not aware of uh, specific circumstances there, but, but obviously uh, uh, we can uh, connect uh, outside of this, uh, this chamber uh, to uh, discuss further and and we can look into it. But what I want to assure the member and, and all members of the legislature is there are uh, processes. We have adult protection as one avenue, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we get the details. Certainly our adult protection team uh, can uh, look into the circumstance of the situation uh, for those two individuals. I think it's important for all members to know that there are avenues uh, to reach out and, and try to help. So if you're aware of situations, please contact uh, our office in the Department of Health and Wellness Adult Protection. The Honourable Minister member for Pickle Centre. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that answer. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we have com communicated with local police who have responded almost daily to, to calls of concern with respect to these gentlemen. They do what they can, but quickly they are signed out of hospital, in most cases, back on the streets. It is almost November. These men are in true danger of becoming a victim to the elements if something is not done soon. So again, the, uh, my question to the Minister would be, would the Minister commit to setting up community supports from adult protection, continuing care in the medical community to put in place solid plans to protect these people. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I thank uh, the member again uh, for raising this, uh, this important uh, topic. Uh, th the answer, Mr. Speaker, is in fact uh, those uh, organizations uh, that have been referenced, our adult protection uh, within uh, the Department of Health and Wellness, the, our partners with the Nova Scotia Health Authority uh, and others, uh, Mr. Speaker, is exactly what uh, the programs and services we have there uh, are designed to do to help our, our most vulnerable uh, citizens. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, within that uh, space, though, there are sometimes uh, balances uh, where individuals' capacity to, um, to accept the help that we reach out to offer. Uh, when that uh, becomes a, a, a challenge, we do have legislation that we have collectively passed here in the, in the legislature, Mr. Speaker, around uh, alternate decision makers if that uh, is a course of avenue that needs to be pursued. As I said, uh, we can connect outside the chamber. We'll get the specific details and get the right people uh, to reach out and see what can be the done. Honourable Member for Pearl Harbor Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is either to the Minister of Seniors or the Minister of Mines and Energy. One of the biggest hindrances for seniors in our province taking part in their communities is accessible services for sustainable transportation. The proposed hike to seniors fares in HRM did raise concerns that the government doesn't truly realize how important accessible transportation is, and I'll table that, but I'll table them all at the end. The 1919, or sorry, 2019-20 Accessible Transportation Assistance Program gave grants to 13 groups around the province for the purchase of vans. 
The HRM uh, Centre Plan did nothing for my community to improve accessible transportation, so I'm asking the Minister of Energy and Mines, can the Minister tell me how many groups applied for that uh, accessible Transportation Assistance Program grant compared to how many actually got the grant? Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Communities, Culture and Heritage. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the question, and uh, it's, it's a very, very good one. And, uh, and I, when I look at the past uh, year, uh, we put uh, 2.5 million into uh, accessible uh, transportation, and uh, it was spread from uh, one end of the province uh, uh, to the other. And uh, what, I can, what I can tell the member uh, opposite is that, again, uh, this year, uh, in fact, just this week, I have signed off on a, a number of grants uh, that have gone out to, in fact, uh, more of the uh, transportation network, uh, both here in the city and in uh, rural uh, Nova Scotia. The Honourable Member for Cole Harbour Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate it. It was a good question. I got a gold star from the Minister of Health uh, my first time in, so I'm still waiting for another one. Um, uh, the fact, though, is that there were 13 groups that got grants for, for the vans, a total of uh, $724,786. So my question actually was, how many groups actually applied for grants? Because that would give us an indication of what the need was. But I'll move on, Mr. Speaker. Constituency offices received many calls from seniors who are looking for ways to get to appointments but can't afford it. Community and initiatives help to fill that gap. The uh, Low Carbon Communities Program, uh, the Connect 2, is one of those ways that has been allotted, and there were 11 grant recipients last year that got $702,000. I'm wondering if the Minister can tell me how many groups applied for that grant and didn't get it this last year. The Honourable Minister of Mines and Energy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I can provide some additional information to the member. Um, there is a process that uh, community organizations will go through uh, that uh, is vetted uh, to ensure that uh, we're doing our best to distribute funds uh, for these projects uh, all across the province. Um, we've seen some great projects uh, in communities that uh, have helped connect communities, give people more options to uh, to travel uh, in various ways, uh, and we're going to continue to support that. So, uh, Mr. Speaker, very happy to have a conversation with the member to give her more information about Connect2. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Cole Harbour Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So to be clear, what I'm looking for from both ministers is how many people applied versus how many people got denied. Thank you. Um, I'll go back to the Minister of Seniors. We all know that the the uh, Nova Scotia is, uh, has the oldest population in the country, and so it presents us with unique challenges. An issue that isn't talked about as much is mental health, especially in the elderly, specifically the issue of loneliness. The Nova Scotia Health Authority by the numbers uh, for last year and the previous year show that the number of Nova Scotians seen in outpatients, mental health services, dropped by 1,300, so we've not expanded that service. The goal of keeping Nova Scotians at home as long as possible needs Needs to address this issue. Can the Minister of Seniors tell me what his government is doing to combat loneliness in our elderly population? The Honourable Minister of Seniors. Thank you very much uh, for the uh, for the question, and uh, it is a uh, significant uh, uh, issue in our province. Uh, we have now uh, reached uh, 200,000 Nova Scotians who are past the age of uh, uh, 65. Uh, but in particular, of course, we have uh, we have a very advanced uh, cohort uh, as well. Uh, I think the uh, the main pillar of the uh, shift document is focused on uh, connecting seniors with their community, uh, with their organizations. Uh, and in the past year, uh, we have provided uh, $2.5 million uh, for community transportation networks. Uh, went to the AGM of uh, the uh, uh, Nova Scotia Transportation Network as well as rural transportation and uh, they're seeing the benefits of uh, this investment and there are many uh, senior daycare programs uh, in this province and uh, and it is uh, and they're connected uh, with the shuttles and with the transportation and by the way we also provided 10,000 passes for low income and seniors in the province. <laughs> The Honourable Member for Cole Harbour Eastern Passage. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The United Kingdom recently became leaders in combating loneliness when they appointed a minister responsible for loneliness and undertook a loneliness strategy, and I'll table that as well. This was an important step that showed how serious the issue truly was and how seriously they were taking it. The Chief Officer of Age in the United Kingdom says that loneliness can be worse for seniors' health than smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Placing someone responsible for this specific problem shows that this is a priority. Has the Minister of Seniors considered taking a similar step in Nova Scotia? The Honourable Minister of Seniors. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thanks, the Member, for the question. Uh, when it comes to uh, dealing with, uh, uh, with the uh, isolation of seniors, uh, the grant that we provide to a myriad of community organizations called uh, the Age Friendly uh, Grants are proving to be, uh, in fact, an exceptional way of uh, being right on the front line, supporting organizations that are checking on uh, seniors. Uh, one of the programs, for example, in Mahone Bay, uh, provided a group of seniors with a network that enabled them to actually check in on, uh, on seniors who were living alone. Uh, to make sure how they were doing. We have this now uh, being replicated in other communities across the province, and what I would encourage uh, the member to do uh, is in her community uh, have uh, senior organizations apply for an age-friendly grant because it is working extremely well. The Honourable Member for Paul Harbour Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The last few years have... Order, please. The time allotted. I was feeling kind of lonely up here, so. <laughs> time allotted for oral questions put by members to ministers has expired. We'll now move on to government business. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that you do now leave the chair and the House resolve itself into a committee of the whole House on bills. The House will now recess for a few minutes while it resolves itself into the committee of the whole House on bills.
Order. The Committee of the Whole House on Bills will come to order. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Madam Chair. Would you please call Bill Number 203, the Crown Attorneys Labour Relations Act? I call Bill Number 203, the Crown Attorneys Labour Re Re Relations Act. The Clerk. Madam Chair, Bill Number 203 was referred from the Committee on Law Amendments back to the House without amendments, and the bill contains 18 clauses and two schedules. Shall Clause 1 carry? I recognize the Honourable Member for Pictou East. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. There's certainly been a lot of uh, discussion on this piece of legislation over the last few days and much more, much more to follow because the ramifications of this piece of legislation are, are far and wide across our justice system as we're, as we're experiencing. Uh, Nova Scotians right now are understanding the value of the service that our Crown Attorneys provide. They're starting to understand the service that our Crown Attorneys provide to victims of very serious crime in this province. Uh, murders, rapes, sexual assaults, serious assaults. Nova Scotians are, are starting to realize the importance of, uh, of our, our Crown Attorneys and the justice system. And they're also having a few other things confirmed. Uh, and they, they know, they have known for some time that the, the Premier is, is uh, uh, and, and his government very willing to take little sound bites out of context and just pound them and pound them and pound them. And we're, we've seen that over the last uh, few days with the Premier's reference to the number 17. And I don't know if the 17 is accurate. I don't know if it's being uh, presented in a, in a, in a fair fashion or if it's being uh, misrepresented. I, I don't know that, but I do know one thing. Uh, I do know, know that any number that's taken out of a negotiation uh, process deserves perspective. And uh, I know that because of the history of this government. It wasn't that long ago, I think it was maybe five years ago, when this government was on the front page of, uh, of a major newspaper in the province saying that our doctors were greedy. Uh, the, the same strategy that's been employed over and over, the same divisive type of strategy, is also being employed here. Uh, and I know that at the time of the doctor's uh, situation, the, the, the ways that doctors are paid is very complex, um, especially in the, on, the, on the fee for service. Uh, physicians, there's, you know, they're, they're being paid for certain services, being paid different amounts for certain services. And in that particular negotiation, I know there would be, uh, the, um, the members can imagine the pages and pages of different fees for different services. And in that particular situation, uh, this government picked one number out of pages and pages of numbers and said, aha, that's the one we're going to promote. That's the one we're going to use to create a narrative, to manufacture a narrative that doctors are greedy. And, and that, that was a fee for a service that was somewhere in the range of $17 to $20. And under the negotiation, under the process whereby new fees would be determined, the physicians had asked for an increase. And, and you, you, you can imagine that even an increase of $5 on $20 percentage-wise becomes pretty significant. And at the time, that was the number that the Premier plucked out and said, there's the one right there. That's going to sure make them look greedy. Let's pump that one. And that was his strategy at that time. Now, if we roll forward, um, I think you would be hard-pressed to find many Nova Scotians, perhaps uh, government members excluded, that actually think our doctors are greedy. But at the time, that was the communication strategy of the government, and, and focusing on one number was very effective for them. And now we come to present day, same strategy, same, same MO of the government, pick a number, pound it out, try and turn average Nova Scotians, uh, everyday Nova Scotians, against a certain select group of individuals for the benefit of the government. Uh, Madam Chair, that's a very unfair uh, negotiation strategy. It is a terrible way to govern. Um, and we are seeing, uh, we are all bearing the fruit of that strategy uh, today. And, and, and we know, we know as, as members that pay very close attention to what happens in here, uh, that it's, 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 a, it's a strategy that often misrepresents the truth. 
and, and to the average Nova Scotian that's just going about their life and trying to trying to get up and go to work or look after their family commitments or, or take care of the things that matter to them, the things that are consuming them, they don't have time. Uh, they don't have time to, 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 to dig into the details. They want to take things at face value. And that is the approach of this government. And it is very, very uh, far disconnected from reality. And, and the reality, to bring the members back, back, to, uh, back close to home, is that this government signed a contract. This government affixed the seal of the province of Nova Scotia to words on a paper and said, we will honour these words. And at the first opportunity, the very first time that they were asked to honour their own words, they refused. And that is the exact reason that this province sees in the range of a 50% voter turnout. That is the exact reason that people don't trust politicians. Because why should they? When a politician gives their word and signs it, in ink and then turns their back on it. It is a terrible way to govern. But the contract that's being ripped up secured 30 years of labour uh, labor stability. It ensured that for 30 years there would be no disruption in our justice system. That was the negotiated result last time. And there would have been give and take on numerous aspects of the negotiation. And one of those things that the Premier wanted was 30 years of, 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 of stability to our courts. That's what the Premier wanted. That's what the Crown Attorneys wanted. Isn't it nice when two sides want the same thing and they agree on it? And as part of that negotiation, they also agreed if there ever became a time when they could not reach agreement on a full contract, that they would refer it to arbitration. That's what the Premier wanted. That is also what the Crown Attorneys wanted. That is the agreement that they reached. And we had it. 30 years of labour stability, stability to our courts was right in front of us as a signed contract. And today it is gone. And today cases are being dismissed. Assaults. Very, very serious charges of driving while impaired being dismissed in our courts. Those are cases that should never be dismissed. The people who perpetrate those types of crimes should always be held accountable for their actions. They should always be brought to justice. And that's not happening. And today, the pace of the finger pointing is escalating. The fingers are pointing in every single direction. The Minister of Justice was asked uh, who's, who, is, uh, who is, should be held accountable for cases being dismissed. And the Minister of Justice said, the Crown prosecutors bear responsibility for the dismissals. The Minister of Justice said the Crown prosecutors are putting their personal financial needs ahead of, well -being, ahead of the well-being of victims and survivors, and that's problematic. <coughs> Minister of Justice said the Crowns, the people who have dedicated their life to public service, are putting their own financial needs above the well-being of a victim. Madam Chair, I've got to be honest, that doesn't sound like the words of the Minister of Justice. I think that's the words of the Premier. I think that's the words of the Premier coming through the Minister of Justice. Uh, but he said them. And he said them in the face of knowing that this did not have to happen but for the actions of his own government. The Minister of Justice said he's troubled by the fact that our prosecutors who are looking out for their personal financial best interests over the needs of victims and survivors of domestic violence and sexual assaults and other matters. <coughs> Madam Chair, this is, this is political rhetoric and personal self-interest at its worst. At its worst. This is the time for this government to say, we have a contract 
We wish we didn't sign it. We probably didn't really understand what we were signing because we do that quite a bit. But here we are, and as a result of that, how about we offer a bit of humility and say, we need your help, Crown Attorneys. That would be approach, an approach that people could probably sympathize with. <coughs> We've all made mistakes. I was in business for over 20 years, signed lots of contracts that I wish I didn't sign. I didn't run to the legislature and try to race it away. That's what this government had. And they, it's time now for them to own their own mistakes. And it is a shame uh, to see the Minister of Justice uh, behaving in the manner that he is. And he needs to own it. It's probably the Premier uh, making him do it. Doesn't seem like him. It would be the type of words he would use. Uh, but the labour disruption is here because this government didn't respect the contract. Because this government signed their name to something that they now wish they didn't sign their name to. That's called a mistake. And when you don't know what happens, uh, when you sign a contract, when you don't understand, when you're floundering around, mistakes happen. Uh, mistakes happen, but you own them. Just like when you take $20 million of taxpayer money and you end up with a boat tied up to a wharf for an entire summer, you don't say, well, that's somebody else's fault. You say, you know what? We made a mistake. It wasn't wise to move to Bar Harbor before we had approval. It was a mistake. This is not a government that understands the concept of accountability and responsibility. This is a government that is very, very well-schooled in political rhetoric. So instead, when they make a mistake, they do a postcard and say, oh, isn't that guy an awful person? He's to blame for it. No, no. There's nobody over here that signed the contracts. There's nobody over here that signed the checks. Uh, there's people over here that are observant. And as a result of breaking the contract, Outside this legislature today, we have people marching. And those are the people that have dedicated their lives to upholding the laws of the province. And isn't it ironic that while people march outside in search of uh, the desire to uphold the laws, that the people that sit in here break them? Isn't that just a little bit ironic? It's, it's repugnant, uh, Madam Chair. That's exactly what it is. And outside, um, the Order. Premier. Uh, I, you need to retract. You're accusing someone of breaking the law. Which part? The part about people not marching outside? No. You said he was breaking the law. I said the contract was broken. They had to you said the council were breaking the law. You said they were breaking the law. I, 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 I did say they were breaking the law. Breaking That's on parliamentary. It's on parliamentary. Breaking the law is on parliamentary. That's correct. Saying that someone is breaking the law. Oh, okay. Saying something. The government. The Can you retract your statement, please? I, retract. I, I recognize the honourable member for Pictou East. Thank you. I retract the uh, I retract the statement and um, just reiterate that it's it's a shame that uh, in the fullness of time, Bill 203, I believe, will be seen unlawful. Um, it will be seen to be unlawful. And there's a there's a variety of uh, talking points around the the narrative. And, and one, of the, one of the narratives that the, the Premier uh, pushes forward is that um, uh, 100 people, 100 Crown attorneys, will set a pattern for 75,000 people. 100 people will set the pattern for 75,000 people. Now, I would, I would submit to you, Madam Chair, that anyone who watched the election on Monday night 
would realize that 100 people aren't normally indicative of a pattern. And we could ask Jody Wilson Robold, who was, who Raybolt, Raybolt, who was losing on the first few polls of 100 people, but ended up winning. 100 people does not establish a pattern. And I will come back, I will come back to that because there's a lot of factors in that early indication. In an election for us, it's, well, what polls are reporting. In a negotiation, it might be, well, what job is being done, what service is being provided. There are many, many factors. Uh, there are many given factors. And the problem, the problem with the Premier's analogy that everyone has to have the same is, is he's not conscious of the fact that people start at different levels. Um, and what's fair today is based on a number of factors that, that far extend past what, uh, what somebody else said. And we can talk about... Um, uh, we can talk about a number of those factors, but but the reality is, is that when the uh, when the premier attacks a group of people, it's only to cover their own misgivings, the, the, this government's own misgivings about how how things have happened. So um, the government, um, obviously, a little rattled by this yesterday, rattled off a press release that I do want to walk through uh, and do a little a fact check on the press release. It, it, it looked like, I, I don't know, it looked like maybe somebody kind of banged it out on their phone as they were frantically running away from a, from a scrum or anything, but it def definitely, it definitely bears uh, an analysis. So one of the things <clears throat> of, the, of the press release that was indicated was that uh, the current, the press release stated uh, the current framework agreement with Nova Scotia Crown Attorneys Association was initiated, initiated in 2012 and extended in 2016 and the employment agreement expired in March uh, 2019. And I, I want to focus on that, that, that idea of that it expired because in, 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 in life and in law there is a principle that once a contract expires, if the parties to the contract continue their relationship, then despite the specified term, the contract can only be termed by either side providing reasonable notice. And, and I don't know, um, I don't know that that notice was provided. I certainly haven't seen it. So the terms of the contract remain in effect <clears throat> until the government breach those terms by tabling Bill 203. So, so the, the very first statement of the, of the press release, which would at face value seem to be factual, was completely uh, inaccurate that um, the, it's, the contract is still in force. But the, but the press release continued on with um, the Premier's favourite talking point about the 17%. And it says the association was seeking a 17% increase in pay over four years, plus several additional benefits, all of which would have equated to an annual increase of over $5 million. So um, the, the point of that sentence of the press release is that this is going to be expensive. It's going to cost $5 million a year. Um, it's, it's going to cost the equivalent of four years of one season of, of a boat tied up to a wharf. Um, it's going to be expensive is, is what is the message that... But the problems with that, that statement of the association was seeking 17% increase. I think what really happened is a little bit different than what the, the, um, the rewriting of history from this government. I, I actually think... Um, what really happened is that the association entered negotiations in good faith and they had a confidential negotiation with the province. So in good faith, in confidence with the province and that, and that <clears throat> the association was of course willing to move from their position because that's what people generally expect in a negotiation. That's the way the, the association entered it, good faith, with confidence, probably without prejudice, with an expectation that there would be some moving back and forth. Meanwhile, on the other hand, uh, I believe it to be the case that the government's team attended the first day of the negotiations without any mandate to, to actually have a negotiation. They actually showed up to the table without any, any mandate and, and then at that time advised the association that they were not willing to move uh, from, from their position, which I think was seven, I don't know, um, but it, they weren't willing to move, and, and suggested that if, if their position was not accepted, that legislation could be tabled. 
So on the one hand, you have the Crown attorneys, probably excited, let's get the negotiations going so we can get on with our lives of bringing justice to victims, uh, good faith, without prejudice, willing to really roll the sleeves up and get to work. On the other hand, enter team government. We have no mandate to negotiate with you, but we are here to tell you that if you don't take our position, whatever it might be, there could very well be some legislation. Wink, wink, get my drift. I think that's the way that the, the negotiations would have went. Uh, that essentially, from the <coughs> very beginning, this government threatened legislation. And right now, by what's playing out in real time, in real life, they are threatening every other, every other group that has to negotiate with the province for any reason. Everyone who has an arbitration clause is now understanding government really didn't mean that. It was convenient at the time, but they really didn't mean it. So the second half of that sentence talks about the numbers, and, and that's where they put the 5.2 million out there. And <clears throat> The, the release says that, uh, that the 17% increase would, would cost $5.2 million per year. Now, I don't know what kind of math that is. The only, the only, type, the only uh, proper word I could think of to describe that math is inflammatory. Um, inaccurate is probably another one, but I'd probably say inflammatory is, is the most. $5.2 million divided by 103 crowns is $50,485 per crown. So I don't know what you start with that you take 17% on top of, by the way, the 17% is over four years. So I don't know what number you start with that you, that you actually get $50,000 per crown. I just don't get that. I can't make that math work. and and. I believe that that 5.2 million, on one hand, it might have been a transposition error. Now remember, just think of yourself, you're, you're leaving the legislature after a very hard scrum, and uh, you have some instructions from the boss, to get something out there, damage control this, you're trying to type a press release out, and you bang out $5.2 million, because meanwhile, um, the costing information at the technical briefing just last week was 2.6 million. So I don't know, maybe the 2.6 was really, they meant to put 2.5 and they transposed it and got 5.2, but there's no way uh, that this government, I would love to hear a government member stand up and, and provide the math on that 5.2. It does not exist. It is a misrepresentation uh, of the facts. Um, so. Um, but that's what happens when you throw numbers around and you try to inflame one group of Nova Scotians against another group. That's how you do it. Uh, it's particularly if you're not that concerned with the reality of it and you're more concerned with the uh, theatrics of it. And that's what we're seeing here with this one. Now the press release goes on to say that the, this, the, 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 this is significantly higher than the wage pattern established in recently settled public sector agreements and much more than the government can afford. That's a, we've all heard that. How many times have we heard that talking point? But I go back to the, the situation, the, the fallacy that the, the 100 crowns can establish a pattern for, for 75,000 people. I go back to that and I say, it's just inconceivable. It's just inconceivable that 100 people would establish a pattern for, for 75,000. And, and, and furthermore, is, is it not just inconceivable, it's actually not possible. Um, because the salaries of our Crown attorneys are set with an eye for comparability to Crown attorneys in other provinces, similar provinces. And they are set, bearing in mind caseload, they are set, bearing in mind the types of cases uh, that, are, that the, the Crowns are working on. And in terms of the caseload, it's worth noting that our Nova Scotia Crown attorneys have one of the highest caseloads in the country. They are working 
on more cases than Crown attorneys in other provinces. There's no question about that. But over the last two decades, and the Premier says he's not going to let an arbitrator decide a wage pattern, um, which of course bears the question as to why he signed that he would. Um, but he says he was not going to let that happen. And, and I think it's worth, it's interesting to look at over the last two decades, there have been uh, four arbitration board hearings related to the Crown attorneys. There's been four, four times in the, last, in the last two decades. Sometimes history matters because in none of those previous arbitrations did it set a pattern that was followed by anyone else? Because it just doesn't work that way. It's just not the way the world, the world works. Um, it did not set a pattern any one of those times for any other civil servants, any other government department. And the reason it didn't set a pattern for any other group of, of people is that um, the reality is is that could only set a pattern for people that have comparable, similar situations. Perhaps similar education requirements, perhaps similar risk level to their job. It could be any number of things, but it would have to be similar. And the risk level is interesting because when you uh, think of the risk of Crown attorneys, I hope my colleague won't mind if I share what she shared with me. Um, my colleague uh, from Queen Shelburne, the other day I talked about the risk that Crown, att Crown attorneys, all, people always say to them, I'm gonna get you, or some sequence of that. And what Crown's related to me was that, look, they know they're dealing with dangerous uh, uh, perpetrators in many cases. If you have somebody you've just convicted of murder, that says they're going to murder you, you take it serious. And yes, they go away for a long time, but guess what happens? They get out. And that's why Crowns shared stories with me of being, you know, a little mindful and a little fearful when they're putting their dog out at night. And I, and I was told by a Crown that they're mindful of looking over the, the, the yard fence of somebody gonna shoot me over the fence. My colleague shared with me that um, a, a gentleman she knows was an RCMP officer, worked up north, who had that happen. Responded to a call of a young Crown attorney that had a knock on the door, opened the door, was shot point blank in the head. So when they talk about the risk and the concern, it is real. Uh, so, so for the Premier to say 100 people will set a pattern for 75 and completely disregard the requirements of the, of the different jobs, the education level, the risk factors. What it says to me, um, I don't hear honor when I talk like that. What I, what I hear is laziness. What I hear is a government that doesn't have the um, um, ambition to actually deal fairly with different groups of people. What I hear is laziness. We're going to pick one number, we're going to apply that to everyone because we're not really concerned about what they're doing, we're not concerned about how they're doing it, we're not concerned about their work environment, we are just lazy and we just want a number. And there's no honour in that. Um, so, so it's just not the case that a, that a small group like this, <clears throat> uh, that any settlement with the Crowns, just not the case that it sets a, it, that it would be uh, persuasive for the pattern of other, uh, other people. It, it just, it's just not the case. Uh, we would always be needing to look at what a job entails. That's what you, that's what you should look at. The background, the comparatives, um, that's, that's the case. So, so um, it, it's, it's not fair. And then, and then the, the Premier says that the Nova Scotia Crown, Attorney, current, uh, Crown Attorneys currently make up to uh, $149,149 uh, annually. And that's, that's the highest that's the highest in the, in the, in the province. And, and there's, an interesting, there's an interesting process that anyone could get through to the highest rate of, of pay for that. There's actually 18 pay bands. So anyone that's making at the high end has been a crown for 18 years. They earned it. They've earned it. 
And, and I think they would do the members in this chamber well to, to realize that. Um, there's a bunch of people. Um, I won't say earned, but there's a bunch of people in this chamber paid on that range. And it's not from 18 years of service, of dedicated public service dealing uh, with, with, with the situations that our Crown attorneys are dealing with. So, um, but let's put all that to the side. Let's put all that to the side um, and, and say that whatever they're paid, whatever they ask for, whatever the government offered, it's all irrelevant when it comes to an arbitrator who looks at the facts through their own lens and determines what is fair. And an independent art, uh, arbitrator has stated in previous reports um, that the appropriate comparable salary for our Crown attorneys is Manitoba, uh, where, where salaries are significantly higher for their Crown. So, I think what the Premier is saying, what he means to say when he says that he is fearful of the arbitration process, I think what he's saying is, is that he knows that uh, uh, many Nova Scotians are being treated unfairly and he doesn't want somebody to write that in a piece of paper. And what the Premier would be better off to do is to approach that with honour and say, we know that you are being paid less than other areas. Thank you for your public service. Can you help this province move forward? That would be an honourable approach. At the other end of a spectrum is a government that goes on the front of the paper and says, our doctors are greedy, our crowns are unreasonable. That's the two ends of the spectrum. And that's the real story here. I know the Premier wants the story to be about, about, about 17%, but this is a story of honour. And this is a story of a government that has lost its way, but found its talking points. And even today, uh, to hear uh, the government's talking points, people might assume Things are great. People might assume that this is a province that is on its way. This will never be a province that it's on its way when people cannot access health care. This will never be a province that is on its way when victims of crime can't find justice. This will never be a province that is on its way when people that perpetrate crimes like murder, rape, impaired driving are held accountable for their actions. <laughs> and there is one group of people in this province that goes to work every day to make sure that victims of crime have the hope that justice will be delivered. And there is one group of people that go to work every day so that the rest of us can have faith that those who commit crimes will be held accountable. And that group of people, it's in Nova Scotia, Crown attorneys, and they're only asking for one thing in return, Honour your word. Thank you, Madam Chair. I recognize, I recognize the Honourable Leader of the NDP. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. In Tuesday's uh, press conference here uh, downstairs held by the Association of Crown Attorneys, um, a number of things were said and a number of words were brought to the fore that I think uh, bear a serious consideration in this debate. Uh, one of these, a, a word that figured very prominently in the discourse um, of that press conference, was the word trust. I noted that Association 
President Perry Borden said very simply and straightforwardly this. I believe, Madam Chair, this is a, an exact quotation. He said, most importantly, we want to trust our employer. Now let's be clear about how that trust has been broken. In the last contract negotiation between the government and this association four years ago, a, I think by any standard, a relatively modest contract was accepted. And this made sense to those who agreed with that contract, um, in part because it was in the context of a long agreed framework under which it was understood by all parties to that framework that, that when the time of the expiry of that agreement came, when 2019 arrived, if at that time an agreement could not be uh, arrived at, the Crowns then would have recourse to the judgment of an arbitrator to settle such a possible dispute. That is to say, they had an eye towards the period of the expiry of the agreement being signed four years ago in a context in which they trusted their employer. But when 2019 came and when the place in those negotiations arrived where the mechanism of arbitration actually came into view, what happened rather was that legislation was immediately brought forward, uh, the legislation which is before this House now, to take away, to pull away the option of arbitration. This is, Madam Chair, egregious. It is morally below the standard. It is a, a violation of basic norms of what constitutes fair conduct. When people hear about it, uh, they're inclined to say in conversation, oh, can they do that? Well, the, the, an the answer is that they can do that, but normally governments don't. And the reason that normally governments don't do that uh, is that this kind of conduct evinces a disregard for decency and is corrosive of public institutions because it undermines that which in a democracy at all costs cannot be undermined, trust. This is exactly what is being referred to with, I think, clarity and, and precision uh, in the uh, piece in today's Chronicle Herald uh, that my uh, colleague, the leader of the Conservatives, has referred to earlier by Paul Schneiderite. I'm sorry. The progressive. Uh, uh, yes. Um, the, uh, uh, where, where the author, uh, and I'll table that, re refers to the actions of the government uh, with the Crown attorneys as what he calls a new low. Those are his words, a new low for this government. And, and why, he goes on to reason, does he see this, looking across the six-year history of the government as a new low? He writes, because by this action, this government has tacitly acknowledged its word means nothing. Now, trust is a thing of exceptional importance. Uh, it's core to success in relationships of all kinds. And, and Madam Chair, I, I just want to re reflect on the centrality of this subject that Mr. Borden placed at the centrality of the discourse of the press conference here a couple of days ago. Uh, th there, there is nothing that can work in the absence of trust. Business can't work in the absence of trust. I think about a, um, a business person who was a, a great old friend of mine, a man named Hugh Erskine. He'll be very familiar to my friends in the Progressive Conservative Party. His daughter, Tara Erskine, has a prominent position in their, in their party. Uh, uh, Hugh was, in many ways, the opposite of me. He was the, um, he was the owner of the largest sawmill uh, east of Quebec. It was in the Muscadabit Valley. Uh, about as virulently anti-union a person as you could ever meet. Uh, um, I was the minister in that uh, community's only church, uh, uh, an, an egalitarian, pro-union uh, social democrat. But Hugh and I, 
uh, worked together on a number of projects very, very closely. One project we worked together on was the building of a, a playground, the largest wooden playground it is, in fact, in Nova Scotia, uh, in that community. And the deal was that I would be responsible for getting the hundreds and hundreds of volunteers that would be needed for the construction, and Hugh, as the owner of the mill, uh, would put the finger on the mill's many suppliers. This was back in the, it's hard for us to imagine, this was back in the days of the big boom in Nova Scotia Lumber, coming out of the late 90s, uh, when there were a lot of companies from other places that made a lot of money out of our sawmill communities. And he knew that there were a number of those that owed the community. He said, you get the people, and I'll get the money. Now, this, this was a big project involving hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, and it wasn't easy. Uh, and there were many rough periods in it, and upper management in that mill uh, was not at all happy. Uh, that the mill's name was tied up with the building of this project uh, in the way it was, especially when it was going through difficult times. But Hugh and I had made an agreement at the beginning on the basis of a handshake in which we had looked in each other's eyes. We will commit ourselves to giving everything we can to see and that there's a recreational facility uh, here in this community for, this, for these people who don't have their kids uh, anything along these lines. And when the going got rough, Sometimes people would say in the community group, well, what happens if Hugh Erskine uh, bails on us? Because he's responsible for the whole financial end. The thing won't be always said. Nobody here has to worry about this. Because Hugh Erskine has given his word. Hugh and Erskine and I didn't agree on a blessed thing under the sun. But he was a, per he was a, a, a person uh, uh, whose word meant something. And therefore, uh, we could have a relationship that could come, uh, could build things, and could have a successful conclusion uh, in, in a way that is not, once you undermine trust, uh, none of that is possible. It's particularly true in business also. It's true, we, all of us, I think, learn this in various ways, the centrality of trust uh, in our line of work. Whatever that line of work is, I... I think back to one of the first jobs I had. I, uh, I worked when I was younger for a while, Madam Chair, um, in an underground gypsum mine in Ontario. We don't have underground gypsum mines in the Maritimes. All our gypsum mines are quarries. But in other parts of the country, they have underground gypsum mines. And in an underground gypsum mine, I had a job as a trimmer. Now, just let me, I want to explain what a trimmer does. Um, the trimmer is, is at the place where all the loads come out from the face and the, the, the cars of the trip are, are, are loaded and pulled out, out of the mine. But the trimmer has the responsibility. Every one of those pieces of equipment, uh, the loader, uh, the driller, and so on, is on a cable that comes into a box where that trimmer is. And if there should be problems with that equipment way out at the face somewhere, um, the power switch kicks off uh, to, to that box. And the only person there is the trimmer. And now, the thing is that the, the person operating that equipment way off up at the face uh, then fixes the cord while the power is off and then walks out to where they can see the trimmer and gives a certain signal with their headlight. Now, I couldn't imagine, I would think I was 18 or 19 at the time, uh, what would happen if I, as the trimmer, to flip that switch at the wrong time when that person's working on that, on that equipment? But I quickly came to realize, working in a mine, uh, that there's a relationship between the people on that crew that that would be absolutely unthinkable for anybody ever in that situation. That those, those, those who work underground forge a kind of, of, of a bond in which it is possible to have that kind of trust. This is legendary, of course, uh, in the world of, of coal mining in Nova Scotia. I think about... Um, uh, Donald McDonald from Reserve Mines, uh, one of the great trade unionists of Nova Scotia history who was president of the UMW for many, many years uh, in Alberta. And he used to tell about uh, how he, he was, he, when he grew up, out of the great strikes in 23 and 25 uh, that the member for Cape Breton Centre was talking about earlier, like many young Cape Breton coal miners, he, he went out west. And like many uh, uh, Cape Bretoners at that time, a lot, uh, he was fluent in Gaelic. He should, used to be very handy, said, because you could be uh, meeting people there uh, and working in the mine, and uh, uh, somebody from home could walk along, and, and uh, they would know that the person you were talking to was not a trustworthy person. Order, order. Yes. I'd like the chamber noise to lower, please. I recognize the honourable member for Halifax-Shabucto.
I, would, I, want, I just wanted to conclude this by saying thank you, Madam Chair, that, the, uh, that someone from home who, who could speak Gaelic would come along behind a person that he would be speaking to uh, that was actually not a trustworthy person, but he was a newcomer out there in Drumheller. He didn't know that. And the person would say in Gaelic, I can't give the exact translation, but he would say, the beep is no good in Gaelic. Uh, and then you would know and be able to continue your relationship on that basis. In other words, the other miner, the other person from home, from home would get the word to the person who would just go and say, that is a person who can't be trusted. Everything hangs uh, in work, in life, in business, on being able to be trusted. It's certainly the case. Uh, I'm sure it must be the case in the vocation of everybody uh, who is going to vote on this bill. It's certainly the case in, in my vocation, the ministry. Uh, I'm sure that the member from Colchester, Muscadabra Valley will, will vote for the truth of this, that in, in my vocation, uh, there are uh, um, there are, people are very forgiving of a lot of things uh, if you're not very good at doing them. If you're not a very good administrator, people don't really will throw you out for that. Uh, if you're not the world's best pastoral visitor, people will overlook that. Maybe you're not the greatest preacher that ever lived. They will overlook that too. But Mr. Man, if you should ever betray a trust, if it should ever get around the community that somebody told that minister something in confidence and that then they went and blabbed it around to this one and that one, or, uh, well, it's, it's all over for the minister uh, in, that, in that particular community because everything in that sense, everything hangs on trust. So I, I can think of myself, I, I think there are, there are people I, I know uh, who if they walked in here this afternoon and said, uh, I don't have time to explain this to you, but it's very important right now that you walk down the hill and jump in the harbor. I will walk down the hill and jump in the harbor that quick. There are other people I know that if they came in here and they said uh, some wonderful compliment to me and gave me a beautiful gift, I will say, uh oh, this is trouble. Uh, uh, because, I, because I know there are people that can't be trusted. I think about uh, the very common uh, bonding exercises that's uh, often used in, uh, in corporate and, and other kinds of uh, trainings. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the trust uh, exercise where a person is uh, placed up on a slight rise and then uh, urged to fall backwards into the hands of uh, people who will hold them up. I used to, uh, I used to do this in churches uh, in order to demonstrate the concept of trust to children. I had three friends, uh, their names are uh, uh, Ralph Higgins, Alan Redden, and Daryl Harnish. They're, they're a, a trucker, a, a farmer, and a, and a woods contractor. And uh, I, I absolutely trust either of the three of them. And I would stand up at the front of the church as I was talking about trust of the kids and say, I trust these people, I'm gonna turn my back to them, and on a count of three, I'm gonna fall into their hands. And one, two, three, and over I would go and they would grab me. Because I knew, I would say to the kids, there's not enough money in Canada to pay those three men that they would let me drop because I, because I, because I, could, I can trust them. So uh, labor relations, like business, um, like uh, relations in, in, in many, many different fronts, uh, depends, uh, is, uh, is founded on the element of trust. So when Perry Borden says... We are not able to. We want to be able to trust our employer. He's referring to the fact that something very serious has happened. Something very out of the way has been done. Uh, this unlikely tableau we see around the province house today of, of Crown attorneys uh, picketing at the legislature of the province uh, together with their colleagues from legal aid and from the Department of Justice and from other unions around the province. Uh, this, this tableau is before us because the government has conducted itself in a way that evinces a disrespect for decency and has destroyed the core element of a public institution, the element of trust. So we all know how it's going to go. We're going to have a debate on the Committee of the Whole, and then we're going to have third reading. Uh, and at the end of it, because the government has a majority, the government will be able to uh, make this part of the law of Nova Scotia. But what I want to say about this this afternoon, Madam Chair, is that the government in so doing will have paid too high a price. They will have paid the price that the powerful often pay in folly the price of the accomplishment of an objective at the expense of being no longer looked upon as those whom you can trust. So that's a key word 
that was in that uh, discourse here at the press conference uh, a couple of days ago, I want to mention a second key word that featured very prominently there. That was the word justice. Perry Borden said, as prosecutors, we are standing up to injustice, and that is exactly what we are doing. We are to stand up to justice, and that is injustice, and that is exactly what we are doing. Now, the word justice is being used here, of course, in a broader sense than it's usually used just when people are talking about criminal justice. It's being used in that wider sense in which it brings into view the, the whole idea of fairness. Um, so this is the wider sense of the word uh, that people are using uh, when they talk about different forms of justice like social justice or economic justice or environmental justice or racial justice or justice for women or justice for uh, LGBTQ plus populations. Um, I want to suggest and I think it is relevant to this uh, debate, that there is also such a thing uh, as regional justice. And this has to do with the question of remuneration packages and the um, uh, reasonability of them being based on national comparators. Now, regional justice, geographic justice, means that someone in Nova Scotia is as deserving of an income is as deserving of remunerative consideration as someone in Ontario or somewhere anywhere else in Canada. It is not a just thing in this sense that we in Nova Scotia have the lowest median income in the country. It's not a, a just thing that uh, we have the worst child poverty in the country. It's not a just thing that we have the fastest raising rate of food bank use in the entire country. Now, regional justice uh, means uh, that in this current case, that the salaries of Crown attorneys in Nova Scotia very well ought to be able to be calculated and derived and, and based on a negotiation that takes a national comparator into consideration. This is absolutely fair. And I want to submit that it is a sorry situation for us to have a, a government so ill-attuned to the necessity for regional justice that it routinely, in this case, speaks about uh, the demand for a national comparator on the Crown's part as something that ought not even to be on a table, something beyond the pale, something that is uh, beyond the, the realm of any kind of reasonable consideration. And let me say too, Madam Chair, what in this situation is not happening here? What is not happening here is that the Premier is not coming to the crowns of the province and saying, I believe that a national comparator is inapplicable in salaries in Nova Scotia, and I believe this so much that I will lower my own salary so as to be below the national average as I am asking those in the civil service to be. That is a sentence that has not been pronounced. What is happening, rather, is that a premier whose salary is markedly above the national average is saying not just to crowns, not just to the public sector, but to the people of Nova Scotia, you are not worthy of a comparator. You are not worthy of an income based on a national consideration. You are not worthy of an income uh, to be measured as we would measure incomes with people elsewhere in our country. I believe that the Crown prosecutors of Nova Scotia are absolutely right to stand up to this injustice. And there is a, a third uh, word uh, that, which has figured very prominently in uh, uh, the discussion uh, in this debate, which I want to bring forward as well this afternoon. Uh, and that, that is the, the word uh, cynical. Now, I know, Madam Chair, that our speaker has uh, expressed concern about this word in, in this debate. And so I want to uh, give you every assurance that I, I, there, are, there are a number of meanings of this word, and I am not using the word in the sense of invective or insult. Uh, I'm using it rather in the, in the precise sense uh, that it, it means uh, that which is 
unscrupulous in its manipulation towards its own purpose. And I think this was well reflected uh, in something that was said uh, by one of the Crown attorneys who was here the, the day before yesterday. Um, I'm uh, afraid I didn't get the person's name, uh, but who said to me with um, a, a real sincerity that registered itself on me, just this, it's not about the money, it's just that it's so cynical. Now, I, I think that what's being said here is something very precise. Now, the Premier likes to speak about uh, his concerns about a, a pattern. And I also have a concern about a pattern. Uh, and, and it's a pattern we see um, in the attitude which has been taken to a range of these kinds of contract disputes. It is a, a pattern of systematic denigration of the characters of those towards whom the government finds themselves in an adversarial position. I, I think back uh, a couple of years to the time of the disputes, uh, the ne negotiations, the strike and the legislation uh, with teachers. At that time, uh, over and over, Every day, I would hear uh, ministers of the government and I would hear the Premier um, cast very negative uh, aspersions on the integrity of members of that profession. They would, they would cast aspersions on their work ethic. They would uh, speak in, in negative ways about their sick time, about their vacation. And as I would hear this in the chamber and I would hear it then reflected in interviews with the media, I, I would think to myself, why in the world would a government speak that way and allow its discourse to be dominated with this kind of uh, collective character assassination with a group to, with whom they, they ought to be trying to come uh, for, to, a, to, an, to establish an agreement? But then as it went on, and this happened day after day and week after week, I saw what I now think was the crude and cynical calculus behind this communication strategy. It was a, a political calculus a political calculation by which, in a province with the lowest income in the country, the government was in fact attempting to curry public political favor by counterposing themselves to those who have good jobs and benefits and pensions. I think this is the dictionary's definition of cynical in this sense. Something very, ha very similar happened uh, along these lines not very long ago with doctors in the context of the contract dispute between the government and doctors in Nova Scotia. Over and over, day after day, here in the chamber, out with interviews with the media, uh, I would hear members of the government, would hear the Premier speak very negatively about uh, bringing into question the, the altruism, uh, the, the, uh, the, the motivation of members of the medical profession. And, why, I would think to myself, why would that be your, your approach to communications in a province where attracting doctors is so very important and in a profession where we know the whole thing of recruitment works by informal uh, word of mouth, why in the world uh, would the government do that? Uh, but then I, I saw the, the crude and manipulative calculus again, that in a province with the lowest income in the country, we saw the manipulation there of public favor uh, towards the, government's, uh, the government as they attempted to do it by the government's counter-positioning of themselves uh, to those with uh, good incomes and good pensions and good benefits and good jobs. And here this week we are again. No matter what question is asked, the Premier answers on this uh, matter that's before us now, 17%, 17%, 17%, 17%, as though to cast the Crown attorneys in the light of greed. Uh, uh, and, and this, uh, uh, then again today, er, and we, we hear the same in the Minister of Justice's discourse, to speak of uh, the Crown attorneys uh, uh, as, as people uh, uh, for whom there is some absence of uh, altruistic uh, professionalism, character, uh, and motivation. Um, Mr. Speaker, the government, uh, sorry, Madam Chair, the, 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 the government here is, uh, uh, for another time, it is returning to this well. But I, I want to submit that in my view, this is a well that is running dry. People have a hunger for a government that has character, not cynicism. There is a, a hunger for a government 
about whom people can say whether or not they agree with them, those are people of stature. Those are people who I trust. Uh, those are people whose word is dependable. Those are people who in their fundamental nature are people with a regard for truth. Uh, they wish to have that, not a government which evinces a disregard for decency in its conduct. They want a, a government that embodies justice in its broader sense, uh, not callous, selfish, manipulative calculation. Crown attorneys have this right, um, and so do the people of Nova Scotia. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I would like to say a few words on Clause 1 of this Act. Uh, I recognize that it is the short title, uh, so I will confine my remarks at this moment to the short title, uh, which reads, The Act may be cited as the Crown Attorney's Labour Relation Act. Uh, now, we've heard a lot from both of the opposition leaders in general about all of the reasons that we oppose this bill. I think we will continue to hear more as the uh, afternoon wears on. Um, but I will confine my remarks to, to this Crown Attorneys Labour Relations Act, uh, Madam Chair, and I will ask, as I did before, uh, is this, Madam Chair, a Labour Relations Act? This act was brought uh, to the floor of this House by the Minister of uh, Finance. Uh, we were told, and the Premier has tried to hammer home the point in here and in the media, that this is a finance bill. Uh, but, Madam Chair, I am confused why a bill with the title Crown Attorneys Labour Relations Act would, in anyone's estimation, be a bill that properly fits under finance and treasury. Uh, although, uh, Madam Chair, it, it is somewhat true, I guess, uh, that it is being framed as a finance act, uh, but in the way uh, that my colleague just referenced, uh, the leader of our party, that we have heard in this chamber for the last few days something that sounds like 17%, 17%, 17%. Uh, what we have heard from the Crown and what we have been hesitant to bring forward in this chamber, Madam Chair, because of course it is not common to negotiate collective agreements mm. on the floor of mm -hmm. the legislature. Mm -hmm. In general, collective agreements are bargained in confidential rooms mm -hmm. at tables with specific representatives. But as long as we're talking about it, I think that the rejoinder to 17%, 17%, 17% would be legislation, legislation, legislation. Mm -hmm. Those crowns walked into that room and they didn't have a chance, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. They have a right to arbitration. We have talked about how that right came about. We will continue to talk about it as we move through this bill. But Madam Chair, they never had the chance. They never had the chance to avail themselves in that clause of their agreement that was signed by this Premier. And so the idea that this Crown Attorney's Labour Relations Act is anything other than an attempt to gut the collective bargaining rights of the Crown Attorneys in the Public Prosecution Service of Nova Scotia is simply misleading. Mm -hmm. so I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, Madam Chair. Nova Scotians do not expect a government to be perfect. But Nova Scotians expect the government to demonstrate competencies when it comes to some key areas of governance. And in our modern democratic society, a key area of governance is labour negotiations. We've seen in the last century, Madam Chair, uh, we've seen uh, in, a, in a very positive way the growth of labour unions that contributed enormously to the, the development of the middle class. And by extension, governments for decades have bargained in good faith a process over those decades of collective bargaining was formalized so much so that in 1982, the right to freedom of association contained in Section 2D of the Charter allows for the, the right to collective bargaining. 
Now, I don't know what history lesson this government missed, but when you bring forward a piece of legislation, that piece of legislation, Madam Chair, needs to be within the confines of the Charter of Rights. And if it's not, that, that bill is ultra vires. That bill is outside the realm of the mandated authority. And the mandated authority within Canada is the Canada Act of 1982, which we often refer to as uh, the Charter of Rights. Now, Madam Chair, yesterday when I spoke with a number of the crowns outside of this chamber, and we can hear them outside right now, and rightly so, they're being very vocal, their collective rights, their rights to collective bargaining are being trampled on. One of the crowns said to me, the actions of this government is repugnant. Now stop and think. How do you want to be remembered? Do you want to be remembered as your actions being repugnant? Now I've been thinking about that, Madam Chair. On so many levels, I hope that comment, I hope it cuts. Because on the moral plane, it's saying behavior is unacceptable. Within the legal realm, what they're saying is the bill is unacceptable to the Constitution. That's why. That's why the member for Kings North and the member for Dartmouth North and Dartmouth South at law amendments said refer this back to the Justice Department for further consultation. Do your homework. Let's get it in writing the constitutionality of this. To proceed any further with Bill 203, I believe, is a misuse of legislative authority. Because we've had at law amendments one of the leading constitutional experts in this country come forward, Paul Cavaluzzo, who said very clearly in his expertise opinion that Bill 203 is unconstitutional, that Bill 203 is an unlawful action. I would hope the government would press pause. I would hope the government would slam on the brakes and say, you know what? Let's refer this back to the department. Let's get Justice Department officials to put on paper an interpretation. But they choose not to. They choose to push ahead with this bill, which, Madam Chair, unfortunately is in line with past behavior of this government, whether it was Bill 1 with the nurses, Bill 100, Bill 148, Bill 75. You know, Madam Chair, I used to tell my students, past behavior predicts future behavior. And here we are, another bill before this House that I do not believe is in the public's interest, is not in the interest of Nova Scotians. My colleague from Colchester, Muscadabid, often says that the journey is just as important as the destination. Yes, I know the destination of this government. Your end goal is a balanced budget. I'm not going to argue against that. I'm a fiscal conservative, and I'm proud to say that. I believe we have to live within our means. But the manner in which, Madam Chair, you go to achieve those means is just as important as the end goal itself. So all I can do, Madam Chair, as a, as a member of this Honourable house, house is to try to appeal to the better angels of your nature. You've had a leading constitutional expert come to Nova Scotia to give his learned opinion. You've had, Madam Chair, you've had the Director of the Public Prosecution come to law amendments and clearly state that this bill will be a disaster for the Justice Department. You know, I recall, Madam Chair, during the film tax credit debacle, Nova Scotians asking the government, stop and think, stop and think about the impact of this. And you cannot deny the negative impact that that had on our film industry. You had an opportunity then to listen and, and change course. You chose not to. Here's another example where you can do that, to stop and think and show some humility, and listen to the constitutional expert 
that came to Nova Scotian. Listen to the Director of Public Prosecutions. Listen to those that are saying that Section 2D of the Charter, the right to freedom of association, the right to collective bargaining, is part of the social legal fabric of this country. The uh, member, the, the leader of the New Democratic Party talked about some, some very fundamental principles that are at stake. And he raised some very important points. Principles of honour, principles of integrity. And honour, Madam Chair, is accepted standards of conduct. And how we conduct ourselves is just as important in attaining the end goal. Your end goal, your end goal is a balanced budget. You've, you've, you've achieved that by, by, um, by controlling the wages in this province. But look at the manner in which you've done that. You've shattered the confidence of many people in this province in terms of how Nova Scotia does business. That's alarming. We know, Madam Chair, integrity is critical in any leadership position. And I know a great many of the people on the other side, of the members on the other side, have held leadership positions outside of government. And you know your word is your bond. You know that as soon as you lose your integrity, then your ability to exercise power and authority is dramatically reduced and in some cases completely neutralized. You have to follow through on your commitments. Your commitment was to binding arbitration. And Madam Chair, they choose, Order. they choose to. I ask that the member from Dartmouth East address the chair. You're Madam using, chair. you're speaking in the third person. I recognize the honorable member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, Madam Chair. And we have, we have a government, Madam Chair, that has, that has changed the rules of the game halfway, halfway through the game. I've always believed Nova Scotians and Canadians, and I know you believe it as well, have an enormous sense of fair play. It is a fundamental component, a fundamental component, Madam Chair, of, of what it means to be a Nova Scotian and a Canadian. So, Madam Chair, I have this, this idea that it's fundamental to protect, to, protect the, to protect the collective bargaining rights of Nova Scotians and Canadians. As I've said, we've had a leading constitutional expert at law amendments who is very vocal. He's clearly stated, Madam Chair, that Bill 203 is outside of the scope of the Constitution. I fear, Madam Chair, as this government proceeds through the legislative process to ram this bill through without putting the brakes on and sending it back to the Justice Department. I fear that they're going to relegate Nova Scotia, the government of Nova Scotia, to a charter challenge, which will have incalculable financial consequences on the public treasury. Madam Chair, Madam Chair, as I've, always, as, I, as I've always stated in this House, the, the rights of Nova Scotians, the rights of Canadians, have to be honoured. They have to be respected by government. And it's unfortunate we now have a bill before this House that I believe, and based on my understanding of constitutional experts like uh, Paul, uh, Paul Cavaluzzo, that this is a misuse of legislative authority, that which, which will eventually, Madam Chair, be, be determined, according to this constitutional expert, as unconstitutional. So why proceed? Why proceed? Madam Chair, this is a government that has time and time again demonstrated enormous difficulty in honouring its commitments. This is a government, Madam Chair, that is taking actions that are unacceptable. Or in the words of one Crown attorney yesterday, the actions of this government are repugnant. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
I recognize the Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I would just like to say a few words, as my colleague did on Clause 1. Mr. Spe uh, uh, Madam Chair, I think it's a misnomer. We're talking about uh, an anti-labour um, legislation. We're not, we're not talking about a finance and treasury bill. We are talking about a uh, piece of legislation that is crippling um, Crown Attorney's ability to strike. When we talk about, as my colleagues have said, 17%, 17%, 17%, um, that is not the real issue. And funny enough, I just said to my colleague, um, I was I, I got to drive here today because my car is in getting serviced. And um, the driver said, ooh, what's going on at Province House? I, I better not drop you off there. And I said, oh, no, please do. I want to be with the people who are striking. And the, he, and the gentleman said, oh, it's about 17%. And I said, no, in fact, you're wrong. It is not about 17%. It is about taking away workers' rights. And that, Madam Chair, is what this bill is about. It has nothing to do with 17% because there's nobody who's ever sat at a bargaining table that's gone in with 17% and walked away with 17%. Madam Chair, I would, I would, I would challenge anybody to provide me with that evidence that that's actually happened because it has not. If, if that was the case, I'd go in and ask for 25 or 30% every time if that's what happens. I mean, you know, let's, let's be... Frank, you know, you're going to ask for whatever it is you think you can get. But, Madam Chair, this bill is about crippling workers' rights. This bill is about nothing more than what's happened to teachers, what's happened to nurses, what's happened to doctors, what's happened to every public sector worker in this province. And, Madam Chair, it's, it's, it's sad when this government tries to portray it as something else. Because we know on this side of the house that, you know, let's call a spade a spade. It's not about 17%. We need to talk about the real issues. Since this government has been in power, this government has tried, or not has tried, has successfully to date crippled unions and their bargaining rights. Uh, to be clear, I. I because the uh, essential service agreement with uh, health authorities has taken in excess of eight months, and that's just for one. The, health, the, the essential services agreements still aren't finished for the health authorities, but this government professes to bring in legislation that's going to get an essential service agreement within 20 days. Madam Chair, what that tells me is that the government is going to say we want this, it's going to go to the Labour Board and it will come back exactly as the government wishes because there is no, if you can't sit at a bargaining table and negotiate a fair and free collective agreement, there's no way you're going to sit and negotiate a fair essential services agreement. And Madam Chair, we are taking away the fundamental rights of Nova Scotians and I don't know for the life of me, how anybody in this house think that, thinks that that's okay. I recognize the Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Thank you, Madam Chair. The proposed legislation is a non-starter. Regardless of what it says, essential services essentially trumps the right to strike. We've seen over the past two days cases being dismissed our, but our legal system is predicated on Crown attorneys being in court doing their job. These last two days are not a step they have taken lightly. Like doctors in the CBR, CBRM withdrawing their services for admitting patients and doing rounds, something that also runs contrary to service above self, it's not a choice, it's a calling for these attorneys. And to take these steps to actually strike, it comes down to prince, an issue of principle, respect and fairness. The government made an agreement with the Crown Attorneys just three short years ago. An agreement is an agreement. You stand by your word regardless of the situation, but especially when it becomes inconvenient. No other organization, company or person can simply change the rules via legislation because it has become inconvenient. The Crown Attorneys themselves were created as a result of the Donald Marshall inquiry and the recommendations that stated the need to have an independent Crown Attorney, Crown Attorneys. The justice system must be independent. It must both appear and be independent from government. 
And I can't help but see in this legislation and in the government's actions similarities to their counterparts in Ottawa and the SNC-Lavalin affair, a government that doesn't like current legislation, so they introduce legislation and attempt to get the political outcome that they desire. Our Crown attorneys are being singled out solely for political, not budgetary gain. Governing is about mediation, about listening to the people, about working with the people. An inherent part of this relationship is trust. People may not like a government's decision or position on things, but if the reasons are explained, if backup information is provided to support these decisions, people will agree to disagree, but at least they will have some level of respect. But trust is the key. A government must keep its word, especially when it comes to what's put down on paper and signed. How can any future organizations, companies, associations, or groups enter in negotiations without that voice in the back of their head saying the government may change the rules in the middle of the game? <coughs> the Charter of Rights provides for the collective bargaining rights of employees. It's a fundamental constitutional right. I believe that Bill 203 will eventually be found to be an unlawful bill. What's worse, in the middle of negotiations, the government went and introduced this legislation before they even went to arbitration. This bill will have a permanent effect and a long-term impact on our justice system, I fear. We will see Crown attorneys leaving the system. The talent will decline. Cases will be lost and there will be more appeals, and that will cost more. I wonder, Madam Chair, we are currently in day two of this situation. How many more cases will be dismissed? How much more resources will have been spent and wasted because of this? The government is securing private attorneys to do Crown work. What will be the final cost of this whole mess financially? But more importantly, what will the damage be to the integrity of the future of government, of government negotiations? This perfectly illustrates why people are cynical of government and don't trust. The government continues to stress that the attorneys wanted 17 percent. Well, as everyone that's ever gone into negotiations, there's a starting point of both sides. If the government's, if the province stated that 4 percent was the starting point, and the 17 percent that the Crown wanted, well, then the middle ground would be somewhere in the 10 percent range. Crown attorneys have told me that in arbitration, it wouldn't have even hit 9 percent. So here we are. At the end of the day, once government passes this legislation and this 7 percent is approved through the Labour Board and what have you, you will still have the cost of the independent private lawyers that have been secured but you'll also have the damage done to the relationship with Crown attorneys, to victims, and the system. The Crown attorneys are lawyers. Lawyers litigate, lawyers negotiate, and lawyers settle. Above all else, lawyers follow the law, and they just want to do, they want to do just that. They want to arbitrate. Thank you, Madam Chair. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I'm going to also speak uh, just briefly on Clause 1 of, um, of this Act, and um, Crown Attorneys Labour Relations Act. Um, I think uh, what I am finding particularly uh, egregious about this Act is um, how it has really uh, cast um, cast the government as as disrespecting not not only crown prosecutors but also uh, institutions uh, on which our province uh, re has has relied for decades, um, and and in that I'm particularly referring to two different uh, two different offices. One is the whole organization of an independent public prosecution service. That was, um, we didn't, we, we have inherited a public pros prosecution service that, that is independent and is functioning and has had these mechanisms of arriving at uh, sort of an arm's length determination of, of you know, fair, uh, fair wages for Crown prosecutors, not 
not um, without great work and struggle and disagreement and and coming together of minds um, in the past and and for the for this government to choose to really um, denigrate and 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 cast away the value of that work um, that is that has been that has been done over decades to me is really the height of irresponsibility because this government will not be the government of Nova Scotia for forever. And and you know, as as uh, my colleague, uh, the leader of of um, the NDP spoke, you know, trust trust is something that went once lost is rebuilt with such difficulty, and the same is true for institutions. And in this case, the institutional the institution of the independent public prosecution service, I believe, is in jeopardy, because in the end. Uh, you know, agreements are not just about the agreement on a wage pattern for the next four years. Agreements are ag agreements about how we work together, how we arrive um, at, at accord when people have legitimately, people have and parties have legitimately different interests. But in the end, we, in, in this case, both the government and the public prosecution service also ought to have and inherently must have a shared interest, which is an interest in the, uh, the safety and the security of Nova Scotians and the interest um, of, that, of ensuring that justice is served. And and to me, that is, I think, why this uh, particular round of, um, of this government's repeated re pattern of behavior, of, of uh, disrespecting collective bargaining, is, if possible, e cut, cutting even deeper. Mm -hmm. Because justice is so fundamental to providing justice, ensuring justice, defending justice is so core to the function of government. Thank you. I recognize the honourable member for Kings North. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, uh, uh, I'm pleased to be able to take, say a few words on Bill 203. It, it is a little bit of deja vu for me. I remember well when we were in this House a few years ago discussing the film tax credit. The government had entered into an agreement to extend the film tax credit for five years and, and just a year later had uh, totally changed that agreement and, and stripped the film tax credit. Uh, it's interesting though the differences. That was an agreement to uh, fund an industry. <clears throat> this is... Uh, and uh, certainly filmmakers are important to our province, but this is something that delves into the fundamental charter rights of a, a group, the Crown Attorneys, who are extraordinarily important to the process of justice in our province. And uh, this is uh, getting into, uh, into the integrity of the government in dealing with this important group. And um, I, was, um, I think about the value of keeping your word. And the, wor the world that I come from, the world of farming, um, really, there's millions and millions of dollars worth of business done each year in this province really on just word. Yes, I will do that. No, I won't do that. I will supply, you know, in my case, a load of cabbage uh, uh, for, uh, and I know you guys, I didn't mean to get into cabbage, but, it, you know, you agree to do something for a certain price and you do it and you keep your word. And the reason you do that is... Madam Chair, is you don't really have the opportunity to break your word a second time with someone. That your integrity uh, in that world matters. And uh, the most important thing is the trust between buyer and seller. 
the trust between neighbour. And, and here we have a situation where the government, for their own, uh, their own Crown attorneys, is breaking that trust. And uh, I was very taken in uh, law amendments to hear Paul Cavaluso speak, and, and I didn't really know who he was when he spoke, but in fact, you may, be, you may be surprised to know that he's a recipient of the Order of Ontario. He was, he's a recipient of the Order of Canada. He's a four-time lawyer of the year in Ontario for various factors of his law practice. He served on the commission that went into the Mayor, Mayor Ahar uh, uh, situation, and he served with, for Walkerton. And it was his opinion that this is a, uh, clearly an unconstitutional bill. Uh, this is one of the leading lawyers in Canada on this situation. He said the charter requires the government to consult in, in negotiations, and in this case, it didn't even notify. The Crown attorneys didn't even know this bill was coming in until it was actually brought in. Um, he's, and he stated, which my colleague uh, from Dartmouth stated, that Canadians have an expectation of fair play, and in, in his opinion, this didn't even come to the standard of fair play. Uh, in terms of the settlement, I mean, in 2015, the Crown attorneys agreed to a four-year deal of increases of 0, 0, 1, and 1.5. And, and now they were going, and part of the agreement for that was a 30, the reason they agreed to that was a 30-year commitment to go to arbitration if they didn't agree. So they were going to arbitration. So that was part of the agreement. So the Crown attorneys agreed to those very low numbers in exchange for the right to go to arbitration after four years, and here we are. So the government had that agreement, this government had that agreement, and now has failed to live up to it. And uh, as I said, in my world, we, you keep your commitments. And uh, I, I, there's a lot of respect for the Crown, and what I fear is, and I, I fear it's uh, that it is a cynical uh, sort of calculation on the part of the government that what is said in the bubble of this house really doesn't filter out to the general public. What they hear is just a few talking points and really maybe don't understand what is happening here. But Crown attorneys are extraordinarily important to the functioning of, of our society. We all expect justice and what this bill is giving the Crown attorneys is the right to strike. And while that may sound like a wonderful thing, okay, they can strike, there's only about a hundred of them and which one of those Crown attorneys is not essential? And which case do you want thrown out? And we've already seen cases thrown out. And to their credit, the Crown attorneys have, even in this strike, have agreed to not, uh, not see uh, cases of sexual assault or cases of murder uh, unrepresented. So even in this strike, they are still working. And uh, uh, I, so here we are. I mean, this is the situation we're in. And I'm just very disappointed to be speaking to this issue today. Of, uh, of this Bill 203, which guts the uh, previous agreement this government made, gives the uh, Crown attorneys essentially what is a meaningless right to strike. And uh, one of the things that one of the other presenters to uh, law amendments, again, another well-known lawyer who maybe I didn't really realize who he was, but was a uh, uh, Ray Larkin, uh, one of the best uh, lawyers in Canada in 2016. And again in 2019, rated one of the best lawyers in Canada, a, a fellow of the American College of Trial Lawyers since 2009. So a very well respected lawyer on the issue of the right to strike said with the Essential Health, uh, with the Essential Health and Community Services Act, there was a provision that if, uh, if a group of uh, health care professionals was considered so essential that not even one of them could be missing, there was a provision that it would go back to arbitration. This wasn't even put into this bill, uh, this sort of provision. And in fact, I would argue, and, and, and Ray Larkin argued, and I, Paul Cavaluzzo argued that every single one of these lawyers is essential. So, and there's, and there's really not that many of them. They hear thousands of cases a year. I asked one, one uh, Crown attorney outside, how many cases did you hear last year? And, uh, the, and that Crown attorney said she was involved in some 2,000 cases in one year in one way or another. So uh, uh, every one of these uh, Crown attorneys is essential, so giving them the right to strike uh, pending an essential services agreement is really essentially meaningless. Uh, breaking the government's word is uh, 
uh, in such a way that, uh, and that these leading constitutional lawyers have said is clearly unconstitutional is going to result in uh, uh, protracted uh, uh, law, uh, protected law court uh, action on this. So, uh, very disappointed to be at this situation uh, with this Bill 203, and I just wanted to express that. Thank you. Shell Clause 1 carried. We've been asked to have a recorded vote. Um, how long do you want the bells to ring? Till the whips are satisfied. We will recess until then.
Are the whips satisfied? Then we will. We will now proceed with the with the recorded vote. We are voting on Shell Clause 1 carry. I ask that all members remain perfectly quiet during the vote, and all members shall stand and clearly indicate yea or nay when their name has been called. The Clerk. Mr. Churchill. Aye. Mr. Fury. Yes. Ms. Regan. Yes. Mr. McClellan. Yes. Mr. McNeil. Ms. Casey. Yes. Mr. Wilson. Yes. Mr. Delory. Yes. Mr. Caldwell. Yes. Mr. Glavine. Yes. Mr. Kasoulis. Yes. Ms. Miller. Yes. Mr. Porter. Yes. Mr. Hines. Yes. Ms. Metledge Diab. We. Oui. Mr. Ince. Yes. Ms. Rankin. Yes. Mr. Rankin, sorry. Mr. Mombriquet. Yes. Ms. Arab. Yes. Mr. Horn. Yes. Mr. Jessam. Yes. Mr. McKay. Yes. Mr. McGuire. Yes. Ms. Di Constanzo. Yes. Mr. Irving. Yes. Mr. Dunn. No. Mr. Bain. No. Ms. Masland. No. Ms. McFarlane. No. Mr. Houston. No. Mr. McMaster. No. Ms. Chender. No. Mr. Burrell. No. Ms. Roberts. No. Ms. LeBlanc. No. Ms. Martin. No. Ms. Adams. Mr. Lohr. No. Mr. Hallman. No. Mr. Rushton. No. Mr. Craig. No. Ms. Smith McCrossan. No. Mr. Johns. Mr. Comer. No. Monsieur Leblanc. No. Mr. Ryan. No. Mr. Harrison. No. Ms. Pond. The clerk. Those in favor of the motion, 24. Those against, 20. The clause is carried. Shall clause 2 carry? I recognize the honourable member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like Excuse to. Excuse me. Before you speak, I must remind members to speak only to the clause that we are addressing at the time. The honourable member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the reminder, uh, though I believe my remarks thus far have been uh, relevant to the specific clause and will continue to be. Uh, the purpose of this act, according to Clause 2, uh, one of the most misleading clauses in this piece of legislation, is to A, be consistent with the duty of the government to pursue its policy objectives in accordance with the principles of responsible fiscal management prescribed under the Finance Act, B, protect the sustainability of public services. C, respect employees' right to a meaningful collective bargaining process with their employer, including the right to strike as guaranteed by paragraph 2D of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And D, align the employment agreement and 2012 to 2046 framework agreement of the Crown Attorneys with the employment and framework agreements of other lawyers in the employee of government. Well, Madam Chair, um, it's difficult to read that uh, with a straight face all the way through, um, but, but here I've done it. Um, I guess I'll start by quoting from Ray Larkin's uh, presentation to Law Amendments uh, Committee. Uh, we've spoken already during this debate about Ray Larkin. He's Queen's Counsel. He's a very well-respected labour lawyer, and he also uh, 
shared with the committee that he in fact sat on the board uh, that decided the Crown Attorney's pay uh, twice previously. Uh, he's very familiar with this process. And what he said about this bill in his submission, Madam Chair, was the absurd premise of Bill Number 203 is the foundation of the fundamental contradiction at the heart of the scheme created by Bill Number 203. And essentially that is that it does none of the things that Section 2 purports to do. Section A uh, talks about the government pursuing its policy objectives in accordance with the principles of responsible fiscal management prescribed under the Finance Act. Uh, what, does, what does that mean, Madam Chair? Uh, sound fiscal management. Uh, you know, I think to, to those of us in our caucus, sound fiscal management does not mean piling up the docket of the Supreme Court of Canada with legislation uh, that will certainly, undoubtedly, be challenged as unconstitutional. Madam Chair, we heard from expert after expert who said that there is no way, there is no way that this legislation could be considered constitutional. The Premier refuses to tell us whether the, this bill in fact complies with Section 2D of the Charter. It says it in this clause that this act complies with Section 2D of the Charter, but when pressed, the Premier will not say whether he got an opinion to that effect. That's mystifying, Madam Chair, and it should cast uh, quite a doubt on what the actual operation of this bill is. In Section B, this Premier, this government, this bill talks about protecting the sustainability of public services. And again, I think we have a uh, a semantic issue here, Madam Chair, about the meaning of the word sustainability. If we assume that the sustainability of public services means that they continue to operate, then it's not clear that denying them their collective bargaining rights is going to do that. If we assume that sustainability means that the government won't be slapped with a several hundred million dollar judgment from the Supreme Court years down the road, then I'm also unclear about how the purpose of this act is to protect the sustainability of the public services, because surely, Madam Chair, that would impact the ability to pay for the good work of the public service. In, sec in uh, subsection C, respecting the employee's right to a meaningful collective bargaining process with their employer, including the right to strike, as guaranteed by paragraph 2D of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. I think it was uh, Mr. Cavaluzzo who said to us during law amendments that no one that could spell the word charter would think that this bill complied with the charter. So again, I think it's misleading uh, that this bill would set out as its purpose to guarantee the charter rights of this group of lawyers, Madam Chair, of people who have read the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, of people who understand what those rights mean, who studied them in law school, who apply them every single day as a part of their jobs. This bill, uh, Madam Chair, is not charter compliant, as we just said. We've received no proof that it is charter compliant. Um, when asked uh, about the litany of legal expertise that has come forward to say unequivocally that this bill, contrary to this purpose, is not compliant with the charter, the Premier simply says he disagrees. I wonder, Madam Chair, if any of the Crown attorneys following the passage of this bill would be able to use that kind of argument in court. I don't think so. In Section D, this 
bill purports as its purpose to align this agreement with the employment and framework agreements of other lawyers in the employ of government. But Madam Chair, that is not how it works. Crown attorneys are not other lawyers. Other lawyers could probably figure out an essential services agreement that might possibly <clears throat> allow them to go out on the picket line without our entire justice system falling apart. This group of attorneys cannot do that. We're seeing that they cannot do that now, and I think um, with great trepidation and discomfort, we hear the Crown attorneys outside showing us that that is the case. <clears throat> Ray Larkin, again, came forward at Law Amendments to say that in the last two panels where they set compensation for this group of government lawyers, they did so not against other government lawyers, not against other public servants, but with reference to their counterparts in similar jurisdictions across the country. And Madam Chair, the co comparison to doctors has been raised several times, and it is very apt. And this has nothing to do with the law, but Madam Chair, the idea that we are bringing this into alignment with the framework agreements of other lawyers in the employ of government. Well, the government might have a different definition of what that kind of alignment is, but Madam Chair, if that alignment is fundamentally different than it has been in the past, and again, the way that is operated in the past is that salary is set with relationship to comparables. The amount that the Crown attorneys are asking for is completely consistent with what their colleagues in similar sized jurisdictions in different parts of the country make. If we change the way that we interpret what that alignment is, what we will do is we will lose our Crown attorneys, Madam Chair. We will lose them. They will go to other jurisdictions where they will make twice the starting salary, and just like we had with our doctors, we will have a labour force issue, and surely, Madam Chair, that kind of labour force issue is also about sustainability and the sustainability that is mentioned in this Act. So, in sum, the purpose of this Act, Madam Chair, is misleading. It does not do what it purports to do. It does almost the opposite of what it purports to do. And that is beyond unfortunate uh, and I think is, um, creates a great deal of cynicism to those watching this process. With that, I'll take this. I recognize the honorable member for Cape Breton Center. Thank you, Madam Chair. I too feel the need to rise to say a few things about um, Clause 2. So when we talk about fiscal management and the sustainability of public services, I know from experience and from talking to some of the Crown, um, the members that are outside, that going to an arbitrator means that they could get less than 7%, and they're okay with that, just as anybody who enters in to collective bargaining is okay with the result of an independent, educated, very well-versed arbitrator who is going to speak to the province's financial sustainability, that would speak to the sustainability of public services. So, Madam Chair, are we talking about, you know, we're going to have to lose services if an independent arbitrator decided to pay these Crown attorneys less than what than what the Premier is, is touting, 17%, 17%, 17%? in actual fact, um, that they could have come out with a 3%. But instead, this government decided to heavy hand the bargaining process and withdraw the independent arbitrator altogether. And, and I, would, I would like to speak to Clause C, but I, you know, I'm, I'm going to have a really hard time, but I have my list of words I'm not allowed to say. Um, but it starts with respect. That's the first, first word in that clause, respect, Madam Chair. 
whoever wrote this should know that the absolute meaning of disrespect is how this government bargains a collective agreement because it is disrespectful. So I, I find it very hard to, to believe that the government's intention was to respect employees' ability to entertain free and fair collective bargaining. In fact, I know my union colleagues are probably really, really having some fun with that, thinking, you know, how, how funny to put that word in respect. This government hasn't respected one collective agreement since they became government in 2013, as was evident uh, with the uh, table documents from our, our leader of the NDP this morning, or earlier this afternoon. And when you enter into, as the Leader of the Opposition talked about, when you enter into a contract or you enter into an agreement, you sign that and you adhere to that and you live by, you know, you live by it, you die by it. You got to take the good with the bad, Madam Chair. And the fact that this employment agreement, the framework, was signed in 2016 by the Premier of Nova Scotia. What does that mean? What does that say, Madam Chair, about... Again, a word I'm not allowed to say, but what, what does that say? If I sign something, as, as the leader said, there are people you trust and there are people you trust. If I sign my name to something, and that's why politicians get a bad rap, and that really upsets me, quite frankly, because I've said to people, you know what? I'll give you an answer. You might not like it. I'm going to tell you the truth. Oh, yeah, I'm sure yeah, you're a politician. But, it, but it's the truth. You might not like what I have to say, as many people don't, but I'm okay with that because I say what I believe. And if I say something, if I sign something, Madam Chair, you can bet your bottom dollar or <laughs> anyone could take that, as they say, to the bank because, Madam Chair, this Premier signed a document. Mm -hmm. Who in this House thinks that that's okay mm -hmm. to break that agreement? Mm -hmm. You signed your name to a document and you've broken that agreement. Where, so let's go back to the word respect. Where does that word come in? If I'm being respected as an employee, then I am worthy of sitting at a table with my equals and coming to an agreement. Not, as and I've said before, not as soon as I don't get my own way, I'll take my bat and ball and go home and I'll just write a legislation so they don't have any choice. Madam Chair, like I've said this before, Nova Scotians are watching. Remember the word respect because that, at the end of the day, is what people are going to remember. They're not going to remember 7% or 17%. They're going, to, they're going to remember the fact that this government, this Premier, signed a document and then ripped it up. Um, I'd like to call on the Minister of Education and Early Childhood Development for an introduction. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair. I'd like to bring committee's attention to the speaker's gallery where we're joined by a special guest, Mr. Uh, Randy McLean, who's the Deputy Director of Education for the Horizon School Divi Division in Saskatchewan, uh, also uh, involved with the, um, with, with the Humboldt, Humboldt Broncos as well. Uh, Randy uh, is in town chatting with uh, myself and the speaker about uh, the potential to expand uh, sports programming here in Nova Scotia and sharing some great ideas about what's happening in other jurisdictions in the, in the, province, in the country. So I just want to uh, ask the committee to please join me in welcoming uh, Mr. McLean here today. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, and I'm happy to get up and speak to Clause 2 for a few minutes. Now, um, I, uh, I don't want to repeat too, too much of what my colleagues have already said, but I will, uh, in the course of this uh, little statement, maybe repeat a couple of things. But the first thing I'll say, Madam Chair, is that I am not a lawyer, 
Uh, and the closest I've ever come to playing one on TV is uh, played the court clerk in Jason uh, Buxton's production of Blackbird a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, that you might not seem uh, relevant to this conversation, but I will bring it back around to Clause 2 in just a minute. But what I am as a maker of theater and art and um, uh, that kind of thing is a bit of a wordsmith and a bit of an observer and a bit of a listener. And I think I need to have those skills to do what I do well. And so as I look, and I'm also an analyzer of texts, actually, um, and so when I look at Clause 2, uh, a couple of words pop out at me, Madam Chair. Um, the first one, I guess, would be the word sustainability. And my colleague from Dartmouth South, uh, the House Leader for the NDP, also did uh, talk a little bit about sustainability. And, I remember when I was in grade 12, uh, that was kind of the first time I heard, you know, sustainable uh, used in sort of a, in a, a, a global context with sustainable development and the Gaia hypothesis and all of those things that were, uh, uh, I was learning about in those early uh, days of the 1990s. Um, but, uh, and sustainable has come to mean a lot of different things to, to us uh, these days. Um, but uh, a quick uh, search of the word sustainable brought uh, up to me um, the, you know, the term sustainable communities. And I do believe that the two things are, are very much connected. Uh, and uh, when we talk about sustainable communities and Nova Scotia being a sustainable community of which we, in which we would all like to, I think, participate and live and uh, make sure that we thrive and uh, move forward into the future, there's three things that pop out to me. Number one is uh, enhance livability. Enhanced livability. So you think about our, our province uh, and we want to have a place where, in, where livability is enhanced in a sustainable way. So um, uh, I can see that, uh, you know, uh, brows are furrowing here a little bit, M Madam Chair, but uh, this is relevant to this conversation and to this clause because if we have sustainable public services, they would be uh, services in uh, a sustainable, livable community. But Madam Chair, uh, when we uh, remove uh, fundamental rights like collective bargaining, uh, we take away a little bit of an enhanced livability of our, of our province. And when we are trying to attract people to come to Nova Scotia, as the Premier often refers to, and, uh, and, he, and he often pats his uh, self on the back about how we have the highest population ever and, 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 and young people are returning home, well, guess what? If, if young people are returning home to a community in which they may get a job where, uh, you know, think it's a good job, got some benefits, got some uh, unionized job, that's all good, uh, but all of a sudden that means nothing because um, collective bargaining rights are removed, well, it's not so sustainable after all, is it? So um, another sort of part of being in a sustainable community would be an opportunity for economic prosperity. And I would like to, I would think that this actually goes uh, along the same lines. Uh, when we are looking at making our communities prosperous, and, and not just economically prosperous, but prosperous in other ways. We think about things like, uh, uh, you know, uh, can, I, can I make a go of it in the job, in my chosen profession in this community? And we know, my colleague has already referred to it, we've heard other people say it, if this uh, legislation passes, then we will have a, an oper or a, a situation where we will have a demoralized group of Crown attorneys who will, see better offers elsewhere, and they may leave, Madam Chair. And that is not sustainable for our community. Number one, it will throw our justice system into chaos, uh, but it would also just doesn't make Nova Scotia a very good place to be when we are, are, are when our, when our um, labor force of crowns, crown attorneys are looking elsewhere, somewhere else to go, a better deal, uh, a be more respect, uh, when our doctors are doing the same thing. And this is where my uh, little uh, foray into playing the court clerk comes into, uh, into uh, play here, Madam Chair. Of course, uh, don't forget about what happened uh, to the film industry not three or four years ago when the Premier decided to go against, go back on his word and cut the film tax credit, Madam Chair. So when I talk about my uh, film experience, I will say that, you know, probably, oh, I can't speak to exact numbers, but many of the people that worked on that production, uh, which was an important production, uh, uh, talking about important issues, uh, you know, 
who knows how many of them are left here in Nova Scotia. So the other thing about sustainable communities is uh, uh, we see a demonstration of visionary leadership and strong governance. I, I mean, it's, it's almost too obvious to even discuss, Madam Chair, but I would say that when, when, when a government is uh, unwilling to uh, come to the bargaining table uh, in, a, in a real uh, and meaningful way, and that's the other word that I will get to in a second, meaningful collective bargaining process, which this clause, uh, uh, clause 2 uh, C uh, refers to the meaningful collective bargaining process. When that is not happening, that does not demonstrate uh, leadership, uh, visionary leadership and strong governance. What it demonstrates is that we cannot trust a government to hold to their word. Uh, my colleague uh, from Cape Breton Centre referred to the fact that, uh, you know, uh, the, the Premier signed a contract. He signed in 2016, as we pointed out in question period this morning, he signed an agreement that would allow for and make way for and basically require uh, arbitration in, in the case of a labour dispute. Uh, and now he's taking, he's, he, that piece of paper that he signed is not worth the paper it is printed on. Is that the expression? Yep. Uh, and so for me, for my money, that does not demonstrate sh strong leadership and, uh, and uh, sorry, visionary <laughs> leadership and strong governance. And so, um, you know, when we think of Nova Scotia being a place uh, that is sustainable and has a, a livability that we, uh, you know, that, that, that is sustainable, and we think about uh, meaningful collective bargaining processes, we can see that uh, this uh, clause is no good, Madam Speaker, Madam, Madam Chair. And so I would just like to register uh, my thoughts on that and uh, suggest that uh, this clause go back for further thought. Thank you. I recognize the honourable member for Pictou East. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Any time that we're talking about sustainability of public services, we need to, as legislators, filter it through a lens. And I think that that lens that we should be filtering it through is um, on the walls downstairs, where, where, where Joseph Howe's quote is: "What what is right, what is just." what is in the public good. And that is the lens that we should look at when we talk about the services that the province delivers for Nova Scotians. And I would, I would be very interested to see if there is a single member in the government benches that would stand up and explain to Nova Scotians on behalf of their government how what is happening here is right. How is it right that a government signs a contract and then disregards it and sets it aside? I would be very interested to see if there is a single member on the government benches that would stand up today and explain to us how what is happening here is just. Perhaps the Minister of Justice might explain to us how what is happening here is just. I would be very interested to see if one single member over there would have an explanation as to how what is happening here is just. When down the street we have a court system that's in turmoil, I tabled uh, earlier today the mandate letter that the Premier gave to the Minister of Justice, that, that letter is being violated. The Minister is severely failing in his responsibilities to make sure that our justice system is operating. There is nothing about what is happening here is just. And I would be very interested to see if a single member on the government benches would stand up and explain to us how what is happening here, how this piece of legislation is in the public good. I would be very interested, but I don't think my curiosity will be fed today because I don't believe there is a single member that can answer any of those questions. And outside, we have the people who have committed their lives to upholding the law of the land. 
wondering why some of the people in here don't believe they have to follow it. That is the question that's being asked uh, by the people outside and by people across this province. Why do the people in this chamber feel that they not need follow the laws of the land? And our, our crowns are hired to maintain that very law, uh, rule of law, and yet the government, in its journey, ignores the rule of law by be breaching the contracts they enter into. And I spoke to uh, a crown outside and I asked her how she felt about what was happening here and she said, I want to throw up. She said, I want to throw up. Because they are the people who understand the rule of law and they can't imagine that this government ignores it. The right to um, collective bargaining is enshrined in Section 2 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And effectively, Bill 203 ignores this constitutionally protected right. This is a bill that will threaten the very sustainability of public services. This bill threatens please, sustainability. Please speak to the clause. I'm happy to speak to the clause. I'm talking about the sustainability of public services. So I'm speaking about Clause 2B. That's right. Because this bill threatens uh, the sustainability of public services. And as was pointed out, um, I think it was a very, a very uh, apt observation at Law Amendments Committee where one of the presenters said that the people who drafted this bill wouldn't be able to spell charter. Um, because this is a bill that will cost this province a long time. Um, a, lot, a long time and a lot of money in the court system. Um, our Crown Attorneys are working to preserve the rights of people in our courts, and yet their rights are being taken away. And I asked the members to just, to just ponder that for, for a second. The Premier is saying that Nova Scotia cannot afford a 17% pay increase. That's one of the Premier's talking points. What's lost on the Premier, it's not him for him to decide. It's not for the, for the Crown Attorney's negotiating agent to decide. Or for us in here, that decision by contract is left to an arbitrator. An arbitrator will decide what the pay increase will be. And the reason an arbitrator will decide is because that is the framework that this government um, agreed to be bound by. This government agreed to be bound by an arbitrator's decision. And now when, when confronted with the reality of what the government is legally bound to do, this government is effectively seeking a do-over. They want a do-over because they want to get themselves out of, the, out of what they are contractually bound to do. Now, there are approximately 100 crowns, uh, crown attorneys in the province, and that translates into at least 200 university degrees. This is a highly educated group of very specifically trained people whose, whose, whose commitment in life is to uh, examine and interpret legislation, examine and interpret laws, and their collective wisdom is that Bill 203 will not pass the uh, constitutional, uh, excuse me, Madam Chair, uh, will not co pass constitutional muster. And I think that's a group of people, that's an opinion that this, this, this group on the floor of this legislature would be wise to listen to. Because by not listening to them, excuse me, the, uh, the morale of the Crown Attorneys is, is, is weakened. It's pushing down. This is hard on morale. 
And when you have the morale of a group of uh, public servants at low points, that threatens the sustainability of, of, public, uh, of public services. And that's what we're talking about here. And the, the irony, this, this government uh, is, is currently seeking uh, injunctive relief. And in, injunctions are decided by the court as an equitable uh, remedy. But to seek equity, the applicant must come before the court with clean hands. And this government does not have clean hands in the wake of Bill 203. Um, they have the opposite of clean hands. Now consider the paradox that we are presented with. The government seeks an injunction claiming an illegal work stoppage. The government seeks an injunction claiming a strike. And they're claiming that on the basis of a contract and framework agreement that they now seek to repudiate in Bill 203. Consider the I paradox. I will repeat, the member needs to stay on the clause. We are at clause two. Speak to the clause. Thank you. <laughs> everything that I am speaking about, everything that I am referencing, is being referenced in the context of the threat to the sustainability of public services. This clause is to protect the sustainability of public services, and I am trying to point out the very obvious to the members opposite, that their own actions threaten uh, the sustainability of, of public services. And uh, I could talk about numerous situations that I've seen in my life uh, that would lead to the, the, the threat to, uh, to uh, the delivery of public services. And I could talk about uh, situations in my youth growing up and going with my grandfather to the old Sackville Downs uh, racetrack to watch the ponies run and people that we encountered on that journey and situations that they had relayed and shared with my grandfather about things that they had seen that had threatened public services and threatened the sustainability of public services. I could speak about that today at great length if the members uh, might be interested. But today I want to focus on the fact that this is a bill that purports to protect the sustainability of public services and yet it does the exact opposite. Bill 203, Clause 2, Clause 2A, Clause 2B, Clause 2C, Clause 2D, and every single future clause in this bill is poorly drafted, ill-considered, and repugnant to the rule of law. It is repugnant to the rule of law, which our very, our very crowns are duty-bound to uphold. Uh, we will not be supporting Clause 2, Clause 2A, Clause 2B, Clause 2C, Clause 2D, or any subsequent clause. And if the members are interested and, ca and continue to express an interest in why we will not, I will be happy to share that with them as we reach those clauses. But Madam Chair, uh, I want to rest, I want to give the assurance to the House that we will not be supporting this clause nor any of the other ones. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Um, Madam Chair, as I contemplate this clause, I, I am I'm struggling to visualize the dialogue that happened somewhere where advice was sought um, about how to draft this bill. Because the four clauses in this, in this clause, the four, the four sub-clauses, which speak to the purpose of the Act, um, are in fact uh, 
contradicted by the subsequent actions of the act, by, by the actual meaning of the rest of the act actually contradict the purposes. Um, I mean, part A, which talks about responsible fiscal management, that is simply disingenuous because we know that the action of the bill will leave um, the government uh, vulnerable to court challenges which will cost the province. But also we know that this particular, uh, this particular act uh, is pertinent to a very small number of public servants who are, uh, were formed together in the 1990s as the first independent public prosecution service in Canada. Um, and, and so it's, it's disingenuous, it's not, it's not valid or true to say that, uh, that their collective bargaining process somehow threatens or could threaten uh, the fiscal management of the, of the province. Simply, simply doesn't wash. Um, we know that this particular group of very special um, and specialized public employees um, came together or, or were, you know, are treated somewhat differently um, and that the 30-year framework agreement, uh, which actually continued a similar framework agreement which was negotiated uh, after the last uh, strike by uh, by Crown attorneys, um, those framework agreements were were arrived at specifically to protect the sustainability of this essential public service, which is fundamental to um, to the function of justice in Nova Scotia. Um, so again. Uh, the action of the act, the actual meaning of the act contradicts that purpose. We know that um, the, the, the actual, the guts of the rest of the bill contradict uh, part C, the, the third subclause of, of clause two, which says that um, the purpose includes to respect employees' right to a meaningful collective bargaining process with their employer, including the right to strike. But given that our 100 Crown attorneys are all essential to the functioning of justice, in fact, they don't, uh, they don't have a meaningful, they cannot have a meaningful right to strike, and the only counterbalance to that is arbitration, which this bill removes. Um, and then my, my colleague from Dartmouth South spoke very effectively to how it is simply not relevant to, to frame uh, any necessity to, to align how this group of, uh, of lawyers is treated uh, versus or in comparison to other lawyers in the employ of the government who simply just perform other functions, important functions, but functions that are not fundamental to the functioning of our courts today and tomorrow um, in terms of the protection of, protection of public safety and, and you know, reasonable treatment of victims and, and everything that is involved everything in the justice system which revolves around the work of Crown attorneys. So it, I, I just cannot imagine, I cannot, I cannot imagine, I would like, I look forward to one day being on the other side of this chamber and having those conversations around, um, around bringing forward government legislation because I hope I hope that that day will come, and I hope that when it does, I will, or members of my party will, members of a government that I have the honor to serve in, will seek advice and listen to it 
and be, be sincere in actually wanting to understand. Be sincere in wanting to govern well. Um, I simply cannot imagine. I cannot imagine how, given what I have learned, given what um, members of this government heard at law amendments, that, that there was not advice that, that said, do not do this. And that that advice must have come from, from people who, um, who have a real understanding of the weight and of the impact of the government of Nova Scotia putting forward this legislation. We know that the director of uh, the Public Prosecution Service, we know that his advice was not sought because he said as much at law amendments. I hope, I hope that this government and this premier is not so arrogant that all, um, all Order. voices. Order. Order. Member from Halifax Needham, implying that the government or the premier is arrogant is unparliamentary. I ask for you to uh, retract that statement. The member for Halifax Needham. I, I, um, I, I retract that word. Um, I hope that. I hope that this government and this premier value advice, including when that advice is not what they wish to hear. Because, frankly, advice that only um, makes us more confident in our path that we have predetermined without seeking advice is not advice worth getting. And I cannot imagine that in the government of Nova Scotia, in, in the in one government place, that there is not someone who would have given the advice that this clause is, is, is the, the purposes of this act, as written in this, in this clause, cannot be accomplished together, um, are at odds with each other, and are at odds with the actual impact of this legislation. Thank you. So clause 2, B, carry. Court of vote is McCall. How long would you like the bells to ring?
ask for quiet in the chamber, please. Um, are the whips satisfied? Please, please turn the bells off. All right, and so we will now proceed with the recorded vote. I ask that all members remain perfectly quiet during the vote, and all members shall state and clearly indicate yea or nay when their name has been called. I ask the clerk to proceed. Mr. Churchill. Aye. Mr. Fury. Yes. Ms. Regan. Yes. Mr. McClellan. Yes. Mr. McNeil. Ms. Casey. Yes. Mr. Wilson. Yes. Mr. Delory. Yes. Mr. Caldwell. Yes. Mr. Glavine. Yes. Mr. Krasoulis. Yes. Ms. Miller. Yes. Mr. Porter. Yes. Mr. Hines. Yes. Ms. Metledjdiab. We. Oui. Mr. Ince. Yes. Mr. Rankin. Yes. Mr. Mombriquet. Yes. Ms. Arab. Yes. Mr. Horn. Yes. Mr. Jessam. Yes. Mr. McKay. Yes. Ms. Lonas Croft. Yes. Ms. DiCostanzo. Yes. Mr. Irving. Yes. Mr. Dunn. No. Mr. Bain. No. Ms. Masland. No. Ms. McFarlane. No. Mr. Houston. No. Mr. McMaster. No. Ms. Chender. No. Mr. Burrell. No. Ms. Roberts. No. Ms. LeBlanc. No. Ms. Martin. No. Ms. Adams. Mr. Lohr. No. Mr. Hallman. No. Mr. Rushton. No. Mr. Craig. No. Ms. Smith McCrossan. No. Mr. Johns. Mr. Comer. No. Monsieur Leblanc. No. Mr. Ryan. No. Mr. Harrison. No. Ms. Pond. I recognize the clerk. Those in favor of the motion, 24. Those against, 20. Clause 2 carries. So Clause 3 carry. carry. I recognize, pardon me? I recognize the member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, Clause 3 of Bill 203 uh, reads, in this act, uh, a employment agreement means the employment agreement between Her Majesty and Right of the Province and the Nova Scotia Crown Attorneys Association, April 1, 2015 to March 31, 2019, dated June 7, 2016. Mr. Chair, uh, before I speak to that, just a note as I see members in the chamber getting tired and hungry, I would submit that it's worth our time to go through this bill clause by clause. If the government... Order. I recognize the member for Dartmouth South. I'm hungry. I'm tired. I want to be home with my kids. But this is more important, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Chair. We're talking about the gutting of the constitutional rights of a group of civil servants, again, by this government, and I submit that we ought to take the time to do that. When we talk about an employment agreement, uh, that uh, refers to the original employment agreement, which has already um, expired, essentially, uh, and, and it exists uh, uh, alongside the framework agreement um, that is being, in the words of, of one of the experts who testified at law amendments, gutted by this provision. Um, 
In Clause B, uh, there is a long description of essential service. And I think, uh, Mr. Chair, that this really gets to the heart um, of both why this act is so misleading in being framed as an act that gives uh, the pu a public service uh, group the right to strike, um, and also goes to the heart, at least in the opinion of every expert we heard from, of why this bill is unconstitutional. Here it says essential service means a service, facility, or activity of the government that is or will be at any time necessary for the safety or security of the public or a segment of the public, the protection of the rights under the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms of a person charged with an offence, or the administration of justice, including the provision of pre-sentencing and post-sentencing reports and other advice. And I wonder, Mr. Chair, whether those subsections uh, one through three were just cribbed from the job description of Crown attorneys, because that's what they do. <laughs> they ensure the safety and security of the public or a segment of the public. They protect people's rights under the Charter of Canadian Rights and Freedom, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, people charged with an offence. They uphold the integrity of the Crown, as we've discussed. And they are vital in the administration of justice, including the provision of pre-sentencing and post-sentencing reports and other advice. Essential services agreements take away all bargaining power from a group of workers, Mr. Speaker. And this, again, is why in the opinion of Paul Cavaluzzo and the opinion of Ray Larkin, there can be no other conclusion drawn about this piece of legislation but that it is unconstitutional. And there was a specific precedent put forward to detail why that is the case. And it goes directly to this essential services provision and definition. Essential services is not a foreign concept in labour legislation, uh, Mr. Chair, but the Supreme Court of Canada, in a relatively recent decision of the Saskatchewan Federation of Labour, recognized that where an essential services agreement, like the one alluded to in this Act, could not be reached and instead was decided on by a third party, they held that the scope of services deemed in that essential legislation was too broad. And in that case, which is so similar to this case, they said that that would lead to a disproportionate and unjustified restriction on the constitutionally protected right to strike. So in that case, the precedent that was established is that where you have a group of workers, most of whom are going to be determined essential by a third party, in this case, in this piece of legislation, the Labour Board, there needs to be another mechanism. There needs to be another way, such as, oh, I don't know, an arbitrator uh, that could determine uh, you know, what those essential services are and that could ensure that their collected bargaining rights were in fact being upheld. And Ray Larkin says, and I'll read from this, uh, the contradiction in Bill Number 203 is illustrated by the contrast with the Essential Health and Community Services Act, an act that is currently on the books that was passed by this government with regard, Mr. Chair, for this particular Supreme Court of Canada precedent, because in that act, it says, where a party to an essential health or community services agreement with respect to a bargaining unit considers that the level of activity that is required to be continued under the agreement has the effect of depriving the employees in the bargaining unit of Order. a meaningful right to strike. The member from Dartmouth South is citing a court case. You have to table that. Thank you. Member for Dartmouth South. Thank you. I don't have the full case. I have a quote from the case, which is has been it was in Ray Larkin's testimony, which was submitted Order. to the law amendments. If the member from Dartmouth South, if you're going to be <laughs> quoting court cases, you have to cite them or you have to um, um, table them. Sorry, member for Dartmouth South. Well, can you give me some direction on what to do? I have a submission from a QC that cites a court case. Can I table that? Order. Order. 
So if you're citing from law amendments or a court case, uh, this committee or this uh, the committee does not have access to that. Therefore, one second, please. Therefore, that has to be tabled. Thank you. The member for Dartmouth South. Thank you. I'm happy to table the submission uh, from law amendments. May I continue to read from it prior to tabling it? Yeah, just make sure it's tabled at the end of the day. Thank you. I, for I, I certainly will do. Uh, and I'll cut to the chase, which is that if uh, it, in, in the Health and Community Services Act passed here, uh, referenced by this Premier as part of his record, has a provision in, the, in that act that specifically contemplates the Saskatchewan Federation of Labour case, which says that the board, if they cannot determine a meaningful right to strike, may direct the parties to a binding method of resolving the issues in dispute between the parties. That's called binding arbitration. That is the mechanism that this Premier gave to this group of attorneys in 2016. That was three years ago. That was after the supposed devastation of the universe by the Dexter government. That was after you know, the Tories had wreaked havoc on everyone forever in their Godzilla fashion. Uh, that was this government. That was this government, Mr. Chair. This government signed this agreement with this group of attorneys. And in that agreement, there was the right to binding arbitration. Here we talk about essential services legislation and that essential services legislation, according to every expert, will not be in any way meaningful. We heard today, Mr. Chair, the, the Premier, the Minister of Justice, talking about the greedy Crown attorneys sacrificing the justice system for their financial needs. Mr. Chair, I thought they had the right to strike. I thought this whole legislation was about giving them the right to strike, and yet when they strike legally in this case, they're called greedy. So which is it? Which is it, Mr. Chair? Uh, it's, it's so difficult to understand the genuine meaning of the words on this piece of paper. If we move ahead uh, to Section C, I'll, I'll just make one more comment. Um, this framework agreement that was signed by this Premier with this organization uh, was retroactive to 2012 and runs to 2046. And at the time that that agreement was signed, as we've heard before, but is worth stating again, this group took zeros. They took zeros for two years. They took very modest increases in exchange for the right to binding arbitration. And Mr. Chair, the government has availed themselves mm -hmm. of the benefits of that agreement up until now. So up until 2019, when the beneficial aspect of that agreement, which is the zeros that the Crowns took for year one and two, is benefiting the government, no problem. But as soon as it comes time for their promised renegotiation, as soon as they get back to the table for the reward that they have been promised for said for for taking a deal that they felt was too little, and they try and ask for a comparable salary to their colleagues in comparably sized jurisdictions, well, Mr. Chair, not only does this bill get tabled with no notice, with no notice, I knew about this bill before they knew about this bill. You know there's something wrong. The media knew about this bill before the Crown knew about this bill, Mr. Chair. And it's going to come into force tomorrow. We were told that. We were told that right in the, uh, right in the briefing. Uh, it's not just going to be passed tomorrow because the government has the numbers to do that, and they've certainly uh, indicated their willingness. We certainly hope that by being persuasive, by talking about the framework agreement, by talking about the fact that the essential services referred to in Section 3B uh, apply to all Crown, that that won't happen. But, but we know better. The Premier is nothing if not consistent, as he said today. Um, and and it's, uh, 
it's uh, it's it's really too bad, um, and I, and it's um, it's it's somewhat embarrassing to be part of a chamber uh, that's going to pass legislation like this in this way. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I recognize the member from Cape Breton Centre. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I too would like to rise and speak to um, Clause 3 in its entirety, um, aside from specifically um, A, B, and C. Um, as my colleague said, and I said earlier, um, let's bring it back to 2016 when the Premier signed that document saying that um, he's giving his word. The Premier gave his word that this is what's what's um, going to take place. When my daughter was born 25 years ago, as I'm sure with many people in this house, we teach them right from wrong. We teach them if they say something, they need to stand behind it. And if you mis make a mistake, you need to own it. And Mr. Speaker, or, uh, Mr. Chair, I have to say that I'm proud to say that my daughter will stand behind what she says. Sadly, this Premier will not. This Premier does not have the same... Um, I'm speaking to the whole clause. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the fact that the Premier has signed on to something and has um, broken away from that agreement is not only a misrepresentation of his obligation of the leader of this province, but also very, very upsetting. Mr. Chair, when I came into this role, I believed, oh boy, was I wrong. I believed that um, we were Order. all... Order. I ask that the member from Cape Breton Centre speak about the clause. The clause is about employee, employment agreement, essential services, safety and security of the public. Um, we're, you're, wandering, you're wandering off topic, and I ask you to stay on topic, please. The member for Cape Breton Centre. So in the employment agreement, when the Premier signed and gave his, the Premier's word that, that this would be adhered to, it was quite a disappointment to come into this chamber to find out that the Premier's word is not, is not actually the law. Or I, I would think that, uh, and in fact, back in um, I forget, 2015, when Bill 1 was brought in, and uh, the Premier this government brought in the arbitrator, James Dorsey. <laughs> but funny enough, after about a million bucks paying James Dorsey... <clears throat> Order. The member from Cape Breton Centre will stay on the clause, please. Thank you. The member from Cape Breton Centre. I'm talking about the arbitration process, Mr. Chair. And, and in fact, um, when this government tried to impose um, anti-bill, anti let anti-labor legislation back in Order. 20... So, just to be clear, as for the clerk's advice, the, what you are to be speaking about is the definition and the meaning in this bill, not in previous bills. What you're doing right now is having a discussion about bills in the past. You have to talk about this particular bill and the definitions in this clause. Thank you. The member from Cape Breton Centre. So this talks about the safety and security of the public. I don't know other than when this government stopped bargaining with the Crown attorneys was public safety ever in jeopardy. Because Mr. Chair, I will tell you that in no time did healthcare workers ever put the public safety in jeopardy. Even though, as in this bill and in this clause, Mr. Chair, um, it is... <laughs> so, that's time. That's time. One second. One, one, order, please. Order, please. The, the, I, I will say it again. You're speaking about health care and the bills that affect health care. This is not the bill. Second of all, the, the language that you used was unparliamentary. Right. So all I'm asking, politely, is that you stay on this bill, this topic. When you're, when you're going back to health care, when you're going back to anything else that's not related specifically to this bill, 
you're going off the clause of this bill. The member for Cape Breton Centre. Oh. No. No, I'm done. I'm done. Like. The member for Pictou East. Um, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, in terms of um, essential services, uh, and, the, and the cause defines essential services uh, as a service, uh, facility, or activity of the government that is or will be at any time necessary for safety or security of the public, protection of rights under the Charter, uh, administration of justice. In terms of essential service, I think it's important uh, to think about when this, when this uh, bill is passed by the members opposite, what will essential services uh, mean to the, the people who are, are having to enforce the law? How will essential services be negotiated? And I think the, um, something that's entirely relevant to that discussion is the, the words of the um, Minister of Justice today and the words of the Premier. And when my colleague from uh, Dartmouth South was, was, was referencing in, in general terms some of the comments of the government today, which are relevant to this discussion in the sense of how will the members opposite determine what is essential and what is not. I think it's important to, um, to <coughs> consider how they've acted in the past. I think it's important to consider what they say about essential services. And when my colleague from Dartmouth South was talking, I heard uh, in general terms about what the, what the government had said today. I heard the uh, Minister of Internal Services saying table it table it. And uh, first off, I would like to fulfill, I would like to fulfill that request of the, of the minister and I would like to, and I'll table this uh, when I'm done, this is speaking to the Minister of Justice comments today um, and how the minister views what's happening which therefore views essential services. So these are some of the comments from the Minister of Justice today. Uh, the Minister of Justice today, I'm troubled by the fact that our prosecutors who are looking out for their personal financial best interest over the needs of victims and survivors of domestic violence and sexual assaults and other matters. Um, I think that gives you a window into how the, the minister sees um, essential, essential services and what's essential. The minister feels that our prosecutors are looking out for their personal financial best interests over the needs of victims uh, of, of, uh, and, and survivors of, and the minister referenced domestic, domestic violence and sexual assaults and other matters which presumably would include things like uh, uh, driving while impaired and murder and rape and some of these things. Uh, that was a comment from the Minister of Justice today. Another comment from the Minister of Justice, Justice today, this is about money in their pockets. That is how the Minister of Justice views what's happening here. And, and the third comment, and then I'll table this order, uh, for the benefit. Order. The member from Pictou East is talking about the bill, not the clause. So I ask that you stay on the clause, please. Thank you. The member from Pictou East. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, actually, um, sorry for any misunderstanding. I'm speaking about the definition of essential services, and I'm speaking about how this government uh, may interpret the meaning of essential services. I'm, I'm speaking very, very specifically about how this government may determine what's essential and what's not. Uh, in that context, I am referencing ministers of justice comments who presumably uh, will play a role in determining what is essential and what is not essential. Um, but presumably, the Minister of Justice, although he hasn't had much to say in this chamber about this bill, may at some point uh, have, have something to say about what's essential and what's not. And in that context, I'd like to, the, the third comment from the Minister uh, of Justice was that it's my position that the public protection 
uh, that the public protection, the Crown prosecutors bear responsibility for dismissals of any cases today. They are putting their personal financial needs and desires ahead of the well-being of victims and survivors, and that is problematic. Uh, that's, these are the comments. So I'll table that uh, for the benefit of the, the Minister of Internal Services that was curious what her own colleagues might have been uh, saying to the media. Now, in the, in the determination of what is essential and what is not, and what may be an essential service and what may not be an essential service, I do think it's relevant to look at the history of this government. Um, and the history of this government is one that includes um, discussions with healthcare providers, uh, where there has been a discussion of what is essential and what is not. I don't know that that ha has, has been determined. I don't know that an essential services agreement has been reached with health care uh, providers. Uh, that is relevant for the discussion of what is essential and what is not. Um, but when we're talking about the, the safety or security of the public or a segment of the public, I think the role that our Crown attorneys play in the justice system is very, very relevant to that discussion about the safety, security of the public or any segment of the public because that speaks to the heart of what our Crown attorneys do. That every single day our Crown attorneys are providing services that are essential to the delivery of justice to victims. Every single day Every Crown attorney is providing a service that is essential to the safety of the public, to the security of the public, and is in the public good every single day. So as this government considers and tries to wrap its head around um, who might get the highest score on Candy Crush, I mean, sorry, how they might determine what is uh, an essential service and what is not an essential service, I think it's entirely relevant for the members in this chamber to look at the past record of this very government on those important issues. And the past record of this government on those important issues is not very good. And for that reason, I will be voting against Clause 3. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Shall clause three carry? carry. How long shall the bells ring? Till the whips are satisfied.
Order. We will now proceed with the recorded vote. I ask that all members remain perfectly quiet uh, during the vote, and all members shall stand and clearly indicate yea or nay when their name has be been called. I recognize the clerk. Mr. Churchill. Aye. Mr. Fury. Yes. Ms. Regan. Yes. Mr. McClellan. Yes. Mr. McNeil. Ms. Casey. Yes. Mr. Wilson. Yes. Mr. Delory. Yes. Mr. Caldwell. Yes. Mr. Glavine. Yes. Mr. Kasoulis. Yes. Ms. Miller. Yes. Mr. Porter. Yes. Mr. Hines. Yes. Ms. Metlidiab. We. Oui. Mr. Ince. Yes. Mr. Rankin. Yes. Mr. Momberket. Yes. Ms. Arab. Yes. Mr. Horn. Yes. Mr. Jessam. Yes. Mr. McKay. Yes. Ms. Lonis Croft. Yes. Ms. DiCostanzo. Yes. Mr. Irving. Yes. Mr. Dunn. No. Mr. Bain. No. Ms. Masland. No. Ms. McFarlane. No. <clears throat> Mr. Houston. No. Mr. McMaster. No. Ms. Chender. No. Mr. Burrell. No. Ms. Roberts. No. Ms. LeBlanc. No. Ms. Martin. No. Ms. Adams. Mr. Lohr. No. Mr. Hallman. No. Mr. Rushton. No. Mr. Craig. No. Ms. Smith McCrossan. No. Mr. Johns. Mr. Comer. No. Monsieur Leblanc. No. Mr. Ryan. No. Mr. Harrison. No. Ms. Pond. Recognize the clerk. Those in favor of the motion, 24. Those against, 20. Clause 3 has carried. Before we proceed to Clause 4, I want to remind everybody on the floor of the legislature and in the gallery that there's no photos to be taken uh, unless you're accredited media. If people are taking pictures, uh, I will kindly ask them to leave. Uh, shall Clause 4 carry? I recognize the member from Dartmouth South. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a few words uh, on Clause 4, which reads, This Act applies to any collective bargaining process between Her Majesty and Right of the Province and the Nova Scotia Crown Attorneys Under Association. Order. The member from Dartmouth South has the floor. Underway on the day that this act comes into force, that's tomorrow, everyone, and any future collective bargaining process between those parties. And I want to say that the idea that this bill exists to respect the rights of people put out in Section 2D of the Charter to collectively bargain, and it is being introduced in the middle of collective bargaining and will come into force on the day that it is passed, is ludicrous. Shall Clause 4 carry? There's been a request for a recorded vote till the whips are satisfied. Till 7? Till 7 o'clock. We will now break for hmm, till 7 o'clock. Thank you. Okay. Just, just order, just to clarify, the request was for an hour. The bells will ring till 713.
Order. Order. We'll now proceed with the recorded vote. Yeah, it's, it's an hour. I ask that all members remain perfectly quiet during the vote, and all members shall stand and clearly indicate yay or nay when the name has been called. I ask the clerk to proceed. Recognize the clerk. Mr. Churchill. Aye. Mr. Fury. Yes. <coughs> Ms. Regan. Yes. Mr. McClellan. Yes. Mr. McNeil. Ms. Casey. Yes. Yes. Mr. Wilson. Yes. Mr. Delory. Yes. Mr. Caldwell. Yes. Mr. Glavine. Yes. Mr. Kasoulis. Yes. Ms. Miller. Yes. Mr. Porter. Yes. Mr. Hines. Yes. Ms. Metlidjiab. We. Oui. Mr. Ince. Yes. Mr. Rankin. Yes. Mr. Momberket. Yes. Ms. Arab. Yes. Mr. Horn. Yes. Mr. Jessam. Yes. Mr. McKay. Yes. Ms. Lonas Croft. Yes. Ms. DiCostanzo. Yes. Mr. Irving. Yes. Mr. Dunn. No. Mr. Bain. No. Ms. Masland. <laughs> Ms. McFarlane. No. Mr. Houston. No. Mr. McMaster. No. Ms. Chender. No. Mr. Burrell. No. Ms. Roberts. No. Ms. LeBlanc. No. Ms. Martin. No. Ms. Adams. Mr. Lohr. No. Mr. Hallman. No. Mr. Rushton. No. Mr. Craig. No. Ms. Smith McCrossan. Mr. Johns. Mr. Comer. No. Monsieur Leblanc. Mr. Ryan. No. Mr. Harrison. Ms. Pawn. Recognize the clerk. Those in favor of the motion, 24. Those against, 16. Clause 4 carries. I now call clauses 5 through 7. So clauses 5 through 7 carry. Carry. Clauses 5 through 7 carries. I now call clause 8. So clause 8 carry. I recognize the member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Mr. Chair, the clause 8 of this bill reads, sub 1, the framework agreement is amended in accordance with Schedule B, and I'll draw the member's attention to the word amended. Uh, subsection 2 says the amendment of the framework agreement under subsection 1 applies notwithstanding the requirement for mutual consent in section 22 of the framework agreement, and I'll draw the member's attention to the framework agreement, which I will table at the end of the session. Um, and Clause 22 of the Framework Agreement, which I'll remind the members was signed by this Premier and uh, for a duration of 30 years. Uh, Section 22 Amendments. This Framework Agreement may be amended by the mutual consent of both parties. Amendments must be in writing and signed by both parties. Well, that's no longer true, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, this also lies at the heart of the criticism of this bill from legal experts. Uh, this government says that this framework is amended. Mr. Cavaluzzo says that this framework is gutted. And, and, I, and, and I think it's not a stretch. I actually hadn't seen the full framework until today. Um, the framework is 10 pages long, and the changes uh, here and elsewhere in this bill uh, remove, I would say, four to five full pages of this framework agreement. So I don't think it's quite accurate to say, Mr. Chair, that the amendment of this framework agreement is amended. I don't think that's what's happening here. I think what's actually happening is that the framework agreement 
which also is a contract, is being unilaterally breached and other legislation is being imposed in its stead in a way that is not consistent with the Charter. Uh, Mr. Chair, it's unfortunate. Uh, this agreement was reached by hard bargaining and mutual consent of the parties. It looks the way this kind of agreement should look, uh, but unfortunately, after tomorrow, uh, it will be gutted, uh, no longer in force, and, and likely the subject of a legal challenge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Recognize the member for Halifax Needham. Um, I will say only a couple of things here. Just um, to, to, to think that an agreement can continue when, there, when, in fact, the agreement is changed without mutual consent um, is, is so mind-twistingly wrong that uh, I think it is very dangerous uh, for a government which, um, you know, through this legislature governs, governs with words put into law. Um, because if our words no longer mean anything, it's not just our word or the word of the Premier which um, people are questioning. It is the meaning of words themselves. And that is very uh, slippery ground um, for, for this legislature and this government to contemplate. Thank you. So clause eight carry. Yeah. The clause is carried. So clause nine carry. Yeah. I recognize the member for Dartmouth South. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, I will point out that in this clause, uh, the any arbitration uh, pursuant to the employment agreement or framework agreement underway at the time this act comes into force is terminated. This is a little bit macabre, Mr. Chair. <laughs> This act was brought in in order to prevent these parties from going to arbitration. But just in case, whoever drafted this act decided that just in case, just in case somehow that arbitration started and presumably looked like it wasn't going to turn out the way the government wanted it to, they could still bring the legislation. Uh, I can't for the life of me think of any other reason that this would be in here, and I think it's consistent with what we've heard from the Crown Attorneys, which is that from day one, they were threatened with this legislation, Mr. Chair. They were threatened with this legislation. And this clause, which says that even if the parties are in arbitration on the day that this is passed, that that's nullified, uh, is... Uh, is a clause that I think um, is terrible, uh, misleading, disrespectful, um, and frankly, uh, I, I, I wish that, that whoever wrote this, whoever was directed to write it, whatever opinion that they were working off of, was better than that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So clause nine, carry. Clause 9 carries. Shall Clause 10 carry? Yeah. Clause 10 carries. Shall Clause 11 carry? Yeah. I recognize the member for Dartmouth South. Mr. Chair, Clause 11 says that unless an agreement for the provision of essential services has been entered into under subsection 10 sub 1, essentially uh, the Crown can't strike. And so we're going to, uh, we've talked about how this legislation, which gives Crown the right to strike, actually doesn't give Crown the right to strike. Um, I think this is where you see that, <coughs> because subsequent to this, we will hear about how they have 20 days, an absurd amount of time, 20 days, to come up with an essential services agreement for an organization, all of whose members we have heard over and over and over again are essential, and if in those 20 days, uh, that agreement hasn't been entered into. The Labour Board will decide. The Labour Board, if they use the context in which the Crown work, will certainly decide that they are all or mostly essential, because we know that they are. And then guess what, Mr. Chair, they can't strike. 
they can't strike. It's illegal. So it's legal for them to be out there right now, Mr. Chair. It's legal for them to be out there right now because their contract with this province was breached. It was breached by this, by this government with this bill. But it's not going to be legal anymore because there is no way that there will be an essential services agreement determined that allows any of them to ever go on the picket line. Another misleading clause in a misleading bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Shall Clause 12 carry? Yeah. I, clause 12 carries. Shall Clause 13 carry? Yeah. Clause 13 carries. Shall Clause 14 carry? Yeah. Clause 14 carries. Shall Clause 15 carry? Yeah. I recognize the member for Dartmouth South. Mr. Chair, Clause 15 reads that no arbitrator or arbitration board established under any act of the Legislature or in accordance with a collective agreement and no board or tribunal, including the Labour Board, has jurisdiction to a determine the constitutional validity or constitutional applicability of this act or of the employment agreement or the framework agreement to the extent that they are amended by this act or b determine whether a right conferred recognized affirmed or otherwise guaranteed by the constitution of canada has been infringed by this act or by the employment agreement or by the framework agreement or what's left of it to the extent that they are amended by this act mr chair this clause is designed to delay the certain evolution of this bill uh, from the order paper into force onto the Supreme Court of Canada docket. This just makes it harder. We've said a few times that this bill is not going to save this province money. It's going to cost this province money later. This isn't the first time we've seen this. I hope it's the last, but uh, I think I can't possibly be sure of that, Mr. Chair. But by specifically and explicitly preventing any determination of constitutional validity or applicability, which could then be appealed and could then start a court process, this bill makes it harder. This bill is essentially saying, I'm not constitutional, but it's going to be hard for you to prove it. Again, Mr. Chair, I, I expect better. Thank you. Shall Clause 15 carry? The clause is carried. Shall Clause 16 carry? I recognize the member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This talks about the fines for an illegal strike. I think we've established that any strike under this, once this legislation is passed tomorrow, any strike of the Crown will be illegal because they're all essential. They will be seen to be essential by the Labour Board and then any move to go on the picket line will be illegal. So not only does this bill not guarantee them the right to strike, this bill removes the arbitration clause, which the Crown relied upon in signing their, their current framework agreement, and then it explicitly makes contravention of this act. So if they're trying to strike, this, remember, this bill, the first thing I was told in, in our briefing, uh, same for the briefing for attribution to the media, was this bill gives Crown attorneys the right to strike. Well, does it? I don't think so, Mr. Chair, because if they strike illegally, which any strike will be, they will be subject to a fine as an organization of up to $100,000 and further fines of $10,000 a day. Additionally, they will be subject to individual fines of up to $1,000 a day, and additional to that, not more than $200 a day. So as much as the Premier, uh, and I'm interested in what the Premier thinks about this, uh, wants to say that the Crown are greedy and rich and overpaid, the reality is they make less than their counterparts in similar jurisdictions, they make less than legal aid lawyers, they make less than lawyers in the private bar, and they certainly can't afford these fees. So what does this bill do, this bill that guarantees the right to strike? It removes the Section 2D charter rights of the Crown Attorneys of the Public Prosecution Service here in Nova Scotia. Thank you, Mr. Chair.
Shall clause 16 carry? Carry. Shall clause 17 carry? Carry. The clause is carried. Shall clause 18 carry? Carry. Clause 18 carries. Shall, shall schedule A carry? Carry. Schedule A is carried. Shall schedule B carry? Carry. Schedule B is carried. Shall the title carry? Carry. I recognize the member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> we've already spoken about how the title of this act is misleading, the short title and the long title. Um, and I think we could just take the opportunity, having heard the comments of this side of the House anyway, on this legislation, um, to just take a moment and see where we all sit. Uh, we all know that bills move through this House through a series of specified steps. They're read three times, they move into law amendments, they move through Committee of the Whole, uh, they are voted on at each stage, uh, they are proclaimed, and they are put into force. Uh, so this is a step, and this will be our last opportunity to determine as a chamber whether we all want a patently unconstitutional piece of legislation to pass this step of the legislative process. I know that my colleagues uh, don't want a piece of legislation that purports to, withhold, to uphold the Section 2D charter rights to collective bargaining to a group of people, but in fact explicitly denies them those rights to pass this chamber. But I guess this is an opportunity to find out what everybody thinks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Shall the title carry? Oh, sorry. I recognize the member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I didn't really want to have the last word on this, but uh, there it is. Um, uh, I just wanted to speak to the word relationship, the labour relationship between Her Majesty in uh, right of the province and the Nova Scotia Crown Attorneys Association. Again, uh, examining the, the term relation or relationship, we know that it means the way in which two or more concepts, objects or people are connected, the effect on or the revel uh, revel <laughs> excuse me, relevance to one another. And so, Mr. Mr. Chair, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the irony of this, uh, this title of this bill. Uh, when we think about the term relation or being in relationship with someone or something, generally that term means that that's a positive uh, connection or a positive uh, relationship uh, where two people uh, affect each other or two parties affect each other in a positive way. So uh, obviously uh, from what we've heard tonight and what we know of this bill, uh, the relationship between uh, the province and the Crown Attorneys uh, will be uh, damaged by this piece of legislation. The relationship is broken because in a relationship we normally have trust, we normally have uh, uh, an, uh, an experience where uh, the two parties are listening to one another, where there is communication. There's a lot of chatter in the chamber. The member from Dartmouth North has the floor. The member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and so uh, this relationship is damaged. Uh, Mr. Chair, it, uh, the fact is, is that the, the, this piece of legislation uh, is uh, taking away fundamental, as my colleague has said, fundamental charter rights of a group of workers in this province, uh, their right to uh, arbitration and their right to collective bargaining. Uh, and therefore, uh, I find the title of this bill uh, uh, bitterly ironic, and I think the bill should be sent back. Thank you. Shall the title carry? Yes. There's been a request for a uh, recorded vote. For how long? Till the whips are satisfied.
the whips are satisfied. We will now proceed with the recorded vote. I ask all members to remain perfectly quiet during the vote. All members shall stand and clearly indicate yea or nay when their names are called. I recognize the clerk. Mr. Churchill. Aye. Mr. Fury. Yes. Ms. Regan. Yes. Mr. McClellan. Yes. Mr. McNeil. Ms. Casey. Yes. Mr. Wilson. Yes. Mr. Delory. Yes. Mr. Caldwell. Yes. Mr. Glavine. Yes. Mr. Kasoulis. Yes. Ms. Miller. Yes. Mr. Porter. Yes. Mr. Hines. Yes. Ms. Metledge Diab. We. Oui. Mr. Ince. Yes. Mr. Rankin. Yes. Mr. Momberket. Yes. Ms. Arab. Yes. Mr. Horn. Yes. Mr. Jessam. Yes. Mr. McKay. Yes. Ms. Lonas Croft. Yes. Ms. Di Costanzo. Yes. Mr. Irving. Yes. Mr. Dunn. No. Mr. Bain. No. Ms. Masland. No. Ms. McFarlane. No. Mr. Houston. No. Mr. McMaster. No. Ms. Chender. No. Mr. Burrell. No. Ms. Roberts. No. Ms. LeBlanc. No. Ms. Martin. No. Ms. Adams. Mr. Lohr. No. Mr. Hallman. No. Mr. Rushton. No. Mr. Craig. No. Ms. Smith McCrossan. No. Mr. Johns. Mr. Comer. No. Monsieur Leblanc. No. Mr. Ryan. No. Mr. Harrison. No. Ms. Pawn. I recognize the clerk. Those in favor of the motion, 24. Those against, 20. The title is carried. Shall the bill carry? Yeah. The bill is carried. <clears throat> Recognize the Honorable uh, Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Would you please call bill number 189? The House of Assembly Act. Bill 189, the House Assembly Act. I recognize the clerk. Mr. Chair, Bill 189 was referred from the Committee from on Law Amendments without amendments and contains two clauses. Shall Clause 1 carry? Carry. The clause is carried. Shall Clause 2 carry? Carry. Shall the title carry? Carry. The title is carried. Shall the bill carry? Carry. The bill is carried. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Would you please call bill number 192, the Municipal Elections Act.
I recognize the clerk. Mr. Chair, Bill No. 192 was referred back from the Committee on Law Amendments without amendments and contains six clauses. Shall I recognize the member for Halifax Needham? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would like to move, um, if everyone can refer to CWHB NDP 1, um, on page 1, add the following clause. 1. Clause 14B of Chapter 300 of the Revised Statutes, 1989, the Municipal, Government, Municipal Elections Act, as amended by Chapter 26 of the Acts of 1994 and Chapter 47 of the Acts of 2015, is further amended by adding, quote, or a permanent resident as defined in the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act, bracket, Canada, bracket, uh, close quote immediately after citizen in the first line. And then page one, renumber clauses one to six as two to seven. So I'm, I'm glad to speak to this amendment. Um, it is essentially um, the change that uh, uh, Mayor Mike Savage spoke to, uh, spoke to at law amendments. I was not there, however, um, uh, if you look at the order paper, you will find that, in fact, um, the NDP has a bill sitting on the order paper, which is uh, Bill 37, which eff effectively calls for this same change. Um, and, and it is simply to recognize that municipal government is local. It is, it is about how we live together in, in our municipalities. And there are many residents who are neighbors and uh, who uh, in various way pay uh, property taxes or pay uh, recreation fees or um, certainly use municipal services who are not c citizens of Canada and yet are, um, are neighbors who have uh, a real stake in how our municipalities run and who would like um, to be um, to be recognized as voters uh, and, and who are ready to be engaged in municipal elections. Uh, this request um, came from uh, Halifax. Um, a number of years ago, there was an extensive staff report completed. Um, it passed through council and the request came uh, to, uh, the, to the department, to the province, as, as so many changes that municipalities seek um, uh, must come. And, and I, uh, I, I referenced it briefly on second reading to this bill, and I, I'm glad, I was glad to hear, and then to get lots of uh, feedback um, about the mayor's presentation um, at law amendments. This seems like a very uh, a worthwhile change. It is intended both to um, uh, encourage participation in governance uh, and and, and also to recognize that uh, in, a, in a city that is, uh, and, and a province that is welcoming immigration, um, there, there is no reason to, uh, to not um, enfranchise so many, uh, so many residents who are permanent residents. So uh, thank you very much. I recognize the member for Inverness. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to start by saying I'm sympathetic towards uh, this, uh, this amendment and uh, can understand why it's being put forward. Uh, the only reservation I have is it's an important change. Uh, I know the, uh, the member who put it forward, uh, their party has a bill before the House right now on this very matter, as she had indicated. Uh, I think this is a matter that's very important, uh, that deserves uh, uh, possibly public consultation. Um, but also, I think, uh, to, for it to come through by way of an amendment uh, to another bill um, on a Thursday night here in the House, I think it's, I think it's too quick to just to come in that way. And if it's, if it's something that should happen, um, you know, we, we also have the question, if it's happening on a municipal level, the same argument could be made on a provincial or federal level. 
So um, I appreciate the sentiment that it's being brought forth in, uh, but I have some reservations about approving an amendment uh, here tonight. Thank you. I recognize the member for Dartmouth South. Um, north, North, sorry, north. Dartmouth North. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was at law amendments on the day that this uh, uh, amendment was or suggested by, uh, by His Worship, uh, Mayor Mike Savage. Uh, he made really compelling arguments as to why we should make this change to this bill. And one of the things was is that um, uh, one of the reasons why it was important to do it now is because you know we do have an opportunity with the bill being opened up for the other the other changes to make this very important change. And as he noted, I believe it was him that noted uh, that if we don't do it now, uh, we have an, a municipal election coming in a year from now, in 2020, fall of 2020. And uh, if we don't uh, sort of look at this this change now, uh, most likely the change won't happen before the next. Uh, municipal election, therefore there would be a whole, it would be another four years before uh, this change could could come into effect. I, 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 um, I, I sympathize, I guess, with uh, the member from Inverness's point about it being quick, but I will say, I, I take some exception to his comment uh, suggesting that this amendment uh, is just sort of being sprung on us tonight because we did, in fact, propose the amendment at law amendments, uh, and the government side decided to reject our suggestion, uh, and that's unfortunate. I mean, frankly, the amendment or the su suggestion could have at least been taken back, so the bill could have been studied a little bit more before we put it through, uh, and this concern of the member from Inverness uh, would have would have been uh, alleviated. So um, I, uh, I feel strongly that it's important to give people who are permanent residents uh, the same rights as anyone else who moves to a municipality. That is, if you've been in a municipality for six months uh, or more, then you can vote in the municipal elections. Uh, as my colleague pointed out, the municipal elections uh, and, and municipal affairs are about things that affect us on a daily level, a daily uh, basis on a local level. And, uh, and, and uh, everyone who lives in community uh, should have the right to make decisions about that community. Thank you. Recognize the member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, to echo the comments of my colleague from Inverness, um, with regards to the amendment, but also with regards to the bill in conjunction, um, one of the comments we received back from uh, municipal leaders is that there was very little very little consultation with our Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities. And uh, so with regards to the amendment and the bill, um, we would like to see more consultation uh, with the Federation. Uh, with all due respect, we have uh, great respect for our mayor of, of HRM. Uh, there are 50 municipalities throughout Nova Scotia, and it's important that we do proper consultation anytime we're presenting legislation here in this house. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Shall the, oh, I recognize the member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was also present at the Law Amendments Committee uh, when His Worship presented on this, and he gave a very compelling presentation. Uh, this is not a new idea. This is not a new amendment. This is not the first time that this has come across the government's desk. The bill is on the order paper. The amendment was and was on the order paper before that. The bill, the amendment was moved in the law amendments committee, uh, and the mayor uh, made the case there that the reason he was appearing before the law amendments committee is because this bill is being opened up. And one of the answers we often get when we try to change the Municipal Governance Act or municipal legislation in general is it's complicated. We got to talk about it. It's a big bill. We don't want to open it up. So here it is. It's open. Making this change would enfranchise approximately 30,000 people before the next municipal election. If we don't make the change now, there are 30,000 people who live in this province, many of whom pay taxes, who will not have the opportunity to vote for their elected representative. If you move to Nova Scotia tomorrow from British Columbia, from Alberta, from Prince Edward Island, after six months you would have the right to vote. But if you moved here from Syria, from China, from Nigeria, it'll probably take you five years. That's just not fair, Mr. Chair. There's no reason for it. With respect to consultation, Mr. Chair, 
I have to say, with all due respect to my colleagues in the Progressive Conservative Caucus, if we had consulted on enfranchisement throughout history, where would we be? If we had put a referendum out on whether women should have the right to vote, how would it have come back? No, that's how it would have come back. If we had had a referendum on whether First Nations people should have had the right to vote, what would people have said? They would have said no. And I don't say this to cast aspersions on the progressive conservatives. I know that this has been, spr I know this has been sprung on them. We, did, we ourselves didn't expect this, but I, but I just want to address that point. I want to address the point because often this legislation is delayed and it's delayed and delayed and delayed, particularly at the municipal level. And I submit, Mr. Chair, that there is no reason for delay in this case. It's a simple principle. No taxation without representation. That's one that I think my colleagues in the Progressive Conservative Caucus would be amenable to. Not all new immigrants pay taxes, but a lot of them do. <laughs> and Mr. Speaker, they don't get to choose their elected representatives, and it's simply not fair. And we are asking the government to make the right choice. If you don't want to pass our legislation, our amendment right now, hold the bill. Talk about it a little while. Let's let our new immigrants that our Premier and that our Executive Council talk so much about. It's a place that I have a lot of respect for this government on. I have to say, I think this government has championed new Canadians. They have been champions of welcoming new Canadians into this province. Let them vote. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Shall the amendment carry? Aye. The amendment is defeated. Shall Clause 1 carry? Yes. Shall Clause 2 carry? Yes. Shall Clause 3 to 6 carry? Yes. Shall the title carry? Yes. Shall the bill carry? Yes. The bill is carried. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Can you second there, Nicole? You go. You okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Would you please call Bill Number 193, the Massage Therapist Titles Protection Act. Bill 193, the Massage Therapist Act. I recognize the Therapist Protection Act. I recognize the clerk. Mr. Chair, Bill Number 193 was referred from the Committee on Law Amendments without amendments and contains seven clauses. Shall Clause 1 carry? Yes. Shall Clause 2 carry? Yes. Shall Clause 3 carry? Yes. Shall Clause 4 through 7 carry? Yes. Shall the title carry? Yes. Shall the bill carry? Yes. The bill is carried. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Would you please call Bill Number 197, the Companies Act, the Cooperative Associations Act, and the Corporations Registration Act? Bill 197, I recognize the Clerk. Mr. Chair, Bill Number 197 was referred from the Committee on Law Amendments to the House without amendments and contains 31 clauses. Shall Clause 1 carry? Yes. Shall Clause 2 carry? Yes. Shall the remaining clauses carry? Yes. Shall the title carry? Yes. Shall the bill carry? Yes. The bill is carried. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Would you please call Bill Number 201, the Municipal Government Act and the Halifax Regional Municipality Charter, respecting on-site sewage disposal equipment. Bill 201, I recognize the clerk. Mr. Chair, Bill Number 201 was referred to the House from the Committee on the Law Amendments Committee without amendments and contains two clauses. Shall Clause 1 carry? Shall Clause 2 carry? I recognize... Shall the title carry? I recognize the member for Halifax Needham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this uh, bill enables a financing mechanism uh, that. Order. Uh, sorry. One second. Shall Clause 2 carry? I recognize the member for Halifax Needham. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, so, not uh, not everyone in the chamber or or listening, watching proceedings, might understand uh, uh, what PACE stands for. Uh, this bill um, engages PACE, which is property assessed clean energy, uh, the the property assessed clean energy model, 
and enlists it to enable residents, to facilitate residents um, financing improvements to uh, sewage or septic treatment systems. Um, the, the actual clean energy part of PACE is what is uh, causing me concern because um, while we certainly recognize that residents uh, in many cases need assistance when um, you know, what stands between them and having, for example, municipal sewage uh, is, is a hefty bill that is hard, to, hard for them to budget for. Um, at the same time, municipal, municipalities are in many cases um, uh, strained to, uh, to support the costs of doing their own uh, PACE programs, which are intended to enable uh, local action on climate change. And we know, and this government knows, and certainly young Nova Scotians in particular know, that we need to be so aggressive in our efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions that are uh, contributing to global warming and and really resulting in an existential threat to our continued uh, enjoyment of our biosphere. So um, the concern is that this bill, um, so far as we can tell, did not come from municipalities saying, oh, please enable us to do this. They are struggling to do this to enable a more aggressive rollout of uh, solar energy um, uh, across the province. And, and there are challenges. There are challenges when it comes to the ability of smaller municipal units to administer this program. There are quite rightly restrictions on the size of PACE programs. And so, and so burdening, uh, burdening municipalities or burdening PACE mechanisms with uh, the financing of sewage systems could actually end up resulting in a limitation or slower rollout of deep retrofits, uh, solar energy, and so forth. Municipalities are limited in how much debt they can raise. That is good. Uh, it, it, you know, prevents us from getting into situations that uh, where, where municipalities end up in financial trouble and need to come to the province uh, for assistance, and uh, and I think many members of this chamber have been through some of those concerns at different junctures. Um, but but we what we don't want is for the limit on the debt that they raise, uh, on the debt that they can raise, uh, to in fact limit uh, their ability to finance decarbonization. Um, and especially given that um, you know Halifax Regional Municipality has declared a climate emergency, we have a bill on the order paper to declare a climate emergency. That means that those programs, uh, which are financed by municipalities and uh, and and enable programs that will reduce at at household levels um, emissions, uh, simply simply have to be priority. Um, this also represents a, a downloading of a provincial responsibility, and municipalities don't seem to have been adequately consulted. So uh, those are my concerns. Uh, I, I think at this juncture, it doesn't mean that we're going to vote against this bill. I, just, I really want that concern to land with the government and for the ministers who are responsible for um, you know, various files related to this, uh, take our concerns into consideration and ensure that they're that there is adequate uh, capacity at municipal uh, at municipalities um, to take local action on climate change. Thank you. Shall the title carry? carry. The title is carried. Shall the bill carry? carry. The bill is carried. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that you do now rise and report these bills. The motion is carried.
Order, please. The Honourable Chair of the Committee of the Whole House on Bills will now report. That the Committee of the Whole has met and considered the following bills. Bills number 203, 189, 192, 193, 197, and 201 without amendments. And the Chairman has been instructed to recommend these bills to the favourable consideration of the House. Order that these bills be read a third time on a future day. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please call public bills for second reading? Now call public bills for second reading. Mr. Speaker, would you please call bill number 213, the Sustainable Development Goals Act? We'll now call bill number 213, the Sustainable Development Goals Act. The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move second reading of bill, one, uh, bill 213, the Sustainable Development Goals Act. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, I was pleased to introduce new legislation that will help Nova Scotians continue to lead the fight against climate change and ensure the long-term well-being of our environment, our economy, and our people. The Sustainable Development Goals Act renews our commitment to sustainable prosperity in Nova Scotia. It builds on the important work achieved through our collaborative efforts under the Environmental Goals and Sustainable Prosperity Act, or EGSPA, as we call it and it recognizes that climate change is a global emergency. Mr. Speaker, here at home and around the world, people are taking to the streets and calling on governments to take urgent action. In Nova Scotia, we've been taking action for some time. We've already dramatically reduced our greenhouse gas emissions through EGSPA. This action has led to new jobs directly tied to our growing green economy, and has made us a national leader in the fight against climate change. We can all be proud in that work, but it's not time to stop, and we still have more to do. That's why this new legislation places such a great emphasis on climate change. It sets new greenhouse gas reductions goals that are amongst the most ambitious in North America. These goals are to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 53% below 2005 levels by 2030 and to achieve net zero emissions in Nova Scotia by 2050. These goals, Mr. Speaker, are based on science. We chose them because they're in line with recommendations made by the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They ensure that Nova Scotia continues to do its fair share to fight climate change. The legislation also directs us to plan for how we will achieve these important goals. By the end of next year, we will produce a new climate change strategy to set out exactly how we will do that. Mr. Speaker, there is a role for everyone to play fighting climate change, and we see some inspiring leadership in communities around the province. The town of Bridgewater is just one example. They are championing energy security and energy efficiency projects for their citizens. In fact, they won $5 million in the National Smart Cities Challenge to advance these efforts. We want more communities across the province to take this kind of leadership in action. That's why this legislation also directs us to create a Sustainable Communities Challenge Fund. It will support innovative community projects that fight climate change and grow our economy. Mr. Speaker, I want to underline that our belief that we can protect the environment and grow a strong green economy in Nova Scotia is not one or the other. That belief was embedded in EGSPA's overarching objective of sustainable prosperity. It will continue to be our objective with Sustainable Development Goals Act. We can only achieve that objective through a healthy environment, a healthy population, and a healthy economy. These are the three pillars of sustainable prosperity. They are all important and they are all interconnected, Mr. Speaker. For example, if you don't have clean water, you won't have a healthy population to drive a prosperous economy. Nova Scotians told us through our consultation that sustainable prosperity and other key concepts should continue to serve as the foundation of this new act. We're also keeping the requirement for annual progress reports and a review every five years by the roundtable on environmental and sustainable prosperity. And we are keeping our ambitious goals for urgent action on climate change in the legislation. Mr. Speaker, it is important as climate action is, this legislation is broader than that. 
It allows us to develop regulations where we will set other goals for a healthy environment, a healthy economy, and healthy, resilient people. The roundtable helped us identify key areas of focus on for development goals, and through our consultation, Nova Scotia has confirmed that that is their priorities. These areas are leadership and sustainable prosperity, transition to cleaner energy, more sustainable sources for electricity generation, and improved energy efficiency and cleaner transportation, climate change mitigation and adaptation, creating conditions to support a circular economy, creating conditions to support an inclusive economy, and conservation and sustainable use of natural assets that support biodiversity. Structuring the legislation this way will allow us to adapt to new conditions and opportunities as they rise. Once the legislation is in place, we will, conduct, we will consult with Nova Scotians again to develop the regulations. I greatly appreciate Nova Scotians taking the time to share their ideas on our first round of consultation. I look forward to their contributions in the next and encourage everyone to have their say. Mr. Speaker, the new legislation commits the Premier and Ministers, whose portfolios are important to this legislation, to meet with the Roundtable annually. We greatly appreciate the Roundtable's dedication to sustainable prosperity in the province. After they conducted the Legislative View of EXPA in 2017, they gave us recommendations that we have integrated into this new legislation. They have been instrumental in helping us get where we are today, and the Premier and I look forward to their continued involvement. Mr. Speaker, there is no single department or government or industry or individual that can ensure sustainable prosperity in Nova Scotia. It takes many partners working together and innovating together, and this legislation is that guide to do that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In, in 2007, uh, this province passed an ambitious and unique piece of environmental legislation that made Nova Scotia a leader across Canada. It was an approach to the environment based on improving government performance in promoting sustainable prosperity through a process of setting legislative goals and enhancing accountability. It was purely based on goals that were embedded in legislation, and it was purely based on enhancing accountability. That was the, the aspects of the 2007 legislation that made Canada, uh, that made Nova Scotia a leader in Canada. And at the time, it was considered a, a pioneering piece of, of, of legislation in North America for sure. It was, a, it was considered a real leader on sustainable development. And the objective of the legislation was to provide clear goals uh, and then have those goals foster an integrated approach to environmental sustainability and economic well-being, finding the balance uh, to work towards continuous improvement in measures of social, environmental uh, and economic indicators of prosperity. That was what this province passed in, in 2007 and the, it required that it be um, reviewed every five years. That was the, re that was the requirement. And I noticed that the, the minister has, has maintained that five-year uh, review requirement. So it, it's interesting to think about what's transpired between 2000, 2007 and 2019. And we know that um, uh, the five-year review didn't happen. The first five-year review did not happen. The second five-year review is maybe happening now after after seven years, uh, but there was a there was a roundtable there was a roundtable created in November 2016 uh, that was given direction to review Expo and look at how it can evolve to support the transition to a greener economy. That was the 2016 roundtable, and that roundtable met again in August. The roundtable met formally to discuss their pending recommendations and report. And their report was submitted in September 2017, but nothing happens. Uh, nothing happened until May 2018, when the roundtable was convened again, but that was only to receive um, an update. Well, it was, it was meant to be to receive an update from the department and a response on the report and recommendations which had been submitted. 
But the government didn't put any forward any legislation at the time. They, it, it was believed by lots of members of the round table that this legislation would come a full a full year ago. But it wasn't. It didn't come forward uh, because the government said it needed to do broader consultations. In in April 2019, not that long ago, Mr. Speaker, the round table members wrote to the minister criticizing this government's lack of use of the group and stating that they uh, continue, in essence, to be in suspension without meetings or engagement, and they, conven they convened a meeting to consider um, and address where they go. So what all that tells us is that behind the scenes, this government really wasn't doing very much. They weren't uh, expressing much interest in this, which brings us forward to today. Um, and I know this government um, uh, will, will say, you know, that they started this session of the legislature with a climate change emergency debate, and, and they, that they are joining in the chorus for, of climate emergency. However, where is the urgency in this government's actions? Um, their plans and targets seem to be moving at a, at a glacial pace. This government should be setting ambitious targets and they should be doing it now. Uh, they should be setting those targets just like was done in 2007. Because uh, how is it that this government, despite their, uh, their talking points in the headline that they feel the emergency, how is it that they haven't sorted out the details? How is it, how is it that they haven't laid it out for us today uh, because that's important to give uh, industry, to give Nova Scotians, incentive to work hard to achieve the goals. So how is it that that uh, piece of legislation comes for us today uh, without any of that stuff? And now we hear today that by the end of next year, another full year, Mr. Speaker, uh, they'll, they'll have a plan, they're gonna set out a plan. A year from now, this being the same government that declared an emergency debate last week, needs a year to come out with a plan, uh, and that year is already two years too late. Uh, so so I, you know, I, I agree with the, the sentiments of the Bill of Empowering Communities. Answers will come from communities, that's for sure. Uh, it's also for sure they won't come from this government very quickly. Uh, but if I, if I think about <clears throat> what this, if I look at, the detail of the Expo legislation from 2007, and there was a variety, there was a broad number of, uh, of targets that were set across the whole slate of, of um, needs, really. And it was pretty visionary of the legislators at that time to, to see where this focus needed to be. And, and we don't see that today. And, and in fact, there's things in the, there's things in the, in the initial legislation that are just gone now. They don't even seem to be a priority. And if I look at the 2007 legislation, um, one of the goals, Mr. Speaker, was, uh, like, here's a goal. Municipal public drinking water supplies meet the province's 2012 treatment standards by 2020. That was the goal, that by 2020, uh, municipal drinking water supplies meet the 2012 standards. That was the goal, obviously a recognition that there's lots of issues in this province around, around uh, drinking water supplies. Guess what? That's no longer even a goal of this government. It's not even in this, it's not even in this legislation. And, and I don't know how that disappears. It certainly hasn't been achieved. Uh, the people in Inverness would remind us that that hasn't been achieved in many ways. And, and one of the other goals, um, one of the other goals uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the original 20, 2007 legislation was that wastewater treatment facility discharges undergo at least primary treatment by 2020. That was the goal that they set in 2007, <coughs> that wastewater treatment facility discharges undergo at least primary treatment by 2020. That is not a goal that has been met. So how can this government introduce a piece of legislation today that doesn't recognize the need to meet that goal. And these are, these are the types of things that, um, I think this is a time for this, um, this government to show their vision, to show their sense of urgency, to tell Nova Scotians that uh, what they believe is possible and what 
Nova Scotians should, uh, should strive to achieve as possible. But this government puts forward a piece of legislation that says, you know what, if you give us another year, we might come up with a plan. Uh, that doesn't spell urgency to me, Mr. Speaker. And, and one of the other things that was, that was recognized way back in two, 2007 by the, by the members who occupied this chairs at this time was the need uh, for more local food production and more local food consumption. That was a, that was a recognized need and they set, they set a goal back then uh, that the number of, of registered farms will have increased uh, to, um, to, to um, 2,736 uh, by 2020. And uh, the stats that I have show that since that, over that time, the number that, that have uh, registered <clears throat> local farms is 2,599. So that hasn't been met. I guess there is still another month until 2020. Maybe, maybe, the, maybe that will be met in the next month, but it doesn't seem, it doesn't seem likely. So what I would say, um, what I would say to the governments, and I, I would, I would urge them to, to to think uh, a little more longer range uh, with more of a sense of urgency is I was, um, uh, we were excited when we came into the house and it seemed like this was gonna be a big priority and emergency debate, legislation's coming, and then to wait through almost the entirety of the session and see the minister table something like this that says, you know what, in a year we'll have a better idea, it's not good enough. Uh, Nova Scotians have the right to expect a lot better and a lot more than a government that continually hides behind, we're putting it in the regulations so nobody can see it, nobody can talk about it, but we'll do it someday, Mr. Speaker. If they had the courage, if they had the concern, they'd put it in this bill and they'd put it on the floor of the legislature so every Nova Scotian could see it, talk about it, vote on it and weigh in on it. They won't do it because they don't understand the urgency and they don't have the vision to achieve it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, it, it certainly is a, an important moment, the, the updating of AGSPA, Bill 213, the Sustainable Development Goals Act, well, one might fairly say, finally, for it is a piece of legislation that an awful lot of people have been uh, anticipating with a lot of eagerness uh, for a long time. And I, I share with those people a, a satisfaction that this very significant legislation is being renewed at this point. Um, but I also share with uh, many others, those many others, uh, a number of concerns about the bill, and, and I would divide these concerns uh, into concern about its structure and, and then a concern about its substance. So the, um, f first, the concern about the structure. It, it is um, a serious concern to us in the NDP uh, that what has to a great extent been the heart and soul of EGSPA, that is the environmental targets of the legislation, that this has been moved out of the body of the bill um, and into the regulations. After all, it's the, it's the Sustainable Development Goals Act, and what is the point of a, a piece of legislation of this name other than goals? So, why would then the goals themselves, by and large, be, I don't think it's too strong a word to say, erased from the actual legislation? There's a great universe of these environmental goals which we uh, have worked with as a province through the, the eggs per world, targets for land protection, targets for local food production, targets for solid waste, renewable energy targets, and others. But out of this whole world of important environmental targets, in the current legislation, there are only three environmental goals set out within the bill itself. And it is also true that of the three environmental goals that are set out in the legislation itself, one of them is a quite minor goal, and it's actually been met already, so it probably doesn't have a 
a very uh, strong claim to the space that it has within the bill. And I think in this respect, the bill that's before us um, doesn't adequately um, embody the spirit of the EGSPA legislation. Whenever people speak about uh, EGSPA and all that has come through it uh, through the years, you can almost be guaranteed that part of that discussion will be that people say, and, and you know that was an all-party initiative, that's an all-party thing. Uh, the word all-party and the word EGSPA almost in Nova Scotia uh, discourse go together. Much of the strength um, and the regard for EGSPA that it has uh, enjoyed has come, I think, from this fact. The difficulty with moving the goals from the bill itself and into the regulations is that it, it won't be possible for these goals to uh, emerge as a result of a, an all parties uh, uh, joint work uh, as this happened originally in 2007, uh, it won't be possible, as this bill is constructed now, for uh, the environmental goals, other than the three that I've mentioned, uh, to, to emerge as a part of an, an all-party uh, transparent debate and process in the same way uh, that they had in 2007. And to this extent, I think it is fair to say that the EGSPA enterprise uh, by this decision uh, has not been strengthened. And that's, to, that's not to mention the fact that goals and targets which don't exist in legislation, but exist rather only in, in regulation, are vulnerable goals and targets. That, that is to say that they, by their nature, are potentially more easily weakened by a future government that may, for whatever unhelpful reason, uh, wish to modify them. So I, I, I'm aware that the, we could reasonably expect the response to this uh, concern that the government does plan to consult in a wide way on these new targets. But people could be forgiven uh, if this didn't give them tremendous confidence. Because after all, we, we are talking about a government which has approached this work in a way which has it two years uh, behind in bringing this legislation forward. And we're also talking about a general context in which consultation and EGSPA to this point uh, has meant, in fact, three questions in an online survey that was only opened up for 30 days. So none of this provides a picture or an image of a government which in bringing forward this important legislation has an adequate sense, and, and, and especially in, in a world which is now uh, over a year beyond the publication of that IPCC report, 1.5 degrees within 11 years, uh, none of all of this is providing the sense that we, we need to see as this important legislation is brought forward of a, a government uh, that in the type of legislation it brings forward, the shape of it, the approach it gives to it, uh, takes in and understands and is reflecting the urgency of the climate moment. And this brings me to the uh, more substantive concern uh, uh, that we have with the bill about the greenhouse gas emissions target, which is in the bill itself. When we talk about emissions reductions targets, I think it's true that there's really only, ultimately, uh, one question that is to be posed when we evaluate any such goals. And that is, is this goal, is this target, or is it not consistent with the IPCC's limit of containing global warming within 1.5 degrees of pre-industrial levels over the next 11 years? Now the target here, 53% under 2005 levels by 2030, for our part here in Nova Scotia, does not equitably meet that text, test. Now, the, the argument may be anticipated that the emissions targets are of a piece with what the IPCC has called for, but this is not, in fact, really the case. 
The IPCC report sets out very clearly that governments that have more ability to make steeper reductions than those which can be mechanically extrapolated from the global reductions called for have a responsibility to do so. And that would include us here in Nova Scotia. In fact, not only do we have the ability to do this, we also can approach this as the unparalleled opportunity it is for the greatest uh, job creation moment which our province uh, has witnessed since wartime. This is the reasoning behind the fact that we in the NDP uh, have called in a repeated way um, for an emissions reduction target of 50 percent below 1990 levels by 2030, or to use the calculus that's used in this legislation, a target of 58 percent below 2005 levels uh, by the same year. Uh, at this moment, this at this moment of climate emergency uh, is arguably this point, this is arguably the core of this present legislation. And we need in Nova Scotia a Sustainable Development Goals Act which is stronger than this one is at this core. So thank you, Mr. Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today I rise to speak to an act to achieve environmental goals and sustainable prosperity. This bill is replacing the Environmental Goals and Sustainable Prosperity Act, Chapter 7 of the Acts of 2007. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to speak to this bill today because I, I believe there's an important glaring gap in this new bill. There is no mention, Mr. Speaker, of food and agriculture in this new bill. In the original EGSPA, it included a focus on local food production and local food consumption. And I'll table this document, Mr. Speaker. On page five in the EGSPA Act, it says local food consumption is supported and encouraged with the goal of 20% of the money spent on food by Nova Scotians being spent on locally produced food by 2020. And later, um, Mr. Speaker, I'll refer to another document that shows we've actually gone backwards in that goal. Um, also, the EGSPA, uh, one of the goals was local food production is supported and encouraged with the goal of increasing the number of local farms by 5% by 2020. The new bill makes no mention of local food production or local food consumption. To give you an idea, Mr. Speaker, of just how important this is, I'd like to refer to the United Nations work on sustainable goals and climate change. Their very first key point is that food and agriculture are key to achieving the entire set, the entire set of sustainable development goals. And I'll read and then table this document, Mr. Speaker, from the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals website where it states, agriculture has a major role to play in combating climate change. Food and agriculture are key to achieving the entire set of sustainable development goals, a focus on rural development and investment in agriculture, crops, livestock, forestry, fisheries and aquaculture are powerful tools in ending poverty and hunger and bring about sustainable development. And I'll table that document. Food and Agriculture in the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Goals focus on ending poverty and hunger to responding to climate change and sustaining our natural resources. To further make my point, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to refer to the Paris Agreement. And on page 21 in the Paris Agreement, it states, the parties to this agreement recognizing the fundamental priority of safeguarding food security and ending hunger, and the particular vulner vulnerabilities of food production systems to the adverse impacts of climate change. I'll table that document. I don't know how we as a province can present a bill on climate change and the environment and have no mention of food and agriculture. Here in Nova Scotia, we have not seen a lot of progress in improving 
our local food strategies in relation to the old uh, the bill that this one is replacing, and maybe that's why it's not included, I'm not sure. I would like to refer to one of the topics that is often talked about with regards to um, food security, and that's the, the topic of food miles. And the definition of food miles is the distance food travels from where it is grown to where it is ultimately purchased or consumed by the end user. The more food miles that attach to a given food, the less sustainable and the less environmentally desirable that food is. And I will table that document as well. Our province has been involved, or I should say the Ecology Action Centre and the Federation of Agriculture have been involved in a food miles project. And if you remember earlier on, I referenced um, the EGSPA goals. Well, this food miles project opens by stating, are we eating too many foods imported from all over the world? Preliminary estimates show that only about 8.4% of our diet is produced on Nova Scotia farms. 15 years ago, Mr. Speaker, it was 15%. So let me just read that again. So I want to make sure everyone heard it. <laughs> Preliminary estimates show that only 8.4% of our diet is produced from Nova Scotia farms, and 15 years ago, it was 15%. So we're going in the wrong, in the wrong direction, Mr. Speaker. We suspect, this document also states that we suspect that up to 90% of Nova Scotia foods, of the food Nova Scotians consume, may be brought into the province primarily by road transport. And again, this Food Miles Project is a collaboration of Ecology Action Centre and Nova Scotia Federation of Agriculture. And I'll table that document. Food and agriculture must be included in, an environmentally, in an, uh, a bill on environmental sustainability. I believe to not include it is irresponsible. We can talk about food miles, we can talk about food insecurity, and just tonight when we went for our little uh, meal, Mr. Speaker, right here was an article, I'll table this, this is a, an article on um, a local group from St. Mary's University on food insecurity. And this group of students started an uh, organization called Square Roots. Some of, you, some of you may have heard of it. This group, uh, this article that was, that was um, printed two days ago, talks that Square Roots started in 2016 by student entrepreneurs at St. Mary's University to address the issue of food insecurity among students and in Nova Scotia in general. The most food insecure province in Canada. Ironically, the province also wastes the most food. The article goes on to state, staying true to their mandate, Square Roots diverts food waste from landfill bound produce, 100,000 pounds to date, which creates methane far more detrimental than carbon dioxide. And that also is uh, an important thing when we're talking about food and agriculture is looking at food waste and how that impacts climate change, Mr. Speaker. Let's look at the most recent Hurricane Dorian and the fact that 80% of Nova Scotians lost electrical power. Some homeowners in my constituency of Cumberland North had no power for up to eight days. Many people in rural Cumberland North lost their free fridges full of food and their freezers full of food that was there for their winter. Grocery shelves were empty. In fact, some grocery stores also lost all their food. The co-op in Pugwash lost all of their perishable food to waste. Our Federation of Agriculture here in this province and our farmers have been trying to ring the alarm bell on this issue for years. And I know my colleague from, from Kings North has spoke about this important issue in this legislature numerous, numerous times. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, Nova Scotia is relying too much on other countries to feed us, and as climate change becomes more and more uh, prevalent, it's becoming more and more of an issue. 
If transportation systems fail, we can only feed ourselves in this province for five days. When I decided to serve in elected office, one of the driving forces of my decision was to help establish a sustainable local food supply for the people of this province. Some of you may remember my story and my maiden speech that talked about that and talked about when I went back to school and to study my EMBA at St. Mary's University and the president, Dr. Colin Dodds, who was teaching a class on international capital markets stopped in the middle of the course, in the middle of talking about financial markets in Greece and Italy and going back to the Great Depression, and he stopped and said, the most important thing you can learn from my class is that you should all go home and learn how to grow your own food. And the reason he said that is because we are at such risk. The financial markets globally are not, have not been strong. And if we can't feed ourselves as a society, we are in big trouble. Mr. Speaker, the risk is increasing due to climate change and the, the, the risk that climate change brings to our transportation systems. This government must include food and agriculture in a Sustainable Environment Act. How can we not, when the Paris Agreement includes it, when the United Nations includes it on their Sustainable Development Goals, when our previous Environmental EGSPA Act included it. Local food production and consump consumption is going in the wrong direction in this province. We need to make it a priority and we need to start now. On behalf of my colleagues in the Progressive Conservative Caucus, we ask that the Minister reconsider what is in this bill and, and hear the concerns that we have shared today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Sackville Beaverbank. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Speaker. It's a pleasure to stand and talk about this today. When I uh, when I first heard that this was finally coming forward, a bill, uh, I, I thought initially it would be updates, uh, revisements to uh, the existing EXPA Act. I was quite uh, uh, excited to hear that it was coming forward. We heard the government. We had a emergency debate on climate change here in this House. Um, Everybody's been saying how important climate is, and I was just absolutely thrilled to hear that this was coming. And then the legislation came forward, and I was sitting in the bill briefing reading it, and I thought, uh, wow, this is not exactly what uh, I thought this was going to be. This, this is a little bit of something it should be. Mr. Speaker, I guess uh, one of the... One of the things I find very disappointing here, Expo, when that came forward, as uh, our, our uh, leader mentioned, was uh, you know very creative, very uh, forward thinking. It was a 12-page uh, act um, that is now looking at being repealed, and it's being replaced by this act, uh, which members in this House have already talked about, is, is only a fraction of what is contained in the original Expo Act. I find it really disappointing, and, and to be honest, I think that, uh, you know, the, why the government is bringing forward a new act instead of doing what everybody, both, both uh, you know, climate groups, uh, and members of the opposition in this House, what we wanted was we wanted updates to the goals that were already set out in EXPA. And instead what this government's done is they're looking at repealing EXPA and bringing forward their own act. Um, you know, it makes me wonder, uh, recognizing the, the importance, the significance and the recognition that EGSPA has got in the past, you know, are they doing that because they can't meet the goals that were laid there? Well, they certainly haven't tried in some cases. When we look at the 25 goals that are laid out in the existing EGSPA Act, only 13 of them have actually been met. And so what are we doing with the other ones? Because they're not addressed in this new legislation, Mr. Speaker. So basically, you know, I I guess to, to paraphrase my grandmother, we're throwing the ba ba baby out with bathwater here, and instead of actually trying to address some of those issues, we're coming back with a brand new piece of legislation. So I'm, I'm really confused with why that is. So 
is it that the government doesn't want to meet those goals? Is, is the government not feel those goals are legitimate? Or does the government just want to pull out a piece of legislation that is good and try to put their own stamp on it so they can call it theirs? Because that's kind of what it seems like they're doing here to me. I mean, we have a, a local community group, the Ecology Action Centre, who actually went out and hired a private consultant, Mr. Speaker, to do their own report by looking at EXPA, looking at the goals that are laid out in EXPA and, and redefining those goals and where we want to go. They spent money to do that. They felt that that was a good piece of legislation. This government hasn't even considered that. So here we are now with, with this new bill, and I will point out, I find it really interesting because every speaker that spoke on this bill so far has called it the Sustainable Development Act. Mr. Speaker, where's environment? They're not saying environment in any of this. It's a Sustainable Development Act. So you've removed environment from this altogether. That was the whole purpose of having this act, was to set goals for environment. Mr. Speaker, I find that, uh, you know, I, I, it was very, very, very interesting when the, min and I, I, I'm off topic, but I have said to our leader, and I would say that, is that if I was asked, if I was the Minister of Environment to bring this piece of legislation forward, I would have respectfully said it's not ready to come forward. I would not have been comfortable standing up here and saying this. And I, and Mr. Speaker, when, when this government says that they care about the environment and that it's a priority, it's a shell game. And I'll tell you why, Mr. Speaker. They've had four different ministers of the environment over the last two years. They haven't concentrated on the environment, and this is coming forward just so that they could say, oh, we had a climate emergency, and now we're bringing this forward. If they were serious about this, this would have, and, and Mr. Speaker, the consultation, they've had two years now that they were supposed to be doing consultation. The minister stands up today and says that it's going to be another 12 to 14 months to go out and consult. Why haven't we been consulting all along? I know that Ecology Action was consulting with me. I know that Sackville Rivers, Annapolis, I know that all those environmental groups have reached out and consulted on this to me. So how come the government hasn't been consulting? I'm confused on that. Mr. Speaker, I, I think that this is a weak, weak bill. I think that to put the regulations, to put the, the goals that need to be laid out in this, to put them in regulations, the minister said he's putting them in the regulations so that the, they can be enforced or increased as the need be. Mr. Speaker, when they're in regulations, they can be decreased too. And that's my concern, is I'm worried, like, at least when they're in the legislation, they're, they're there, they're in the bill, they're part of the law. And I would note that as part of the law, part of the requirements were to be meeting with the roundtable on a regular basis. So since, given what uh, our House leader spoke about earlier in regards to uh, when the meetings didn't occur with the roundtable, I want, I mean, it's law. It, are, you know, so are you breaking the law if you're not doing what's already in the bill that you're supposed to be doing, but you're not doing, so now you're going to change the bill? <laughs> like, I'm sorry, Mr. Speaker, I'm just, I find it frustrating, right? I, I think that I, I do care about the environment. The reason that I've been given the role of the critic of the environment is because I do care about the environment. Um, you know, I, I compost, I have a solar heater on my house, I, I, can, I have my own, I have my own metal straw. <laughs> Serious, in all seriousness, Mr. Speaker and members, in all seriousness, Environment is something that's affecting everybody. We did see it with the student-led uh, coalition and student-led uh, protests that happened here. We are seeing that the public is ready to 
people recognize that we need to change the ways we're doing. That's why uh, the other bill that the, the Honourable Member across the House mentioned, the Plastic Bag Act, that's why people are accepting those acts. That's what people want and, and are looking for leadership from their government when it comes to, to the environment. And this bill doesn't do that. There's too many questions, Mr. Speaker. They talk about a green fund. Mr. Speaker, where's the money coming from? Because nobody's yet talked about where the funding for the Green Fund is coming from. They haven't spoken about how much money it is. They haven't spoken about where it's coming from. They haven't spoke to what group it's going to. They haven't spoken. Mr. Speaker, when this, came, when this came before the media, and the media kept asking questions in regards to how this is going to affect uh, power rates in this province and what this is going to do to Nova Scotia power. I'm I'm sorry, but the minister didn't have the answers at the time. Staff didn't have the answers at the time. So to me, why in a million years, or it wasn't a rush to consult because they didn't do it. It wasn't a rush to bring forward uh, amendments to EXPA because they didn't do it, but now we're going to rush this. And I'll note, Mr. Speaker, one year to consult, and before they finish consulting, Mr. Uh, Speaker, that means it's a year before this new legislation can even be put into place. It's, it'll take a year before it gets royal assent, Mr. Speaker. So for the next year, nothing. So if it's a climate emergency, if we're meeting here for an emergency, we're going to wait a whole year and do nothing. Because that's what really this does until the legislation is passed, Mr. Speaker. So I, uh, I will say, I, I want to point this out. For those that don't know, I was here today, I chipped a tooth and I had to leave. <laughs> because I feel passionate about this. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I, I respectfully suggest with all sincerity that this bill needs to be shelved, that EXPA needs to be reviewed and amendments to those goals that are in the legislation that are law come forward and not goals that have already been met or we're just on the cusp of meeting so that we can pat ourselves on the back and say we did great. We need goals that are moving us forward. We need goals that are goals to strive towards. We need to be able to hold ourselves accountable and to move forward, Mr. Speaker, and this legislation doesn't do it. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Halifax, Needham. Mr. Speaker, I do not have um, the energy of uh, my colleague from Sackville. Thank you, Beaver Bank. Um, <laughs> and and I expect uh, that I will want to speak at some length at another, a later juncture about this legislation. I'm very interested to hear what is said at law amendments. But I guess as, as, um, as someone who cares very much about the environment and about the people of Nova Scotia and about climate change and uh, my children and all children's future, um, I want to, uh, I guess, draw all members' attention to the seriousness of this and, and remind them of the accomplishment that EGSPA was. And, and while I too am concerned, uh, and we are concerned at, at some of the changes to, uh, to the structure of the bill, namely putting um, the goals, uh, moving many of the goals into the regulations, I actually was, was here reading the bill, and I'm struck at what remains. In particular, uh, the definitions in clause in clause two, and then and then uh, under clause four. So some of the things that remain 
are the following. The achievement of sustainable prosperity in the province must include all of the following elements. One, ne tu kulimik, which is a Mi'kmaq term uh, which refers to the use of the natural bounty provided by the Creator for the self-support and well-being of the individual and the community by achieving adequate standards of community nutrition and economic well-being without jeopardizing the integrity, diversity or productivity of the environment. That is still a laudable and substantial goal which we all need to work towards. Number two is sustainable development, which I, I won't speak to right now. Number three is a circular economy. That is something that we very rarely hear referenced uh, by this government. Um, and how powerful is it that that is actually something that is supposed to be, um, that, that is identified as being key to the sustainable prosperity of this province. <clears throat> what does it mean, a, a circular economy? I, I've read about it. I think I've spoken and mentioned the words maybe once in this legislature, but, but uh, what it means, and it's defined here in this act, it says it means an economy in which resources and products are kept in use for as long as possible with the maximum value being extracted while they are in use and from which at the end of their service life, other materials and products of value are recovered or regenerated. How, how in, in the whole range of activities of the, the province of Nova Scotia, how are we working towards accomplishing a circular economy, an economy which um, uses the least possible resources to, to uh, r produce the greatest possible value for, for, for now and, and for the future with, without costing the environment. Something my, my colleagues have heard me said a number of times is that sometimes I feel like the Premier is the CEO of Nova Scotia Inc. Um, you know, we have had such emphasis in, in recent times on exports. Um, exports are almost by their nature the opposite of a circular economy because we are extracting, be it from the ocean, be it from the woods, um, and we are sending far away and we're doing it with planes and we're doing it with, um, with uh, you know, large, large container ships. It is virtually impossible to have a circular economy where so much of your economic development energy is, is, is deeply committed to, to that sort of economic model. It's very hard to reconcile. Even just the transportation costs of so much of our economic development activity um, in, under this government has been at odds with trying to accomplish a circular economy. And then number four is an inclusive economy. An inclusive economy means an economy that creates opportunity for all segments of the population and that distributes the dividends of increased prosperity, both in monetary and non-monetary terms, for the well-being of all Nova Scotians. How are we doing on that? How are we doing on that? So, I will have more to say about, you know, the parts of this bill that are maybe not quite so preamble and aspirational, but gosh, if, if any moment in our history has called on us to um, be aspirational and ambitious and bold and determined and focused, it is this moment. It is this moment. And this legislation when it was when it was first brought in in 2007 and then you know continually through through the the next government which was an NDP government it it created a structure to to orient the government towards those goals and i hope that regardless of where those goals end up being i hope that this can infuse the 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 government of 
of Nova Scotia, the government that is supposed to be working in the public good, in the public good, not for the corporate good, not for the few's good, that, that this legislation and the chance to debate it again can, can reorient the, the, the energy and, and the resources of the government towards trying to accomplish those broad goals and the specific ones on which literally uh, our, our very future, um, you know, we might be a small jurisdiction, but, but the point has been made that if every jurisdiction says, oh, we're only a small jurisdiction, we can't lead this. You know, we, we have to wait for the bigger jurisdiction to move first. That is, um, that is a game where we all end up where we don't wanna be. So thank you very much. I want to recognize the Honourable Minister of the Environment will be to close their uh, second reading of Bill Number 213, the Sustainable Development Goals Act. The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker, and I certainly uh, want to thank my colleagues for a diverse uh, debate on this. Uh, many varying opinions. I tried to grasp as many of them as I can. I think I found some themes there that uh, I will just touch briefly on. Um, I do know and respect and understand the importance of what we need to do to um, engage our communities. I do know what consultation means, and I will assure everybody in this House that uh, as we move forward, it's important to hear not only your voices and what you're saying, and I would challenge each and every one of you to bring the ideas that I heard here today, from food security to everything else that's under the trees to us as we go through the consultation phase. Um, just a few things I do want to point out though. It's important to know there were some, some comments here around um, why a new act. Um, one of the foundational things I just want to make it clear that guided me in the process was the role and the value of the round table. A tremendous group of people, a tremendous resource that needs to be revisited, re-engaged, and brought back to the forefront. They were the ones that suggested that this bill be repealed and replaced. That's why I'm here with this. They brought 10 fundamental suggestions that were key in guiding me in how we went forward. And I would challenge everybody to find that letter of 2017, to read it and see what's in that. That is important, because their voice was a very important voice. Um, and I want to thank them again for everything that they've done to get us where we are today. Uh, I look forward to working with them also down the road, as I do all of you. Uh, I do know that, yes, the, the original bill was passed with un unanimous, and I'm hoping that this one will too, on the pledge that I will have goals in it that reflect what Nova Scotians value, what they feel are priorities, are achievable, and are under those three pillars that we really need to keep in mind. And that's the environmental health, our human population health, and the health of our economy. And I will ensure you that I will work hard to make sure that that is what we represent. So in going forward, uh, I, in closing, I, I don't want anybody else to lose sight on what this is about. We do have a global climate emergency. There's no doubt. Yes, we did start off the legislature speaking about that. We've had a tremendous month, I think, month and a half, with not only our bill on plastics, the amendments to the wilderness areas, the, the uh, protected areas that we've announced, this piece of legislation, I think it's the right time and it's the right support. I can remember, uh, I believe, in, in one of my colleagues across the floor, uh, the, uh, the House Leader for the Opposition, made the statement in one of our committees that there's no place for politics when you're talking about the environment. And I would echo his comments, and I would, and I would and I, and I appreciated those comments that he made. There's no place for politics when we're talking about the environment. 
Climate change is a global emergency and we'll continue to lead the fight. Nova Scotians never ever need to forget the fact that where we are here today is because of what we've done in the past and I think they're ready to do more. These are the most ambitious goals that we have in North America. Don't lose sight of that. Don't water it down or, or undermine it. Let Nova Scotians live on that and this will help us build a strong green economy. And I thank you all very much and look forward to hearing what Law Amendments has to say on this. And with that, I would move, I would, I would move to close debate on second reading of Bill 213, the Sustainable Development Goals Act. Motion is for third reading of Bill number 213, the Sustainable Development Goals Act. Would all those in, pardon me, second reading? <laughs> Second reading, it's late. Second reading of Bill number 213, the Sustainable Development Goals Act. Would all those in favor of the motion please say aye. Aye. Contrary minded, nay. Motion is carried. Bill number 213 and entit entitled An Act to Achieve Environmental Goals and Sustainable Prosperity. Ordered that this bill be referred to the Committee on Law Amendments. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please call address and reply? We now call address and reply. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I do not believe I can carry the, quite the energy of my colleague just down the aisle from me. I'm an accountant at nature at heart and by profession and anyway. Mr. Speaker. The last year has certainly been one of, full of memorable moments. Just last February, we celebrated my father's 100th birthday. In May, I had the proud opportunity to watch as my son graduated from the University of New Brunswick with his law degree. And then just this past September, the constituents of Northside Westmount selected me from among six other candidates to be their representative in the Nova Scotia Legislature. And I, I was, was and I still continue to be humbled by the confidence that they've placed in me. And I hope that I'm able to represent each and every one of Northside Westmount's constituents competently, effectively, as their voice in this room that is so steeped in our province's history. But today is also of note, Mr. Speaker, and we have just under three hours, so we made it under the bell. Today, for my family, a new calendar starts. 101 days from today, my father will turn 101. Wow. Rick, as he's known at home, God willing, he will reach this truly remarkable milestone. Every day we tr have him is a gift to my family. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, no one gets where they do in life without hard work, perseverance, and support. To this end, I would not be standing here in this great building without the love, support, and encouragement of my wife, Joanne, and my son, Andrew. They have been both my rock, unwavering in support, and the strength they provided. Everything we are, we also owe to our parents. For myself, Mr. Speaker, my dad has been an inspiration, I, a humble and unassuming man who in his lifetime has seen and experienced a world which is literally transformed in front of him. A veteran of World War II, having done convoy duty in the North Atlantic aboard the Corvette HMCS Picto, to practicing law in North Sydney for 33 years prior to becoming a county and finally a Superior Court judge. My dad, the Honorable Murray J. Ryan QC, has been a role model of integrity, honesty and principle whose influence on me will carry on long after he is no longer with us. In Indeed, the past couple of days with the Crown attorneys out um, circling the building, a couple of them took an opportunity to come up and talk to me. They told me stories about when they had been in front of him when they were practicing, what have you. <clears throat> Quite remarkable since the man has been retired for 26 years that they would think back to some of those instances that occurred so long ago. My mom, Mabel Ferguson of Myra, was cut from the same cloth as my dad, quiet yet witty, reserved yet welcoming. We lost her just three short years ago, 
But like my dad, I know she was looking down at her son with great pride in September as I was sworn in as a member of this Legislative <laughs> Assembly. I would also be remiss, Mr. Speaker, if I did not also extend thanks to my extended family whose support has been so greatly appreciated. Great thanks must also be extended to an incredible group of volunteers and to Elizabeth Godreau. Elizabeth was a tireless volunteer and supporter who kept my campaign headquarters running and was a master coordinator. <laughs> to all those who volunteered making phone calls, door knocking, putting up signs, your support and encouragement was the fuel that kept me going. And to my fellow progressive conservative MLAs and caucus staff, you're taking the time during the hot days of August to come down and help me with my campaign was and is truly appreciated. And finally, to the leader of the Nova Scotia Progressive Conservatives, my thanks and gratitude for your time, support, advice and encouragement during a hectic campaign that was, shall we say, short on time and long on objectives. <laughs> I would also like to take a moment to thank my predecessor, Mr. Eddie Orrell, firstly for resigning. <laughs> but more importantly, for the advice and the insight and the unwavering support he has provided to me over these past several months. The area of Northside Westmount, with a population of just under 16,000, is one as rich in history as it is proud. In 1945, the Western Union in North Sydney was the first place in North America to know about the end of World War II. At the time, the transatlantic Atlantic cable from England came ashore in North Sydney. Transatlantic messages would arrive in North Sydney and then be retransmitted elsewhere in North America. For that lone night, the news of the end of the war leaked out, and apparently the evening was one of great festivities and celebration in our town. The town has had a rich history in shipping, <coughs> mining, fisheries, and commerce. In fact, my grandfather himself was a sealing captain who sailed multiple times around the world from the Arctic to the Antarctic, but always coming back to North Sydney, which was his home port. While times have changed, the town is still closely tied to the sea, being Nova Scotia's port, home port for Marine Atlantic's Newfoundland ferries, fisheries, and a dry dock. The town has had several not notable people, from for former Cabinet Minister Flora MacDonald, retired Stanley Cup champion Bobby Smith, and Senator John MacDonald. When the topic of steel comes to mind, most people think of Sydney Steel, or Cisco. But truth be told, the first steel plant in Cape Breton was located within my constituency, in Sydney Mines between Ocean and Atlantic Streets. Fed by the coal from the nearby, prin nearby Princess Colliery, the plant and mine served to employ in excess of 3,000 people in the early 1900s. In December of 1938, there was a major accident in the Princess Colliery, killing a total of 17 men. My wife's father and grandfather, both coincidentally nicknamed Sticks, were both miners at the Princess Colliery. And I've heard this story many times for, from her, as her grandfather was just avoided the accident. Princess supplied jobs for many years to Sydney Mines, as well as ma many neighbouring towns, such as Florence, North Sydney, and Alder Point. Finally, across the northwest uh, harbour to the north northwest arm, we have Point Edward, Edwardsville, and Westmount, home of the Canadian Coast Guard College, the Sidport Industrial Park, and Petersfield Park. Indeed, from Westmount to North Sydney, from North Sydney to Sydney Mines, onward to Florence, Alder Point, the constituency is comprised of many communities, each as proud as it is diverse. But as rich as the community's history is, and its concerns and issues are equally significant and diverse, oat migration, an aging population, declining population and infrastructure, high unemployment, a health care system and a hospital system in crisis. Mr. Speaker, these issues are not unique to Northside Westmount. They are being experienced in many communities throughout this province. But, Mr. Speaker, our residents are proud and our residents are committed for a better tomorrow. I will strive to be an effective voice for these residents, working with them and for them as we move our community forward to deal with these challenges and make for a successful tomorrow for our children and our children's children. Mr. Speaker, 
Since my swearing in in September, I have had the great honour of attending daily sessions of the Legislature and learning the ins and outs of the legislative process. From speaker orientation on day one to learning procedures in the Legislature from colleagues and fellow MLAs, there are many areas where I am and will continue to learn and evolve as an effective member of this chamber. And while I am adjusting, one thing that is becoming more and more apparent is an area where I need some great improvement. Mr. Speaker, my approach to life to date has been one of brevity. Less is more. <laughs> Unfortunately, as I'm discovering, in the legislature, oratory skills cannot be understated. As such, I commit to work on this attribute, <laughs> but not this evening. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That concludes government business for the evening. I move the House to now rise to meet again tomorrow, Friday, October 25th, 2019, between the hours of 9 a.m. and 11.59 p.m. Following the daily routine and QP, business will include third reading on bills 189, 192, 193, 197, 201, and 203. Motion is for the House to rise to meet again tomorrow, Friday, October 25th, between the hours of 9 a.m. and 12.59 p.m. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. Aye. Entree minded, nay. Motion is carried. The House now stands. Oh, pardon me. My, my error. Between the hours of 9 a.m. and 11.59 p.m. <laughs> E, would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. Motion is carried. The House now stands adjourned until tomorrow at 9 a.m.